order. We will now start the daily routine. Um, I will recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on an introduction. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to draw the um, attention of the members to the gallery opposite, where we're joined today by James Din, who is the MHA for St. John's Centre and the leader of the New Democratic Party of Newfoundland and Labrador, who has come to visit us today. Welcome. Enjoy your visit. <laughs> yeah. We will start off with presenting and reading petitions. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Fisheries. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to table the 2022 annual report from the Fish Harvester Registration and Certification Board. The report is The report is tabled. Any further tabling reports, regulations and other papers? Statements by ministers. I recognize the honorable minister for justice. Uh, thank you very much, speaker. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the bravery of four extraordinary Nova Scotians. I had the privilege to take part this morning in the 2023 Medal of Bravery ceremony where Scott Buchanan of Bedeck, Robert McGregor of Economy, Talbert Boyer of Dartmouth and Adam Lafort of Grand Tan were recognized for their quick and selfless action in the face of danger. Speaker, these four individuals didn't hesitate to place themselves in danger to protect others and I think it's important that all members of the House be aware of their historic actions. Speaker, on February 17, 2020, Scott Buchanan saved two individuals who fell through the ice at a waterfall near Bedeck. Jumping into a seven-foot deep water, Scott shielded the individuals from the force of the waterfall and held, them, held on to them for 20 minutes until help could arrive. On June the 11th, 2020, Robert McGregor noticed flames in a window of a house near Truro. Seeing someone in the house unconscious, Robert made multiple attempts to pull the individual to safety despite Mr. McGregor's quick effort and heroic actions, the victim's injuries were fatal. On January 29, 2021, Talbert Boyer was operating a Halifax transit bus when he noticed a vehicle on its roof and on fire on Upper Water Street. Talbot pulled the occupant from the burning vehicle, used snow to dose the flames, and was able to pull the body away moments before the vehicle exploded. On June 22, 2021, Adam Lafort was tubing down the Marguerite River when a woman fell out of her tomb, tube and began, came trapped in the deep water. Unable to swim, Adam dove to, into the water, brought the woman to the surface, held on to her and a tree until help arrived and she did not drown. Speaker, if I'm ever in danger, I hope someone like these four recipients are nearby to help. Their heroic actions make us proud to be Nova Scotians. This morning's ceremony was special, and I know it meant a lot to their families and friends of Scott, Robert, Talbert, and Adam, who were so proud of them. I also want to thank the Premier for coming and recognizing the heroes in our community during today's ceremony. It was a true honor to acknowledge the four individuals, our heroes in the truest sense of the word. On behalf of our grateful province, I congratulate this year's Medal of Bravery recipients and thank everyone who puts themselves in dangers to help fellow Nova Scotians. Thank you, Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Minister and Attorney General for, for his comments. It was very moving being in the Medal of Bravery ceremony, hearing the incredible acts of not just uh, 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 heroism, uh, but also sacrifice and, and acts that really required uh, these individuals 
to put the fear of their own safety and well-being aside to um, protect and save others. I do want to recognize Scott Buchanan of Bedeck, Robert McGregor of Economy, Talbot Boyer of Dartmouth, and Adam LaFord of uh, Granatine, who literally faced fire, water, smoke, and ice. Uh, in attempts to save people's lives, and most of these guys were successful in doing that. And I just want to commend them uh, for their in incredible acts. Uh, and I'm proud to mention their names here in the House. And I know that uh, all of these gentlemen will be thought of fondly, not just by their own family members, who I know must be very proud of them, uh, but also the family members of those that they uh, helped uh, survive, um, and I want to I want to thank them again on behalf of the House and on behalf of those individuals and those family members who still have uh, those individuals alive today because of the the uh, heroism of of these gentlemen. I recognize the leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, uh, I think this morning was a, a really good reminder of uh, the good things we can do in this House. Uh, I walked in and smelled the smell of the smudge um, from Elder Companion, um, and we saw the kind of open hearts and a couple of tears as we discussed the truly incredible actions of these uh, four men, um, who, as has been said, um, showed incredible, incredible and and um, I think maybe to them ordinary, but to us extraordinary acts of courage. Uh, and it was a, a very moving and I think um, very fitting that we sort of pause the operations of this house to take a moment and remember um, how it is that Nova Scotians show up for each other. Uh, and so I echo uh, the comments of my colleagues and I thank um, on behalf of myself uh, and our caucus, Scott Buchanan, Robert McGregor, Talbot Boyer, uh, who has a very adorable baby, <laughs> and Adam uh, Lafort, uh, for those acts of courage, um, for those moments of bravery, and for reminding us uh, what a wonderful and special place we come from mm -hmm. and the ways in which uh, Nova Scotians and our communities show up for each other. Thank you. Continuing on with statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Seniors and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas thousands of allied health care professionals are involved with the delivery of care to Nova Scotians each and every day, and whereas Nova Scotians allied health professionals are working in 140 occupations and bring invaluable information and skills to ensure timely and proper treatment, and whereas allied health care professionals recognition week provides an opportunity for us all to thank our allied health professional heroes for the work that they do to deliver quality care to Nova Scotians every day. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature join me in recognizing the tremendous contributions of all allied health care workers in our province. Madam Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. Any further government notices of motion? Introduction of bills. Introduction of bills. I recognize the honorable member for Bedford Basin. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would like to actually pass this bill over to my colleague, uh, the member for Timberley Prospect, because it's his bill. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to table a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 3 of the Acts of 2019, the Coastal Protection Act. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect begs leave to introduce a bill entitled an act to amend Chapter 3 of the Acts of 2019, the Coastal Protection Act. Bill 402, an act to amend Chapter 3 of the Acts of 2019, the Coastal Protection Act. Order that the bill be read a second time on a future day. Notices of motion. Statements by members. I recognize the honourable member for Colchester North. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I begin my statement, I beg leave to make an introduction. Please do. Uh, Madam Speaker, in your gallery, the Speaker's Gallery, <clears throat> I am honoured to introduce a true hero, Ella Legier. Ella and Ben Donkin, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us here today, put their own lives at risk to save a mother and three young children who were in serious jeopardy. Ella, Ella is joined today by her own daughter, Dakota. I would ask Ella to stand, and Dakota, uh, to stand and accept the warm welcome from the members of the Nova Scotia Legislature. Welcome to the Nova Scotia House of Assembly. I recognize the Honourable Member for Colchester North. Madam Speaker, many of us who have lived along the Bay of Fundy are well aware of its beauty. We are also very well aware of the dangers associated with the highest tides in the world. Early this summer, Ella Legier and Ben Duncan heard a cry for help. Upon racing to the shoreline, they saw a woman on her hands and knees screaming for help and three young children at a distance out on the mudflats. Ellen and ben, ben realized that if the children became stuck, they would be overcome by the rising water. Madam Speaker, in Ella's words, the mud was past their knees and would almost suction their legs. Ben was first to get the children and to start to get them back towards the shore. Ella reached the woman who she believed was in shock as she continued to scream, even after being told her children were safe. The woman continued to struggle and soon collapsed in exhaustion. Ella then noticed that the three-year-old again was wandering back towards the rising water. By this time, exhausted from fighting the mud, Ella crawled on her hands and knees to the child. She was unable to physically lift her, so she distracted the child by asking her to help her find snails and made their way back to their mother and then to the shore with the water closing in. Ella stayed in the mud with the mother and child until the local first responders arrived. Madam Speaker, this story would have led to a very tragic outcome. I ask that all members of this House of Assembly thank Ella and Ben Duncan for their quick thinking, heroic actions, and for putting their lives at risk to save a family in serious distress. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Madam, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize and honour Indigenous veterans who have served in our military, fighting for peace and freedom here in Canada and around the world. We remember the great sacrifices of Indigenous peoples who have put their lives on the line in service to our country. Madam Speaker, thousands of Indigenous soldiers pay the ultimate sacrifice for this nation. As we enter the season of remembrance, it is worth paying extra attention to the sacrifices of our Indigenous soldiers. Today and every day, we need to reflect on their service and redouble our efforts to strengthen our nation-to-nation -nation relations as we move toward Remembrance Day and as we continue on a path of reconcilia reconciliation and strengthening our country. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you. Uh, I beg leave to make an introduction. Please do. I'll draw the member's attention to the gallery opposite, where we are joined by two extremely accomplished uh, artists and creators here in Nova Scotia. Um, I will read a statement about them, but first I would ask that you give Juanita Peters and Andre Fenton the warm welcome of the Legislature. Pleasure to have you. Welcome. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you. Today I rise to recognize Dartmouth South's Juanita Peters. This past weekend, Juanita received the prestigious Portia White Award from Arts Nova Scotia. 
The award recognizes an outstanding professional Nova Scotian artist who has attained mastery and recognition in their discipline and has made a significant contribution to the province's cultural life over a sustained career. She's also of Weymouth Falls, she would probably want me to say. <laughs> Juanita's list of achievements is long and varied. Actor, journalist, executive director of the Africa Film Museum, founding member of Women in Film and Television Atlantic are just a few <laughs> of her contributions to this province. I'd also add her deep kindness, sense of stewardship, and community leadership to that list. Juanita selected Andre Fenton, another accomplished writer, poet, mentor, and community member, as her protege for the prize. Andre's work has already made a hu had made huge waves with his writing, and I'm excited to watch his career flourish. Please join me in congratulating Juanita and Andre on their hard-earned recognition. I recognize the honorable member for Kings West. Madam Speaker, today I would like to recognize a local business in Kings West that is celebrating its 60th anniversary. Perry Rand Transportation was formed in 1963 and is a second generation family owned business in the valley focused on transportation. Jerry Buckin bought the business in 1970, and his son Shane took over as president in 2004 upon Jerry's passing. Over the years, they provided transportation services for students to and from school, and Shane, along with his brother Sean, have been expanding their businesses ever since, with a focus now on repairs of school buses and selling parts for buses. This family business continues to adapt. Another one of the Buckins businesses, Blue Nose Transit, has provided busing to vocational schools in the past throughout Nova Scotia and now provides charter bus services to all of the province and beyond. You can identify their buses by their unique blue and white colors. Jerry and Marion Buckin probably couldn't have imagined the longevity of their business in 1970, and it's a testimony to the hard work ethic and ability of the next generation. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of the House to join me in congratulating the Buckin family on over 50 years of business serving those in the Annapolis Valley and indeed all of Nova Scotia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park. Madam Speaker, I'm delighted to inform the House that our Liberal family has increased in size. On the weekend, Kelly Viola Regan McDonald made a long-awaited and yet surprising entrance more than five weeks early. She weighed in at 4 pounds 11 ounces, but is working to make sure she grows big and strong already. Mom Caitlin Regan and Dad Kevin McDonald have taken to their new roles like ducks to water, and they are grateful to the birthing teams and the NICU staff for the excellent care. This means that the member from Bedford Basin has a new role, Glamma. <laughs> and we want to congratulate her, along with grandparents, the Honourable Jeff Regan and Kelly and Lois McDonald of Mulgrain. Madam Speaker, I have known Kate Regan since she was a young girl and saw her be raised with love, empowerment and grace. I know she will raise little Kelly in a similar way and I'm so excited to get to watch her do so. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction relative to my member statement. Sure, please do. Um, joining us in the West Gallery today are members of the Northern Lights Dancers. So uh, from this side to the next side, we are, well, we are joined by Azalis Palliser Nicholas, Francis Palliser, and Dora Tuckatuck. Um, who are, as I said, members of the Northern Lights Dancers and also cultural and administrative staff at the Attila High Community Centre for Inuit um, in the Maritimes. And we extend our warm welcome to the House. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I rise today to honour the Northern Lights Dancers. The Northern Lights Dancers started in 2021 through the Attila High Inuit Centre at the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Centre. Since then, Inuit across the Maritimes have learned and performed traditional Inuit dr dam drumming, dancing and throat singing. Learning and sharing traditional practices is a key part of well-being. And they can't show you what they do today in, in the gallery, um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a description. The Inuit drum, or the kiliat, is made from bending narrow strips of wood into a large circular frame with a handle, and drummers hit the frame, creating a deep echoing sound. The songs that accompany, accompany drumming tell stories of the land, hunting, and traditional legends that guide Inuit communities. 
The Northern Lights dancers also performed throat singing, which is also a, was, was a form of entertainment among Inuit women while men were away on hunting trips. And it, Inuit throat singing can also imitate wind, water, animal sounds, and other everyday sounds. Madam Speaker, I thank the Northern Lights dancers for sharing their culture and traditions with all of us in Nova Scotia. Nothing. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Uniac. Uh, yes, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the annual Terry Fox run that is held in all the schools of Sackville and Uniac area every September. Terry Fox, of course, ran the Marathon of Hope, a journey that began to raise money and awareness for cancer research and ended up to be so much more. Speaker, in April of 1980, Terry dipped his foot in the Atlantic Ocean while he was still able to complete a run across Canada. And 43 years later, his journey continues across this country. Terry's goal was to raise a million dollars for each Canadian, or one dollar from each Canadian, but just over four decades later, over 850 million has been raised. Speaker, I want to recognize and thank the organizers, volunteers, and students who have all participated in the Terry Fox run at the schools in my area and wish them continued success with the future runs. Thank you, Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clare. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in my place to recognize Jocelyn leblanc -Tid who was recently recognized as the Alumni of the Year by the University Santa Anne's Association des Alumni, Association des Alumni. After graduating from St. Anne and earning a master's degree in Moncton, Jocelyn began her teaching career in our local schools. Throughout her professional journey, she actively participated in various organizations and even served as president of the Association des Enseignants Acadiens de la Nouvelle-Écosse. Jocelyn's commitment to her community is truly remarkable, and she volunteers with multiple groups and serves on numerous boards. Notably, she made history by becoming the first female president of this alumni organization that now celebrates her achievements. I ask that all members join me in offering, offering our congratulations to Jocelyn leblanc -Tid for all the well, for her well-deserved honor bestowed upon her by her alma mater's alumni association. Merci. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Madam Speaker, people in my community are happy to hear about the Dartmouth North Health Neighborhood, which will open sometime in 2024. Hopefully. This collaborative health home will include a primary care clinic, urgent care center, and a recruitment and residence teaching center. It will also include blood collection, rehab services, a diabetes center, the Nova Scotia Brotherhood and Sisterhood initiatives, and more. The push to make this a reality was a very grassroots community effort that was born out of frustration around Dartmouth North being an area with many complex needs and not enough services. The early conversations included residents Linda Rowe, Robin Gorman, Diana Quinn, Sabina Walker, among others, and pharmacist Irene Glinsky. The team, which is now known as the Dartmouth North Community Health Planning Team, grew and evolved since 2000 and, and since 2016 has met monthly. Resident voices are still at the core, I joined in 2017, and people working in the community and folks from Nova Scotia Health, primary care are also invaluable members of the team. There's so many great things about our community and there's a lot of need in terms of health care and I ask the House to join me in thanking the entire Dartmouth North Community Health Planning Team for recognizing this need and working so hard to make this health neighborhood a reality. Thanks. I recognize the honorable member for Picto Center. Madam Speaker, one of our favorite Picto County female hockey players has signed a contract with the Toronto franchise in the newly formed Professional Women's Hockey League. Canadian Olympian Blair Turmel from Stellarton has agreed to terms on a three-year contract through the 25-26 season. The league opens its inaugural season in January with teams in Ottawa, Minneapolis, St. Paul, New York City, Boston, Montreal, and Toronto. The PWHL will feature a number of the world's top female players, including Blair. She was with Team Canada's gold medal run at the 2022 Beijing Olympics and the silver medal victory in 2018 in Korea. She was also a member of the Calgary Inferno of the Canadian Women's Hockey League when it won the Clarkson Cup in 2016 and 2019. I ask all members to join me as we wish Blair Turmel and this new league great success. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
I recognize the Honourable Member for Clare on an introduction. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So in, I'd like to introduce two individuals in the West Gallery. Uh, you can stand as I name you. Uh, warden Yvon Leblanc, he's the warden of the Municipality of Clare. Uh, business owner and community leader, and I can honestly say he's doing a better job than I, I did as warden. <laughs> so congratulations. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Councillor Carl Devo. Uh, <laughs> Carl is a veteran, a former volunteer firefighter, and I'd like to congratulate him on his uh, retirement November 1st as, as a paramedic after 23 years of service. He's dedicated to his community and a great, great uh, community advocate. So thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center, Whitney Peer. Madam Speaker, I rise to pay respect to all veterans of World War II, Korea, the Gulf War, Afghanistan, and all international peacekeeping missions. We honor the individuals who served in war and peacekeeping missions who came home with wounds visible and invisible. In honor of our veterans and loved ones that did not come home, we continue to work toward a peaceful future. And we also are reminded about just how precious our democracy is. I want to acknowledge and honor the families who waited with bated breath for their loved ones to come home. I want to pay them respect for supporting their veterans as they transitioned back to home life. Lest we forget, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, 15 years ago, a small two-page double-sided newsletter called Swing Over the Mountain was born to inform Bullardry Island residents and people across Canada and the United States with a Bullardry Island connection of local news and history. None of this would have been possible were it not for the hard work and dedication of two Bullardry residents, Joyce Trenum and Wayne Leal. Both of it, these individuals have looked after producing and distributing the newsletter over those years. After those 15 years, both Joyce and Wayne have figured it's time to pass, the, pass on the job and are hopeful that some volunteers will come forward to ensure it continues. I ask all members of the legislature to please join me in recognizing these two wonderful individuals and thank Joyce and Wayne for keeping the residents both updated and educated. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Bedford Basin. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to recognize a woman in our province who has leveraged the power of women to create real change. Colette Robichaud co-founded 100 Women Who Care in Halifax a decade ago, and to date they've raised nearly $700,000 to support organizations in the community that are already making a difference. But Colette's dedication did not end there. As an entrepreneur, she recognized the hurdles and challenges facing women, particularly women from diverse communities. So thus was born the diversity marketplace. More than 100 women benefit from a free online business directi directory as a result. So from established businesses to side hustles, Colette's vision gives women an opportunity to shine. And I encourage anyone who wants to purchase with purpose to check it out. I would just note that I worked with Colette back in broadcasting um, not recently, it was uh, several decades ago, and I watched and was deeply impressed as she began her businesses Organize Anything and Colette Coaches, and I'm so delighted to see her success. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize Ms. Viola Desmond. Today is Viola Desmond Day, a day to recognize an amazing person who through her actions, actions of courage and defiance, and her fight for her rights as a human being, inspired the pursuit of equality and the fight against racial discrimination throughout this country. She took a stand against the injustice of segregation. She helped to advance the civil rights movement across Canada and laid the foundation for the movement to fight anti-black racism. As we know, the struggle is real. 
real today as it was during Viola's time. Many black communities continue to face discrimination, and racism, and lack of equal opportunity every day. On this day, Viola Desmond Day, I hope that Viola's story and her quest for equality, justice, and freedom for all will inspire others to work hard toward ending racism, where all of us Nova Scotians can live together free of racism and discrimination. I recognize the honourable member for Hans West. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Hans County native Tara Spencer and celebrate her tremendous success at the winner of the 2022-2023 Commonwealth Song Contest. The international contest consists of 20,000 entries from the 56 Commonwealth countries around the globe. Her winning song, Brick and Mortar, was written about the old textile mill, the remains of which sit adjacent Highway 101 in Windsor, which holds a special connection to her. Tara was not always a musician. She was formerly a funeral director in her hometown of Somerville, Hans County. Her ability to connect with families and hear their stories attributes to her success in songwriting. Five years ago, when she took a leap of faith and began her career as a solo music musician, she did not know that she would stand today as the winner of an international song contest. Madam Speaker, I ask that all members of the legislature join me in congratulating Tara for writing and performing a beautiful, sweet song. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Uh, thank you, Madam Chief Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, this weekend uh, is uh, Cape Breton University is hosting the 2023 uh, Men's Soccer Championships. So it's an exciting time in the community. Uh, but I rise my place to recognize uh, their honorary chair. They selected Dr. Alan Britton, uh, who is a professor of chemistry uh, and is uh, a former d dean of the School of Science and Technology uh, at Cape Breton University. Throughout his career that spans over 30 years at Cape Breton University, uh, Dr. Britton, uh, uh, has been not only a mentor in the classroom, but a mentor to many of the student athletes that come to Cape Breton University. Uh, you know, personally, I can say with uh, with Alan that uh, during my basketball years when I was in school, uh, he was a big part of uh, of that uh, with me and his sons. So I do want to rise my place uh, to recognize Dr. Alan Britton uh, for being the honorary chair for this weekend's uh, soccer championships at Cape Breton University. Uh, I want to wish the Capers all the best, but I, I, I want to thank Alan uh, for his commitment uh, to his students at Cape Breton University over 30 years uh, on his commitment to sport at Cape Breton University. Thank you. Okay. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to rise today and thank the Executive Director and Board Members of Cumberland Homelessness and Housing Support Association, better known locally as Cornerstone. The amazing work of this group, supported by the Town of Amherst and many other community-minded individuals and organizations, are helping to meet the needs of those in Cumberland area facing challenges, including those who are struggling to find a safe and warm place to sleep. Not only did Cornerstone support the opening of last winter's emergency temporary shelter, they have recently begun construction of a more permanent building that will house six affordable and supportive housing units, a community resource hub, and an overnight emergency shelter. As the team says, it is much more than just housing, support, and homelessness. It's about community. On behalf of our community, I would like to thank Executive Director Ashley Legere and all members of the Cornerstone team for their dedication to those in need in our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, today I rise to mark National Indigenous Veterans Day. This day started in 1994 to recognize the contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis veterans. It is estimated that 12,000 First Nations, Inuit, and Métis soldiers served in the conflicts over the last 100 years. Indigenous veterans overcame barriers of language, distance, and culture to join the Canadian effort. Their communities faced many challenges while supporting their friends and family in active service. First Nations saw thousands of acres expropriated in the, in the war effort, and as well, land was also taken from Indigenous communities to give to returning soldiers for farmland, but not to Indigenous veterans. And for most of the last century, Indigenous veterans faced reduced benefits and lacked access to many services. Throughout all of that, Indigenous communities have always honoured their veterans and hold them up in community gatherings. Madam Speaker, I ask all members to express their gratitude to these special veterans. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to uh, make an introduction before I do my member statement. Please do. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm honoured uh, today to introduce several people from Picto East who are joining us in, in your gallery with us today. Our, our three people and their spouses and support networks um, who, who are being recognised as heroes for their significant contributions to our communities in, in, in absolute times of needs. Uh, when our province faced extraordinary natural disasters, uh, uh, specifically with respect to Hurricane Fiona, but others as well. Uh, Hurricane Fiona meant thousands of uh, people needed help, and it required people to step up in different ways. So today, it is my honour to introduce uh, three of those people who, who stepped up to help their friends and neighbours and really went uh, above and beyond. I asked them to, to, to stand as I, as I call their name uh, and then uh, receive the warm welcome of the House afterwards. We have uh, John Davidson with us. Seymour Dutai and uh, and Dan McDonald, please uh, ask the House to give them a warm. Pleasure to have you here. I. Right. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, each uh, uh, community leaders and, and, and friends to me, so thank you for being with us uh, today. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise today to celebrate uh, local heroes. So many people in our province uh, can, can claim title to the word hero, but uh, these, are, these in particular are people who went above and beyond to help their neighbours, their communities and complete strangers in the aftermath of some devastating natural disasters in our province and in our community. Seymour Dutai, who works for a local excavation company, worked an extraordinary number of hours helping Nova Scotia Power get power poles back into the ground so people could have their power turned back on following Hurricane Fiona. Uh, and, and in the few spare hours he did have, Seymour took his own wood chipper to help community members remove trees that were blown over. John Davidson and Dan McDonald both worked, uh, worked on the ground with the Regional Emergency Management Organization. Day and night, they could be found at the Pictou County Wellness Centre, doing all they could to help residents who were dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Fiona. Uh, there were even times when John took his own tractor to remove debris on the main road, which helped residents and Nova Scotia Power employees get where they needed to go. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of this House to thank Seymour, John and Dan and their families uh, and all the heroes around the province for their dedication to our communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, tomorrow is Rena McGuire, my better half, my partner, my best friend's birthday. Uh, she's going to kill me for doing this, but I want to take a moment to thank her. Sometimes I am loud, sometimes I am a complete mess, and sometimes I don't make sense. But uh, she is there for me. There are times when my obsession, my drive, overwhelms me. You bring me back to earth. There are times where my anxiety and depression makes me single-minded, and you stop me and show me that life is beautiful. You remind me all the time why I do this, people before politics and this province before parties. If I could, I would give you the world for your birthday. Instead, you will get hugs, kisses, smiles, a couple of presents, and of course, sushi. So have a beautiful day, my love, my best friend. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Yarmouth on an introduction. Thank you very much, and I'll just say that it's the most beautiful thing the Member for Halifax Atlantic has ever said <laughs> in the Chamber. I want to bring the House's attention to the West Gallery. We're joined by a Councillor of District 1 in Shetty Camp, Claude Poirier, who is a, uh, a great friend of this Chamber and a great friend to many in his community and beyond. Uh, Claude, thank you so much for joining us, and I'd like all the House to join me in, in welcoming uh, Councillor Poirier to the, uh, today's event. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Madam Speaker, this past spring, a documentary created by Dartmouth North resident Megan Wenberg debuted at the Toronto Hot Docs Film Festival. Unsinkable, spelled S-Y-N-C, is a film about uh, six senior artistic, former 
formerly synchronized swimmers, preparing for the U.S. Masters Artistic Swimming Championships. The athletes range in age from 63 to 82 years old. The film has also been featured in the Lunenburg Dog Fest, where it won the Best Atlantic Filmmaker Award and the Calgary International Film Festival. Unsinkable is produced by Telltale Productions with Edward Peel and Aaron Oakes. Megan, whose previous works include films Drag Kids and The Killing of Philip Boudreaux, hopes that Unsinkable will inspire audiences to see aging in a new light. I ask the House to join me in congratulating Megan on Unsinkable's success and thank her for challenging society's view on what it means to age. I recognize the Honourable Member for Queen's. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to highlight a wonderful new facility in addition to the Main Street in Liverpool. In August, Dining at Main and Mersey officially opened its doors, offering fine dining and Japanese fusion cuisine to those who enter the doors. Main and Mersey is a well-established coffee shop and a popular community hub where residents and tourists alike meet in a very relaxed and jovial environment. Now, thanks to the vision of owners Andreas Ermer and Shani Beadle, they have extended the business with their new restaurant which offers folks a comfortable atmosphere and a creatively, creative, creatively delicious menu. I sincerely thank Andreas and Shaney for choosing Liverpool in which to operate their business and I wish them a successful future as they cater to the foodies in Queens and beyond. Thank you Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, volunteerism is an important contributor to our vibrant rural communities. At the recent Provincial Volunteer Awards, Kevin West of West Brooklyn was recognized for his more than 30 years as an active volunteer in Kings County. Kevin's commitment to supporting community was evident during his working career at the Flower Card, and with him taking on many volunteer roles during his working life and now in his retirement. He currently serves on the Deep Roots Music Festival Board, board and volunteers for the West Brooklyn Hall Speakeasy. He played a key role in starting Nova Scotia's first memory cafe. Kevin also volunteers for beach cleanups along the Bay of Fundy, helps out at the Wolfville's Farmer's Market, and enjoys the Full Circle Festival in Avondale, where he buys a pass and then volunteers with the setup and teardown. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in thanking Kevin West for his many years of volunteering in our community and congratulate him on receiving a well-deserved Provincial Volunteer Award. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to pay tribute to the three legions in my riding of Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer, all of whom will be hosting a Remembrance Day ceremony on Saturday. New Waterford Branch 15, the Allen McDonald Memorial Legion. Whitney Peer Branch 128, also servicing South Bar and the Lingan Road. Branch 78, servicing Dominion, Reserve Mines, and Grand Lake Road. These legions are dedicated to supporting veterans and their families. They are also committed to Remembrance Day education in the, in the various schools that they serve. I also want to pay tribute to Annabets, Unit 217 in New Waterford, comprised of ex-service members. Annabets plays an active role in our, in our Remembrance Day ceremony in New Waterford, including hosting the evening dinner. Thank you to all the legions and Annabets for all your work all year round for our veterans and families, lest we forget. I recognize the Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize retired school teacher Daniel McDonald from Baker Settlement. Daniel was a beloved teacher at Hebville Academy. Since his retirement, he has continued to contribute to the education of our next generation, tutoring hundreds of students in math offering services to those needing his help, regardless of their financial means. He even rose to the challenge during COVID-19 and continued tutoring virtually. Stella Bowles, a former student, says that Danny is one of the kindest, smartest, best humans I have ever had the privilege of knowing. Every student who sees them, and there are many, enjoy him tremendously. And over the many years of his dedication, he has built up an incredible wall of fame of his graduates. Danny is also a dedicated member of his church and community. I call on members of the House of Assembly to join me in extending our gratitude to Daniel McDonald for his guidance, kindness, and support of our students in our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, last night, I attended a fundraising dinner uh, in my constituents, Halifax Yard Club, uh, uh, Arbdell, and uh, this fundraising was a very uh, 
worthwhile to attend. Uh, this program was attended, was uh, intent uh, to introduce Nova Scotians, whether they're newcomers or uh, uh, residents of this uh, province, for the sailing uh, program, our beautiful water and ocean. And I really uh, enjoyed, I attended last summer, and I also was surprised to see the amount of difference uh, in terms of a diverse people who attended this program. And we, as elected officials, we do have a people who have an impact for our communities many different ways. And today, I would like to recognize Anthony Rosebury for his work with the Armdale Yacht Club. Anthony runs the board, broader reach and sailing school program, getting the community members involved and teach them to sail. Earlier this year, I visited the club and I was in, in, inspired by the work he does in the community. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll ask members of this house to join me and to congratulate Anthony for his contribution to our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize Coulter Simmons. Coulter Simmons is a well-known community advocate, basketball coach, mentor, an organizer, and a friend whose passion for community and youth allowed us to have a strong connection. This summer, Coulter was our candidate for the Preston by-election, and it was filled with lots of campaigning and long hours of time getting to know and sparking new and old relationships in the Preston community. Coulter was in the forefront of it all. He is someone who truly understands his community and the issues surrounding his area. Coulter is connected to youth and community through family ties, and his work with basketball and mentorship also gives him an understanding that our young people represent a generation of people who are tired of the status quo. Which is why, Madam Speaker, I wanted to recognize Coulter today and thank him for his hard work and fight and standing up always for our communities and our youth in the Preston area. I recognize the Honourable Member for Richmond. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would like to recognize one of the tireless volunteers in Richmond County. Doris Carter is 81 years young and has spent countless hours volunteering in our community. Doris is a retired teacher and a mother of two. She's the proud grandmother of four grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Doris has volunteered with the McCaskill House Museum, the local 4-H club, the Festival of Trees, the St. Peter's Parish, where she still teaches religion classes, and the Richmond Villa, where she has spent many hours visiting with residents. For many years, Doris was the president of the Lakeside Community Hall, where she organized many events for young and old. Recently, she has stepped down as president after many successful years. Doris will still keep busy as she is an avid knitter, seamstress, and baker. She also keeps busy during tax season as she completes ta income tax returns for many local residents. Madam Speaker, I ask all members to join me in honouring Doris Carter, who is a perfect example of a community volunteer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Coal Harbour Darkmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today is World Town Planning Day. November 8 has been set aside to annually commemorate the important role planning plays in establishing our communities. Planning is an important process that goes into developing any urban, suburban, or rural area. Town planning refers to applying technical processes focusing on the design, development, and the use of infrastructure that is put in place when creating complete communities with a focus on accessibility, transportation, and availability of common spaces. November 8 is globally recognized by over 30 countries and four continents and commemorates the work of planners and communities across the globe as they come together to celebrate how good planning improves the lives of people and benefits for society at large through creating sustainable places to live, work, and play together. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Argyle on an introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm really pleased to join, uh, welcome to the House some uh, friends from home. Uh, in the East Gallery, we have uh, my uh, councillor from District 5, who's also a Deputy Warden. We have Nicole Albright. She's also joined by Kathy Bork, who is the uh, Municipal Councillor for District 7, as well as our Warden in Argyle, Danny Muse, who's 
councillor for District 1. Uh, Chris Froughton, who's a constituent of mine as well, who's the CAO for the municipality of Barrington, is also here. And i also like to acknowledge uh, some friends from Clare. Uh, we have um, the warden, uh, Yvon LeBlanc, as well as our good friend Carl DeVoe, who's a candidate of record for, for our party. And so I ask all members of the House to join me and welcome them. Welcome to the Nova Scotia House of Assembly. I hope you enjoy your visit. Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Madam Speaker, today I rise to draw attention to, to the House to the importance of forestry and forestry operations to communities across the province. In these inflationary times, the overall contribution of the forestry industry to the economy of our province cannot be understated. In Cumberland North and in fact across all Nova Scotia, forestry is a major employer that supports many businesses, individuals and families. In addition to the jobs created, we must also recognize how access to this natural resource can and should be utilized to address the current housing crisis. As projects like the recently announced public housing units move forward, I would hope the tender documents will request that as much as possible, quote, made in Nova Scotia products will be required. I also encourage all buildings and contractors to ask for and use Nova Scotia wood products whenever possible. All those efforts will support our foresters. Our beautiful forests are also important for their contribution to our environment. Our Nova Scotia air is clean and fresh and yes, much of that is thanks to our trees. Madam Speaker, please join me in thanking our foresters for their commitment to managing their industry and our forests so we can protect this valuable natural resource now and into the future. Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Preston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize and congratulate the Woodlawn High School football team located in Dartmouth. The Woodlawn Panthers won the high school football championship game for the 2022-2023 school year. Congratulations to all 37 players and the coaches, namely Robert Tink, Glenn States, Lewis Clements, Barry Greer, Chris Melanson, Brady Hayes, John McCabe, and Nathaniel Skeet for volunteering their time to help this team achieve this honor. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to please join me in congratulating Congratulating the Woodlawn Panthers for another successful year. Here, here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to introduce everybody uh, to someone that a lot of people in this chamber know, uh, Troy Ryan from Spryfield. Uh, Troy played minor hockey in Shibukdo, then AAA midget with Halifax McDonald's, then he played uh, in the MHL, then with the Mooseheads, and then in the early and mid-90s, Troy played university hockey with UNV and St. Mary's. He then became a coach. In 2021, he coached the Acadia X-Men, and then he went on to coach the Antigonish Bulldogs, and then the Pictou County Weeks Crushers. Well, Madam Speaker, in 2021, Troy was named head coach for the Canadian women's hockey team who competed in the 2022 Winter Olympics, leading them to a gold medal. Well, Madam Chair, I'm glad to announce that he's back behind that bench, and Hockey Canada announced a couple of days ago that Spryfield's own Troy Ryan will be the head coach of the national hockey team leading into the 2026 Winter Olympics. Good luck, and let's go get that gold. I recognize the honorable member for Digby, Annapolis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise proudly today to honour the members of the Digby Ground Search and Rescue. Incorporated in 1973 for the last 50 years, this organization has, in times of need, provided much-needed support to the residents of our area. I know their work is greatly appreciated. Digby Ground Search and Rescue is a volunteer organization that has been there to provide support whenever they are needed. They do their best work in the most difficult of times, whether the circumstance be a lost child or hunter or fires or floods and so much more. The Digby Ground Search and Rescue members are always there to help. Nova Scotia is recognized as a province where the phrase, help your neighbours, is more than just words. The members of Digby Ground Search and Rescue represent that statement. On behalf of the residents of Digby Annapolis, I want to say thank you to all the volunteers. Your hard work and dedication over the past 50 years is truly appreciated. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Clayton Park West joining us virtually. Please go ahead. Madam Speaker, 
I rise today to congratulate the Halifax Under-11 AAA Mets baseball team on their silver, silver medal win recently in Cornerbrook, in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland and Labrador. I was very proud to support the players on this very important trip. Despite the impending weather that threatened our region due to Hurricane Lee, the team ventured to Cornerbrook safely and I'm told they had a lot of fun. I would like to give a special shout out to the four players from Clayton Park West, uh, Cameron, Jackson, Keaton, Jackson, Keaton and Peyton. I also would like to acknowledge the head coach, Gregor McPherson and the rest of the coaching team, as well as Danielle Melanson as the best baseball mom fundraiser. This was the second win for this team as they captured the 2023 Provincial Championship. I would like the House to join me in congratulating the, uh, the Halifax Under-11 AAA Mets baseball team for their dedication and well-deserved win. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just want to take uh, 15 seconds to wish everybody a happy Diwali starting on November 10th. Cheers. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> okay, order. Uh, the time is now 2 o'clock. We will now begin with oral questions put by members to ministers, and we will finish at 2.50. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Ma Madam Speaker, when a child is unable to remain in the custody of their parents, uh, they go into the custody of the province. When these children turn 18, uh, they no longer qualify for supports from the government. And many of those uh, youth are now finding themselves out on the street. In fact, a study funded by HRM in the province surveyed people in Halifax who are experiencing homelessness. The results were extremely troubling, Madam Speaker. 10% uh, of those experiencing homelessness are, are youth. Uh, can the Premier please tell us what plans he has in place to ensure that these most vulnerable uh, folks who are young people just coming out of provincial care and custody, have supports right now so they can get off the streets. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you. thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for this, uh, is this important question. This is something that uh, we're, we're, we're deeply concerned about as a government, but certainly Nova Scotians are, are, are concerned about this as well. Uh, homelessness in general is is um, is having a big impact on our on our society. We're we're making significant investments and in to try to try to make sure people have safe, affordable housing. But uh, homelessness amongst our youth is is particularly heartbreaking. So it is an issue that the government is very focused on. We'll continue to to make investments to support Nova Scotians. I recognize the leader of the official opposition on his first supplementary. Thank you very much, much Madam Speaker. There, there has not been a specific mention of youth homelessness in the government's housing strategy. We have not heard of any specific initiatives that are being led um, anywhere across the board, I think, from, the, from either the Minister of Community Services, Minister of Housing, or the Premier. This is leading to a very dangerous and precarious situation. We've heard from Kim Kent, co-founder of Peer Outreach Support Services and Education, who says that young people are now being sexually exploited for housing in Nova Scotia because of this very dangerous situation. I know the government can understand the severity and uh, scariness of the situation. Can the Premier please commit to addressing this issue with all expediency. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I, I know the, the, the government works with a number of not-for-profit organizations, community organizations, trying to support uh, Nova Scotians and making, making those investments. We'll continue to make investments in, in new public housing, new affordable housing, uh, new, uh, I know the, the minister is working hard with municipalities on, on programs like pallet housing as emergency shelter for people. Um, so we'll continue to, we'll continue to uh, do what we can as a government to support those organizations that are helping Nova Scotians and, and directly help them where we can as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The leader of the official opposition on his final supplementary. But, uh, but, but Madam Speaker, um, 
the Premier has actually cut funding to a lot of these groups through the HRM bill that's before the House. A lot of the not-for-profits that do this critical work, wraparound services, emergency housing, may no longer get funding. Uh, for this. Furthermore, it goes beyond these organizations. The province has a role here and can play a very key role. And I'm worried that the government's uh, policies are actually making the situation worse by freezing income assistance for two years, by allowing Nova Scotia to become the only country in Canada to fail on poverty and food insecurity, uh, refusing to hire more Crown prosecutors and having more hard-nosed criminals back out on the street, uh, not uh, banning the use of NDAs for sexual assault. You know, all of these issues, I think, really question. impact our youth. And my question to the Premier is he's previously committed to bringing in a youth advocate to this province. Will he follow through on that commitment today and promise a youth advocate for these young people who are experiencing these dangers? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And the member uh, listed off a, a litany of issues which uh, I, I disagree with, with his assessment on most of So we're, we're investing over $300 million in affordable housing. Uh, the, the minister has, the minister has, 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 has talked before about the, the, the government has made FTE positions available. Sometimes they're difficult to fill, but the funding is there. We'll work with, we'll work with organizations on those. And, uh, and in, in terms of the, the process that government looks at to fund which organizations can, they can fund and which they can't, there's always the need is always much larger than, than the ability. We do what we can. We always wish we could do a little more, uh, but we do what, do what we can, and then, and then some for sure, but I would just I would just say to the member, if there are any organizations that have had their funding cut that he's particularly troubled by, uh, he can come to us and we can talk about that and see if we can work on a, on a solution. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, while the Premier has spent a great deal of time recently blaming municipalities for slowing down housing development, his own government is refusing to put housing on a plot of land that's been earmarked for housing for years. Build Nova Scotia, formerly developed Nova Scotia, has had a plan complete with zoning at Dartmouth Cove since 2012 on provincial land that is serviced, has complete plans, community buy-in, and could yield as much as a thousand housing units. Madam Speaker, when is the Premier going to stop blaming others for the housing crisis and get his own house in order? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As a government, we're moving very quick on, on a number of files. Uh, there's no question about that, particularly on the housing uh, file where we we're working with a, a number of organizations, working with the federal government, trying to work with municipalities, uh, changing legislation where it's, where it's deemed necessary to go faster. Uh, in this particular example, I believe the, 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 the member is, is referring to a specific example that was put out for tender. Somebody was awarded that tender, and then on their side are having a few delays getting going. We are certainly not happy about those delays, uh, but we understand they happen, and we're working with that. We're working with that organization to try to move forward. The leader of the New Democratic Party on our first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If the Premier was following the housing file, he would know that that is not the site I am talking about. I am talking about the Dartmouth Cove site adjacent to the ferry, connected to Alderney Drive, where private development is rising all around, but the Minister of Public Works said the other day that it's on the back burner because she didn't think that, that we were going to build by the coast. That's interesting because yesterday the Premier said that the Coastal Protection Act might not come into force at all, so we're content for people to build by the coast except for at Dartmouth Cove on provincial land. Can the Premier see how ridiculous it is to hold a plot like this, to not build on it? There are no bidders when housing is so badly needed. The Honourable Premier. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. I asked the member to table the comments of the Minister because I'm certainly uh, not familiar with those comments and I find, have a hard time believing that they're accurate or accurately quoted. Uh, but what I, what I would say, I would, I, would assure, I would assure the member that as a, as, a, as, a, as a government, we are moving as quickly as we can on a number of housing initiatives as evidenced by the over $300 million we've invested in housing this year. We, we, will, we, will continue, uh, we will continue to make investments. We will continue to work with developers, not-for-profits, municipalities. We will work with anyone who wants to help us get more housing for Nova Scotians, including the member opposite, if she chooses to try to work with us. 
recognize the leader of the New Democratic Party on our final supplementary. Thank you. I'm, I'll happily table the article. Um, but notwithstanding, yeah, it's all Nova Scotia. I'll print it out. I'll table it. I didn't quote from an article. I paraphrased. I am not required to table it, but I will, Mr. Premier. The Premier seems... I'm addressing the Premier because he is addressing me. The order, Premier seems... Yeah. Order. There's a lot of chatter. Let's let her... Everyone just tame down here, and uh, we will go back to the question with the leader of the New Democratic Party. Through me, please. So the Dartmouth Cove land, which the province owns and refuses to build on because it's close to the coast, is sitting there, ready for a 1,000 units serviced. But Sandy Lake, which is a special planning area, has and has recently been accelerated. This is an unserviced site with environmental features such as old growth forests, species at risk, wetlands, streams, and the government is pushing to develop this site despite a coalition of dozens of community groups trying to protect it. Make it make sense, Madam Speaker. Government held site, Dartmouth Cove, ready to build, community buy-in, but an environmentally sensitive area with private interest rammed through. When will the Premier start Question. building housing where communities know it is wanted and needed? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Just as quickly as we can, Madam Speaker, uh, for sure. I don't think there can be any question that this government is moving fast on housing. In fact, I think the member in, in her preamble quoted a few situations where we're moving so fast, it's too fast for her liking. Uh, we will continue to move fast, uh, Ma Madam Speaker, and I'd ask again for the member to table the comments, which I, I, I'll be curious to see the interpretation of context that was displayed on the floor here. <laughs> I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Today, post-secondary students from across HRM and the province came together to protest outside here in Province House. Uh, top of their concerns is affordability and housing. The cost of living is rising in Halifax faster than anywhere else in the country due to rental increases and overall inflation, outpacing every other single uh, province. Madam Speaker, we've seen in this chamber for the last uh, four weeks the province not step up and support students who are dealing with cost of living challenges and, and housing challenges. My question to the Premier is will he please table his student housing report so that we know what this government's plan is to help our post-secondary students. The Honourable Minister for Advanced Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for, for the question. Uh, Madam Speaker, we know that, uh, that students right across Nova Scotia are important to Nova Scotia. We look to students in order to be the next generation that's going to move Nova Scotia forward, and we appreciate everything that they're here for. I appreciate that students take their time to come down and protest things that are important to them. But, Madam Speaker, we do a lot for students. We have the most generous student assistance program right across this country. We have a number of programs that will assist students. We have the Nova Scotia Bursary Program, but for university students, that takes $1,283 right off of their tuition. And Madam Speaker, we will continue to look for ways to support students in Nova Scotia because they are important. I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Madam Speaker, international students are particularly facing significant challenges with double the fees in Nova Scotia, uh, but they're also having an impossible time finding places to live. And according to students, they're saying they're promised the world, they're promised a job, a good place to live, opportunities galore, and that's obviously not the case, and I'll table that. International students are driving from Truro and even as far as Halifax every day to attend classes in Sydney, uh, and I'll table that. My question to the Premier, you know, the, the, the fact that our international students are not able to find housing here, this is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to immigration and housing. If we're not able to accommodate our international students, how does the Premier plan and what's his plan to actually double the population and make sure people in this province have housing? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Advanced Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question. Madam Speaker, we are experiencing the unprecedented growth here in Nova Scotia. International students have choice. They can go anywhere in the world, and they choose Nova Scotia. They choose. They choose Nova Scotia because of the way of life. They choose Nova Scotia for our world-class institutions. We are planning for population growth, whereas the former government, when they designed the, the wonderful Nova Scotia Community College, which is going to really enhance Cape Breton, without a housing plan, Madam Speaker. Unbelievable. Thank you. 
recognize the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our caucus is a big believer in universal childcare as one of the first provinces that negotiate a deal with bringing $10 a, a day childcare to Nova Scotia. The success of a universal childcare system, though, requires sufficient and continued supply of ECEs to meet the rising demand. However, the current state of increasing wait lists and lack of expected staff entering the system means unless we make some serious changes, we will not be able to realize truly universal childcare for everyone, and these long wait lists will continue to become the norm in our province. My question is, does the minister believe that unless they don't bring in more incentives or investments soon, that they will not be able to provide the number of spaces promised in the plan? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank the member opposite um, for the opportunity to speak about the incredible investments that we are making in childcare in Nova Scotia. So we've known for decades that childcare needs investments. We we are not creating wait lists now. Those wait lists have existed for decades. I was on wait lists 15 years ago when I was looking for childcare. But we are taking the opportunity now with the incredible investment of our federal partners, the investment that our government is making to do the things that we need to do to build out a childcare system that doesn't have wait lists, that has spaces available across the province where all Nova Scotians need them. That's why we've reduced childcare fees already by half. That's why we've invested in our ECEs 14 to 46 percent wage increases. That's why we've built out over 2,000 spaces, and that's why we're going to continue working, Madam Speaker. Recognize the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And all those things are easy to do when they start on day one with $605 million to spend in the sector. And I'm, I'm going to table a national study which reveals that if the current trend under this government continues, it will take Nova Scotia longer than any other province, approximately 35 years, sure. to graduate the number of new ECEs required to meet the promised new spaces. This compares with at least five other provinces that will take less than 10. For the Minister of Education, or even perhaps Advanced Education, what will they do to create the new spaces required in post-secondary to change this trajectory to ensure that we have $10 a day childcare for everyone in this province? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So absolutely, we do need more ECEs. That's why the department is working closely on the advice of our uh, minister's advisory table to understand what the needs of the sector are to make sure that we do provide those courses and, and available training for ECEs. So I can say we've already taken steps in that direction. We're already providing cohorts um, for ECEs um, for um, folks who've previously not had access to, to training. So we have uh, training available in rural areas. We have virtual training. We have cohorts for African Nova Scotia um, ECEs um, to ensure that they have access. But we have to do all of these things together. We can't focus on one thing at a time because all of this needs to be in lockstep to build the full system out to meet all of Nova Scotia's needs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect on a new question. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and obviously it's not enough. We have a number of provinces that are named as leaders in this separate report recently that says that we should follow the examples of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Newfoundland, PEI, New Brunswick, BC, and Nunavut. And so we're behind virtually every other Atlantic province. Nova Scotia was the only one not mentioned there, Madam Speaker. Childcare workers require more support, including higher wages and other benefits, but they also need to be paid more than they have in the past to retain them. And we have proposed one idea that would actually help retain childcare workers. The study shows that the workforce is predominantly composed of women, majority of whom are older than the age of 25, and are, are parents to at least one child themselves. What will the province do to support the workers that have their own child care needs in the sector. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So there's kind of two elements to that question, and I, I want to speak first to the, the question around what we're going to do to support our ECEs um, in relation to child care. And I, I would just like to observe that the whole premise of the child care transformation that we're doing is universal access to child care. The whole point of this is to make sure all Nova Scotians everywhere have access to child care. And so we know our ECEs need access to child care, but if the, if the, um, if the skilled trades worker who is building the centre down the road doesn't have access to childcare, that's not going to help that ECE. If the doctor who the ECE needs to see when they're sick doesn't have access to childcare, that's not going to help our childcare system either. Universal childcare means childcare for everyone across Nova Scotia who needs it, not just one individual area. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the 
recognize the honorable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe the minister is making my point. Now we have less and less people actually accessing childcare in the province. I have never seen the amount of people calling my office that are on wait lists, that are actually paying deposits on places that they can't even get access to wait lists. And we now have the most expensive childcare in all of Atlanta, Canada. The national study goes on to say that given the majority of early child Good education workers are parents and with earnings that barely outweigh the average cost of childcare. Early childhood education prof professionals with children may be forced to weigh the cost of working against childcare costs, which could cause some professionals to leave the market. Has the province considered offering this incentive that we're proposing or any other formal incentive to areas that have the most need of childcare that have wait lists that are getting out of hand? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So I, I heard a lot of speculation there around what might happen as a result of, of something we may or may not do. But what I can say, Madam Speaker, is we have invested in our ECEs. We have provided raises of 14 to 46 percent for this sector. Not only that, Madam Speaker, we have connected our ECE wages to our civil service wage increases. So they don't have to speculate about whether they will get an increase. They've already received an increase since we provided the 14 to 46 percent. And when we get civil wage... Uh, civil service wage increases, they'll continue to get those increases. And so what I can say is my the feedback that I'm hearing from, um, from operators is that those steps that we've already taken are making a difference. More ECEs are coming into the system, they're interested in participating, and it is already making a difference, and we're going to continue to do this work. Madam the Speaker. Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Premier. People in my community are beyond frustrated by the state of the old Bloomfield School. Fire officials are warning that first responders may not be able to enter and that someone could die at that site. The building is an eyesore, a fire risk, a safety risk, and its owners is refusing to do anything about it. On top of that, it's zoned and approved to be badly needed housing on the peninsula. We are in a crisis. Will the Premier give municipalities stronger powers to make developers move on badly needed approved housing? I recognize the Honourable Minister responsible for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, uh, um what I can say to the member is we're certainly, uh, uh, thank you for the question, we're certainly aware of the Bloomfield site. I mean, the official opposition may have more to say on the Bloomfield site because this is wrapped up in history of, of their actions as government. Uh, it's in the hands of a private developer now, and uh, at the moment that, that is where it stands. It's in, uh, we respect that, but I do appreciate the member advocating for greater powers for the minister. I appreciate that. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I will say I want to also make a correction that um, I said give make the developers, so give the powers to the municipality to do that work. And as well, we are in this government. Who is the government? You are responsible to do that work. So fire inspectors have noted that another abandoned building, presumably St. Pax Alexander, is facing similar issues. There are no municipal delays at this site and no reason to railroad municipal pa partners. Will the Premier stop distracting with municipal blame tactics, which we just seen, and do something that will actually work to make sure housing gets built on these lots as soon as possible, quick and fast? <laughs> Order. Order. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, uh, Madam Speaker, what I can say to the members, I too have walked by or driven by that site. Am I aware of, of how terrible a site it is? It is in the hands of a private developer. I will ask my staff to look at what, what, what options there are for us, and uh, I'm sure the municipality is well aware of it as well. I recognize the Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there's a pattern with this government that we find deeply concerning. They acknowledge a problem, but they won't do anything to fix it. With NDAs, they had once acknowledged that there's an issue, but they won't do anything to fix that. With fixed-term leases, they had once acknowledged there was a problem, but they wouldn't do anything to fix that. And when we first brought up the issue of childcare waitlist fees during this House session, they acknowledged that there is an issue, but they won't do anything to fix it. My question through you to the Minister, why won't the Minister take action and ban the childcare waitlist fees? 
I recognize the Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. Um, so, so child care waitlist fees are inconsistent with our goal, our shared goal with the federal government of affordable, accessible, quality, inclusive child care. And um, as I think I've indicated previously, I've directed the department to provide me with options um, that we can and steps that we can take in relation to these fees. And I look forward to the department providing a report on that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park. Madam Speaker, the, the fact of the matter is, is that families don't have options. And we have a number of families in our province, in my riding, and many other areas that are struggling and they're desperately in need of support. When they're told that they'll get a spot if they pay hundreds of dollars to, to put a hold on it, they're going to do so in an act of desperation. And we know that this actually impacts mostly women who are trying to get back into the WIT workforce. So my question to the Minister is, please, why won't they do more than just acknowledging that the practice is wrong and outright banning it from happening. The Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So the reality is we are going full tilt ahead, full steam ahead with the transformation of child care. And it is so much more than one issue. Um, with the transformation of child care, we need to build additional spaces. We've already built over 2,000 spaces, or we had as of the last quarter. I look forward to a significant update in this most recent quarter. We've already increased our ECE wages by 14 to 46 percent. We've reduced child care fees by half already. This is one small element of the many, many steps that we need to take, and we will be taking action, as we're going to do with every other thing that needs to be done, to create a childcare system that provides childcare to all Nova Scotians where they need it, regardless of where they live, when they work. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We know that before and after school child care is a good thing. But we are hearing what, but what, what we are hearing is a dire situation that families are going through trying to find child care for their infants to four-year-olds. This government is on, only has a net gain of 28 child care seats, and people all over the province are struggling with finding child care. This government is not taking the issue seriously enough. They cannot even get their homework done in time to get $123 million from the feds. Madam Speaker, when will families across the province see the promised 1,500 net gain of child care spots, ex excluding before and after school care? The Honourable Minister for Education. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So, um, we have created over 2,000. As of the last quarter, we've created over 2,000 new spaces. That was a net gain of over 1,700 new spaces. I know that we will be reporting in the very near future on the most recent quarter, and there's been a significant increase since that time. Madam Speaker, we've inc taken incredible steps to create spaces, uh, affordable, inclusive, quality childcare spaces across the province. The reality is this is something that's been neglected for decades, Madam Speaker. And so if I could do it like this and create those spaces overnight, I would. But that's not how significant foundational transformation works. This is a five-year journey, over $600 million, Madam Speaker. We are going as fast as we can. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And as someone who was involved with that $605 million deal, the government was giving it on a platter and they're not moving fast enough. And families are calling from all over the province telling us that. So, so Madam Speaker, the government promised 1,500 new daycare spots and they deliver a net gain of 28, but then brag about the number of child care spots they have before and, in before and after school child care. It just doesn't add up. Uh, Madam Speaker, my question to the minister, will this government have the promised 1,500 net new child care spots by the end of this year? I recognize the honorable minister for education. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I don't know how many more times I can say we've had a net gain of over 1,700 yeah. spaces. We've created over 2,000 spaces. I'm not sure which small date range and which small geo geographical location the member opposite is looking at to, to talk about that 28, but it's just, it doesn't reflect the reality across Nova Scotia, Madam Speaker. So, and I do look forward, Madam Speaker, to continuing to update Nova Scotians on the incredible progress that we are making. I know the urgency of this. I know know for any individual family out there right now who is waiting for childcare, it doesn't matter how many hundreds or thousands of spaces we create, if they don't have access, they feel an urgency. And I get that. I feel that urgency too, Madam Speaker. 
I recognize the honourable member for Bedford South. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Earlier this year, the government announced its uh, school capital plan, uh, announced four schools in government-held ridings and four to be announced at some undetermined later date in the HRM, where all of our schools are full and bursting at the seam. So I would ask the minister, when will the four schools promised for HRM be announced and where will they be? The Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite to talk about our capital plan, which I am so incredibly proud of, because for the first time ever, our, our government has a capital plan that is comprehensive and long-term and addresses the needs all across the province. Madam Speaker, we did announce four specific schools that are outside of HRM. We have announced four schools inside of HRM. We haven't identified those locations yet. But Madam Speaker, that's because our capital plan is comprehensive and strategic. And so it, it involves not just the announcement of individual schools, but it also includes a public works funding package that allows for proactive purchase of lands, which is key to determining where those schools will go. It also includes a proactive package of modulars that allows us to be quickly responsive to growing needs of communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm glad that the Minister ended uh, her response talking about modulars because you cannot drive past a school in Halifax, in suburban Halifax, without finding modulars that are full to the brim. I don't know if that's... I don't know if we should be happy. I don't know if we should be happy, Madam Speaker. Not too long ago, being in a modular classroom was an exception. Now Order. it is the norm. Order. The member from Bedford South has the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. Not too long ago, it was an exception to be in a modular classroom, and now it is absolutely the case that it is the norm. And I will also remind the House, I asked the Minister where the four schools promised for HRM will be, and she spent 45 second, seconds talking about everything but. So I would ask the Minister, when will those schools be announced, and where will they be so that students can actually get back into classrooms in schools? Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. So modulars are modern, beautiful learning spaces that students and teachers are happy to have access to. Um, Madam Speaker, modulars are the future, one of the future things that we're going to do and continue to do to ensure that we have a responsive capital plan so that we can build, build classroom spaces and educational spaces in a matter of months instead of a matter of years. And the member opposite, I, I would think, would know this because his, uh, his government actually introduced modulars. There wasn't a st strategic proactive plan, though, Madam Speaker, and that's what we've created. Madam Speaker. Public Works, I know, is working on the securing of lands that will support the addition of schools in addition to modulars, and I look forward to making those announcements when the time comes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Madam Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Earlier this year, I met with the Minister to discuss the rising homophobic and transphobic hate and violence in our schools. At the time, the minister recognized that the 2S LGBTQIA plus students are among the most vulnerable students in our schools. But since that meeting, there have been numerous more instances of this violence and no update on how the government plans to address this. Will the minister commit to tabling a plan in the House to address violence in schools? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So uh, we are always, always upset when there are incidents that happen in schools, and every student deserves access to a safe and inclusive, welcoming space where they are seen, where they are understood, and where they belong. And our 2S LGBTQIA plus students absolutely deserve access to those safe and inclusive spaces. Madam Speaker, our government embraces this um, fundamental philosophy. And the Department of Education and all of our schools are working to ensure that our 2S LGBTQIA plus students do feel that safety, do feel that welcome, and are embraced. And there are a number of initiatives underway in the schools to ensure that happens, including GSAs, including access uh, to mental health supports. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Madam Speaker, this year, the Department of Education's Student Success Survey showed that 42% of 2S LGBTQIA students had reported feeling unsafe or threatened in the past month. That's up 8% since 2019. 
These numbers will be no surprise to many Nova Scotian children and families, like Raven McLean, who, after experiencing a violent attack in a Cape Breton school this past September, said, I just don't want to go back there anymore, and now I'm going to be homeschooled. I'm just scared now and just really sad that this happened, and I'll table that. What does the minister have to say to 2S LGBTQIA students who are missing out on their education because of this government's inaction? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So that particular story and, and the story of any student who, who is harmed in school is, is heartbreaking to me, and I know it's heartbreaking to all of the adults and educators who are involved. Madam Speaker, that's why it's so important that we continue to do the work that's required to ensure that we build and maintain safe and inclusive school spaces. And so what does that mean for our 2S LGBTQIA plus students? Well, that means that they see themselves in school and that they're embraced by the people in school. It it means that they see themselves in the resources that are available and in books that are in schools. It means that we have inclusive um, supports and in staff. It means that our educators are also receiving um, uh, anti-discrimination training um, and education and uh, knowledge about supports that they can offer these students and all of those things are happening, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Madam Speaker, last week on Maritime Noon, workers, operators and families called in to talk about their stories when it comes to the lack of childcare. As one person put it, families in Nova Scotia have it rough. There are high rates of child poverty and people need to work, but they're stuck in precarious situations relying on scattered family supports. These stories are all too familiar and puts into perspective the lack of childcare spaces is having on Nova Scotians. Families are being forced to choose between working and childcare. Not being able to work results in high amounts of child poverty in this province. So my question to the Minister of Education, does the Minister agree with the callers to Maritime Noon that having to choose between childcare and working impacts the rate of child poverty in this province. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Education. Madam Speaker, uh, thank you to the member opposite for the question. So uh, I, my colleagues here in the Government Department of Education and Early Childhood Development, absolutely agree and believe in the importance of early childhood education, the importance of access to childcare all across the province for every family who needs it. It's fundamental to the well-being and security of our, of our children and our future. Every dollar that we invest in this pays dividends down the road, Madam Speaker. That is why we are working so hard to build out a childcare system that meets Nova Scotia's needs. This is a sector that has been neglected for decades, Madam Speaker. We have had wait lists for decades. We have had childcare deserts for decades. Our ECEs have been underpaid for decades. We are taking the steps to rectify those wrongs, Madam Speaker, and I look forward to continuing, to, to continuing this important work. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. The government says they are listening, but during their consultations, many could not come to the meetings because of the lack of childcare. The government also announced that they did a survey from September 18th to, no to October 25th. Can the Minister of Education tell us when we will see the results from these surveys and can she update us on how many Nova Scotians took part in these surveys? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So it is so fundamentally important that we have feedback and input um, and understand the perspectives of Nova Scotians as we build out this system. Um, and so I, uh, I would like to indicate that, in fact, we did have uh, family-friendly sessions available, in-person sessions available across Nova Scotia as we did the in-person in consultations. Um, between the in-person consultations and the online consultations, we had over a thousand people um, provide input and feedback. Um, that information is being um, uh, is being collated now, and I look forward to uh, to receiving a report on that and reporting back to Nova Scotians about what we heard. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Yeah, Madam Speaker, everybody forgets the thousands of seats pre-primary brought into this province over the last number of years that this government didn't support. Uh, but my question, Madam Speaker, another option that this government has to help kids in our province is to introduce a universal lunch program. This is an equitable approach to ensure that all kids in this province are fed both breakfast and lunch. Our neighbours in PEI introduced the universal lunch program along with school supplies uh, uh, without waiting for, on anyone. They just did the right thing. I will give the Minister an opportunity to answer this question. 
When will the kids in Nova Scotia get their universal lunch program? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Education. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So we do know how incredibly important it is that um, students have access to nutritious, available food. It's important not only for their education so that um, they have full bellies and aren't distracted as they're learning, but we know it's also important for their health and for their well-being. Madam Speaker, that is why we do invest millions of dollars in school food with it. Um, our government invests millions of dollars in school food. That's to provide the universal breakfast program. That is to provide a variety of other food programs, like the pilots we've introduced this year with food baskets, with um, food carts. Um, Madam Speaker, we look forward to the federal government continuing, uh, the federal government um, following up on their commitment to provide support for us to build out a universal lunch program. And we encourage our, our Liberal colleagues across the way to influence their colleagues to make that happen. Thank you, Recognize Madam. Recognize the Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. And, and I will actually say this, Madam, I look forward to my meeting with the Minister and representatives of the federal government that I initiated myself. And I hope that the Minister gets her meeting too as well about the lunch program for kids. It's important in this government uh, over the last two years has, uh, has uh, seen extra you know, billions of dollars come in and, and we've made the argument that if you have the extra money coming in let's help our kids let's feed them lunch and let's get them school supplies and let's take that cost away from families so madam speaker introducing a universal lunch program is the right thing to do the government can talk about pilots at certain schools but that doesn't meet the needs of kids in every school of this province my question to the minister for education will she commit that by january of 2024 there will be a universal lunch program for every kid in this province I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So, Madam Speaker, we are doing the work to ensure that our schools are ready to go with a universal lunch program. We are hopeful that our federal colleagues will, will come along and support us in that. Um, but, Madam Speaker, we are doing the work and we are not waiting for them. That is why we're introducing pilots. That's why we're expanding access to food in a variety of ways um, all across our province. Because, Madam Speaker, we know how important it is that students have access to, to healthy and nutritious food in schools, and that's why we're doing the work, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Madam Speaker, this government's election platform was focused on improving, actually no, transforming health care with a focus on recruitment of health care professionals. But this has not happened. There has been some limited success. However, when that is balanced against how many family physicians have either retired or simply worked themselves to death, the numbers just don't add up. For my constituents in Cumberland North alone, the situation remains critical, with only one full-time and one part-time family physician coming with a total of seven family physicians discontinuing their practices. Can the Minister of De the Department of Health and Wellness please share with the House when the people of Pugwash and the town of Amherst can see real progress in, with actual recruitment of family physicians. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for the question. So certainly we are very focused on recruitment of physicians, and I know the member from Cumberland South and I were able to attend an opening of a new collaborative care centre in Amherst several months ago. So we are looking forward. Negotiated a new physician contract, which has been is very good. We say it's a it's a good deal for physicians. It's a great deal for Nova Scotians, Madam Speaker. There are a number of things that are underway. We're looking at quality practice environments. We have innovative programs across this province, and we know that recruitment is top of mind, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I want to say how proud I am that six business people actually came together to offer turnkey medical office space. Nova Scotia Health later said, oh, we'll do that and we'll subsidize 50%. So I want to thank the minister for doing that, but it actually came from the lead of six business people in our community. Um, I, I must admit, uh, Madam Speaker, it is difficult to be objective when so many people in Cumberland 
and across all Nova Scotia are without a primary care provider. And as we see government taxpayer ads, one would lead to believe that the money being spent on recruitment is actually yielding great benefits when that is simply not the case. Can the Minister of Health and Wellness please tell us here in the House the total amount of money that has been spent in fiscal 2022 and 23 on physician recruitment, including both Department of Health and Wellness and Nova Scotia Health totals, and how many doctors I, actually set up practice in the province in the same time I frame? I recognize what is the Honourable the Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for the question. And I certainly feel that in order to recruit physicians, we're going to need all levels of government. We work with the municipalities. We work with on-the-ground recruiters in the municipal units. We work with physicians. There are two physician leads uh, in the uh, northern zone that do that. You, it's very difficult to quantify, but $6.5 billion has been spent on transforming health care in this province, Madam Speaker. We are looking at a variety of options. We just recently announced a new community fund for people to help recruit. We want to do this with communities, and I certainly encourage anyone who has an idea or an opportunity to help us recruit a physician to their community. We are open to hear that idea. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Madam Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. This week, Bridgewater, Clarks Harbour, Digby, Kentville, Lunenburg, New Glasgow, Trenton, the District of Chester, Kings County, West Hants Regional Municipality, the Region of Queens Municipality, and Pictou County all added their voices to the call for the implementation of the Coastal Protection Act. Mm. Despite all of this support, this government continues to delay the protection of our coast. Why won't this government listen to the loud majority of Nova Scotians? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And certainly, I have no doubt tomorrow when I attend uh, a, a, a meeting with Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, I'll have an opportunity to engage in discussion with uh, those municipalities. Their perspective, I, I certainly appreciate. But I also appreciate the perspective of 40,000 Nova Scotians, Madam Speaker. 40,000 Nova Scotians that this government has engaged with since September 29th. Uh, we look forward, Madam Speaker, to diving in and analyzing uh, the feedback that those coastal property owners have provided the government of Nova Scotia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Last year, Madam Speaker, the Minister stated that the Coastal Protection Act regulations would be in place in the first half of 2023, this year. Then, we were told they weren't coming until 2025. Finally, in a scrum yesterday, the Premier walked back his commitment again, saying he might not implement the Act at all. As was stated in the municipality's joint letter, quote, this delay breaks your promise to communities and represents a failure to protect Nova Scotians, and I'll table that. Now the deadline for the third and latest round of consultation has passed. Will the minister be very clear about when the Coastal Protection Act will be in force? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And the Premier was clear yesterday. We are going to now analyze the feedback from, uh, from coastal property owners. We have just completed a very important consultation. We appreciate the feedback from, uh, from folks in the two previous consultations. Now is the time to analyze and look at this feedback to determine the best path forward for coastal protection. Madam Speaker, there is enormous action on climate change in this province. You see that in the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act. You see that in our climate plan. You see that in our clean power plan that just recently we announced. There are a multitude of things that are happening, and coastal protection will be one component of that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clayton Park West joining us virtually. Please go ahead. Madam Speaker, we know that families, middle class Nova Scotians and seniors on fixed income are facing significant challenges in the cost of living crisis. Last week, the Minister of Finance said he's open to working with the Canada Revenue uh, agency to create a senior's income benefit. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Will he follow uh, 
It will be follow the lead of eight other provinces and commit today that he will create a senior income benefit to help all seniors in Nova Scotia. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Finance. Madam Speaker, I've been watching the news stories coming out of that, uh, out of that scrum, and what I did say was that the Seniors Care Grant is something new that our government started. It put money and continues to put money in the pockets of seniors in the province, and it's targeted, Madam Speaker, for seniors who are living at home, who have costs that other seniors, say, who might be living in a nursing home wouldn't have. So we're trying to help. We're using targeted supports, and we feel that's one that Nova Scotians have smiled upon that we've started. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the reply, but I was asking to create a senior income benefit. My question, however, is uh, we have another ask that the, to allow the seniors' care grant to be used for both rent and mortgage payments. And he was just talking about that. So um, we, we know many seniors are renting or wanting to rent when they downsize. However, the senior care grant does not allow those funds to be used for rent or mortgage. Will the minister commit to expanding the criteria so more seniors can pay their rent or mortgage payments using senior care grants? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, whenever we can, we try to work with Canada Revenue Agency if we're distributing benefits. Uh, because it's easier. We don't need to have the, uh, the people power to administrate it. Um, oftentimes, if we can m do something that the federal government's doing and maybe match it in a way, uh, that's a way we can do things. It's, it's just easier for us to do. It's more efficient. But in the case of the Seniors Care Grant, we have to be able to identify if the person is actually living in their home. Uh, we can't do that through the income tax system. Uh, and we also can't uh, assure that if there are two, two seniors living in a home, that we're providing the benefit to one household. So that's why we have the Seniors Care Grant set up the way we have it set up. Order, order. The time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. Before we go on, I, I do want to let everyone know that um, I see those who are on phones. In fact, yesterday someone had their phone up talking. And I don't like to point out names, but again, I will start if I have to. Um, so this is, um, you know, uh, another warning. It's disrespectful. And another thing I've noticed is that there's a lot of movement during question period. It's, uh, it's only for 50 minutes. Really think before you have to be in and out of the doors a number of times. And, and again, there was a lot of chatter um, when you're sitting right beside your colleague who's speaking. There's no need of that. We can do better. We can all do better. And um, I expect better. So um, just to say, I, I am going to start pointing out who's on their phone. And unfortunately, I will take the phone. So, um, and <laughs> Anyway, uh, moving on, I believe uh, we will move on now to um, opposition business. So I recognize the Honourable House Leader uh, for the official opposition. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we're going to start off uh, opposition business by calling Bill uh, Number 401, the Early Learning and Child Care Act, an act to amend. Uh, bill Number 4, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Four four zero one, uh, Bill Number Four Zero One, and I recognize the Honourable uh, Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to speak to this bill. This is a, a bill that our caucus brought forward uh, to help move the child care agreement along. The ten dollar a day child care agreement that we signed back in 2021, myself and my colleague from Sydney member two. And what we've seen in the last couple of years, although the investments are going forward, the analysis on the pay for child care workers has, was completed and adjustments have been made. Uh, we think that there needs to be continued work 
uh, to attract more ECEs, especially given that we uh, have seen studies that have proven that we are behind virtually every other province uh, and territory in this province uh, to ensure that the pipeline includes more and more ECEs being uh, graduated from our sole university that, that has uh, the program in the province, Mount St. Vincent, uh, and the community college. And given that uh, majority of the ECEs actually come from uh, Central Canada when it comes from uh, a national perspective. And, and first, uh, I forgot to table this during the during question period. There is a, a study uh, from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives that have pointed to seven other jurisdictions that are ahead of us already uh, in implementing $10 a day childcare. And that includes all the Atlantic Canadian jurisdictions. And, and so the challenge here that we have is to how to figure out a way um, to use provincial funds uh, within the, the scope of the agreement to ensure that we're both recruiting, but uh, perhaps more importantly, retaining workers that are in the system. And we know that uh, the majority of workers in uh, childhood uh, education are women, and we know um, that the majority of those uh, women are of age that uh, have children. Uh, but whether it's uh, a woman or a man or non-binary, we know that many of them do have children and that uh, this, this bill will actually provide uh, that childcare free of charge to uh, these workers. This is by no means uh, the solution uh, to the shortage in labour, but it is a creative idea and it's also an idea that we can show that we uh, support and that we appreciate uh, those that are working in the sector at relatively low wages. Uh, we know that uh, the ECEs have been underpaid for uh, some time. Uh, I think they're underpaid right now. I think they're underpaid under our government. I think they're underpaid under previous governments before that. I can remember when uh, Minister Karen Casey lifted the, uh, the wage floor and they became the highest paid in, in uh, Atlanta, Canada. That, that still wasn't enough at the time, Madam Speaker. So I think that all... all uh, uh, governments, all stripes uh, in this House are complicit in undervaluing the work that, that early childhood educators do. Uh, and I think that was, um, I think, evident how much they are needed during the time during the pandemic uh, when they were one of the only sectors that remained open because we needed people uh, to, to, to get to work and uh, we needed people uh, to have access to, to care for their children. And so I think that this is also another way that we can show how much of value that they were during difficult, challenging times like, like a global pandemic. Um, there's precedent across the, the country on looking at ways that we can attract and retain more ECEs. We, we know that we're not hitting our targets for spaces uh, being created when places like Ontario are taking the lead and creating some 40 new centres. Uh, Ontario also spent a billion dollars to create 30,000 spaces in schools and in that in that province the, the majority of the new spaces are actually created in the schools and there are other strategies being looked at in terms of purpose purpose build uh, buildings for childcare and we don't see any kind of creative new initiatives coming out of the government other than implementing the plan and, and raising some of the the wages corresponding with the public sector uh, agreements that, that have been in place that they're committed to ensuring that there are annual increases. But the challenge is when ECEs have opportunities to perhaps go into pre-primary teaching, a lot of uh, some of the, the current ECEs, whether they're just graduating or already in the sector, are moving towards employment that provides benefits, and benefits are an important uh, tool for retaining and recruiting. I think that um, this is another way where we can compete with pre-primary as a sector and provide free childcare for our ECEs so that they have a place. And also recruiting uh, can help because the, the actual hours of childcare would align perfectly with the, uh, the workday for a new ECE coming in and ensuring that they have that, that period of time that they're obligated to be at work from the beginning of the workday to the end where their child will actually be looked after. And so that is a savings of right now, I happen to know because I'm in childcare, about $500 a month. And uh, that is challenging for some ECEs that don't get paid a lot of money to, to actually come up with every month. I think that it's important that we look at the evidence on 
the fact that most of the new supply of early childhood educators to staff child care expansion in Canada will have to come from new graduates. These graduates are young and looking to have new families. And as I said in question period, a lot of people are looking at whether or not that they can stay in the sector or if they can raise that family. And we know that that, that, that challenge provides that drag on the economy if we don't have, so an economic perspective, we don't have participation from as many people, young people especially, graduating from school, uh, participating in the, in the workforce. I tabled the document that showed that there are wide variances of how far along and how prepared provinces are across the, the country in, in ensuring we have the labour for the child credit agreement. Uh, the variance shows from, from one to three years in New Brunswick, nearby, PEI in Ontario, the leaders, to Nova Scotia, which is the laggard, quantified as 35 years to train enough ECE graduates to fill the promised spaces. That's a far cry from just three years away in 2026 when we're supposed to have 11,900 spaces for childcare, for accessible $10 a day childcare. And I note the, re the reference to the different uh, professions that also need access to childcare and the fact that it's a universal program and that's why we endorse the program, that we, we want to see universal access. But it, it's a program that fails when we have that low fee drop and we have, it was mentioned, doctors and other high paying professions accessing these spaces and then low to mo moderate income families not being able to access spaces. And so I can tell you the amount of people that are calling my office are not high income. And when you pull into a childcare center and you see BMWs leave the place, you got a question. Why are they able to access $10 a day childcare? Well, it's not $10 a day, yes, but it's, it's, it's cut in half, as the minister said, and I appreciate that, that childcare fees are going down. But when you have people driving BMWs that are getting high paying jobs, accessing $10 a day childcare, and then you have people making minimum wage that have no childcare space at all. When we, don't, when we aren't meeting our obligations under the agreement itself to meet the criteria, to increase our spaces. And the minister can brag about the, the sheer number of spaces being created, but when you have the, the amount of population growth, especially in HRM, I think that's what the disconnect could be. That we're, if we're not building for the type of popula population growth that is happening and that is being forecasted, then the net new spaces of 28 that, were, that was mentioned in HRM is not enough and in fact we have less space corresponding with the amount of child care access that we have that we had before the agreement was in place we there's a number of, of provinces doing uh, creative things and 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 this idea that we brought forward in this bill is not happening anywhere in Canada it's only happening in a couple of jurisdictions in the southern states and I can tell you when Whenever the topic comes up, whether it's energy or other important economic issues, childcare is on the agenda. And that's why other jurisdictions are looking at ways that they can uh, both retain and recruit workers, because you can't create space unless you have the, the workers and that you're adequately uh, paying those workers to retain them into the sector. This study, this national study, shows that women are actually 95% of the sector, again speaking to the need to ensure that they have their own child, could, child care needs met. And two-thirds of graduates are parents with at least one child by the first year after graduation. It's actually interesting that the large number of multiple job holders in this occupation, that was one highlight of the, the, the report that I'll table again. And that speaks to me, again, the need that we have to pay more attention to how we're remunerating these jobs, how we're looking at giving them support, benefits. Again, we're competing with pre-primary and having access to, to that program that provides benefits. And I think when we look at the data and we look at how we can provide that kind of support that doesn't cost 
a ton of more money, this is a way that we can look at supporting it from a provincial perspective. And maybe the federal government will support it as well. But certainly provincially, we have the tools right here to do it right away. And I, I bet there will be a number of ECEs that would think twice about leaving the sector, if, especially if they had have children already, but are maybe planning on having uh, children in the near future. 60% of ECEs transition into the child care sector right now after graduation, and the rest enter into what is known as education services or other industries. With an incentive like this, or other incentives, there are lots of good ideas that could be brought forward to, to improve the benefits for child care workers. That percentage of ECE graduates that we have now can increase above 60% because it's more attractive. Simple math that if you provide that kind of support for workers, then they will either stay or be more tempted to, to enter in the first place. College ECEs might initially find work in a childcare sector right after graduation, but may later exit the sector in favor of the education service industry. This speaks to retention. And in, in recent studies, retention has been noted as even more important than recruitment. And I would say, especially in jurisdictions that have a program like pre-primary, where virtually every community has another option for an ECE worker to enter into the system and access pensions and things like that. All for pensions, if, if that's an idea that the government wants to bring forward for our ECE workers. Social assistance careers appear to be the most lucrative directly after competing completing studies surpassing educational services, in, and that's a national statement. However, the earnings appear to change this advantage over time, and graduates who remain in the childcare sector for the entire five-year period see their earnings growth for the first three years level off after dropping between years three and five. So the evidence shows that although sometimes it could be advantageous to start in what they call the social assistance sector, which is childcare, that by the time you enter three years into the sector or year five, the workers start to leave. And this is a national study, including provinces that don't even have pre-primary. Ontario is the only other province that does. Obviously, Quebec is the anomaly as the absolute leader in the, in the country having child care, uh, universal child care for so long. But, but the need to retain workers is something that is not focused on enough. And I believe that it will be the single most important thing that shows whether this government moves the needle or if they fail to have a truly universal program in place by 2026. We have a number of provinces that have already reached $10 a day childcare. We are not there yet in this province. And even though we've reduced our fees by half, we have incremental less net new spaces given our population growth. We have longer wait lists in HRM. Can't speak to other parts of the province, but I would submit that if there's population growth in those sec areas of the province, that they have higher wait lists too. We might have others that speak to the bill that can speak to that. If we had a centralized annual report like Ontario does, we would be able to see that data, but we don't have that in this province. It's hard to get to segregated data in this province on the childcare sector. And so this bill, if passed, I guarantee you will help retain workers. I guarantee you will help recruit workers and help move the needle with a modest investment. And if the bill is not accepted, I would encourage the government to look at other incentives that could be brought up through the consultation. There are many other ways that we can support it, whether it's even more increased wages, whether it's a pension plan, whether it's other ways that we can support a predominantly female workforce that has kids, two-thirds have kids. It's the right thing to do. Childcare workers should not pay for their own childcare in this province. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm very glad to rise to speak to this bill, and uh, I completely agree. Um, absolutely, ECEs need access to childcare. Um, this is a sector of workers who are badly undervalued by society and by this government. Um, 
I, I, I have a lot to say, but I'm going to try to stick to the script because I want to make sure I get it in 15 minutes. Um, we know that ECEs also need uh, fair wages and benefits. We know that ECEs don't make enough to make ends meet. Most ECEs, if you've spoke to them, would tell you that they have another job or that they have a business on the side because they are literally just getting by. As ECEs across the province have advocated, Nova Scotia's ECE wage grid is insufficient to attract enough new ECEs to this sector. And the minister talked about transformation and the patchwork quilts. Well, you know, we also need to take into consideration um, the words of the, the folks that are actually on the ground doing the work, and those are our ECEs. We also risk losing experienced ECEs unless the province offers them more generous wages along with pensions, leaves, and other benefits. And those were key pieces that um, were talked about on many of the strike lines, on many of the, the, the rallies that folks have um, been to to say, you know, we love our job, we love the kids, we love the work that we do. We've been doing it for 30 years, and 30 years ago I still get, I, I actually get paid more 30 years ago than I do now because of the cost of living. So we know we need to pay them what they're worth. The recruitment and retention of ECEs will not be successful unless their value education, training, and experience are recognized as central to child care expansion. So as my colleague had mentioned, you know, um, we, we do need to make sure that they have child care. They are the foundation of, the of our economy, of the work that we do, and, and the reason why we are able to work is because ECEs are a pivotal um, and a foundational um, part of our, our patchwork in Nova Scotia. We know that the benefits of this framework is still outstanding when, um, when the minister spoke about the patchwork quilt. The, these are core pieces to make sure that they need to be addressed and they are a priority. And we've heard that what is being proposed is not good enough. This means that they don't have pensions or benefits that are retiring, that are retiring them into poverty. Most ECEs still aren't making a, li a living wage. And like I said, some are working multiple jobs. The government is committed to having a retirement and benefit solution by the end of 2023 but it is nowhere is in sight and we are in the 11th month of the year and yet no indication of this so as my colleague mentioned you know ECEs um, deserve to have child care absolutely it is key enough child care spaces well we know that and, and just by you know looking at the data reading the newspaper you know hearing from folks in our offices there are never there are not enough child care spaces in any of our areas one in three children in Nova Scotia live in a child care desert in order to take advantage of something like free child care there would have to be child care spaces for them to use we know that there are wait lists we know there are years of folks that are waiting to have child care and it's nearly impossible to find a child care space in Halifax let alone smaller communities across the province. And we've spoke to parents and operators alike, and they continue to tell us that, you know, there are no spaces and that they're waiting, people are waiting to be on these lists. Last year, we saw the province open up a net 28 new spaces, and that is nearly not enough. We know that the way this government rolled out changes to the child care, si child care system caused the closure of many existing centers, some of them in my own riding. Growth in this sector has been limited to school age programs which are needed but are not addressing the dire shortage of infant and toddler spaces. So we know that we need to reach the $10 a day benchmark statistic. In Halifax, toddler and infant fees haven't even reached the 50% reduction target. And this is unacceptable and the government needs to be very clear about the path to a $10 a day. Affordable child care isn't just an issue for women or families, it's an issue for our economy. And if we want mothers and parents to fully participate in our economy with all the benefits that brings, we need a child care program that families can afford. And ones that ECEs can actually be proud of to be a part of that sector. I will note that this proposal comes from the party who described the often invisible work that mostly women do as organic child care. But if we don't even recognize this work as work, don't value it and invest in it, surprise, it's not going to be plentiful. So absolutely, ECEs should not be faced with unfair waitlist fees when they are searching for a child care space, let alone child care spaces should be available to them when they need it as their work is very important. They are the sector that we need to help boost our economy. And I was shocked wh that when presented with this practice, the minister's first response was that she would not commit to banning these fees.
So, and that was waitlist fees, excuse me. The most recent numbers from 2019 found that 92% of Halifax daycares maintained a waitlist and 16% charged a waitlist fee. The national average for waitlist fees back then was $50 to 100. So when I'm bringing up waitlist fees, I'm saying this because there are not enough spaces for everyday people to be able to have childcare and ECEs are, are not excluded from that. And so we do need to prioritize where, where these spots are, would possibly be available for folks that are actually in that sector. The situation has only worsened. And an action by the Liberal government after consecutive government, a conservative government, excuse me, has a uh, progressive conservative government has created a crisis point. Families are forced to spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars while already stretched on something that may or may not end in a child care space. The minister admits that she agrees the practice of charging non-refundable waitlist fees shouldn't be happening and after weeks of you know, having conversations, the minister finally acknowledged that it is happening, so why won't the minister ban the practice of charging these fees? Which also brings me back to why do ECEs have to be on a wait list? Why do ECEs not automatically have set, set aside spots for them so that they can get into the sector and do the work that is necessary? There's so much work to do, and this government is moving very slowly on this issue. This is why our party committed to a free before and after school care in the last election. And I see that um, the numbers that um, the minister has brought forward are numbers that include all of those, the before and after school, and as well, child care spaces, which in turn is that large number, but is not actually daycare spaces specifically. So should ECEs have free child care? Absolutely. Absolutely, they, they, they deserve it. They're working in the sector, they're doing the work that we need that is necessary for folks to get back to work, to maintain their lives. But there's so much more work to do in every other corner of the sector, and I know myself and our party will not stop pushing until every family in this province has access to safe and affordable childcare staffed by fairly compensated and fairly treated professionals. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Yeah, let's go. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing in childcare um, in, in something more than 45 second increments, because that typically is, is the, the only chance that I get in, in this space um, to talk about the work. And, and a five year <laughs> historic transformation that is going to cost, uh, you know, well over. Um, uh, $600 million is just, you can't, you can't do justice to that in 45 second increments. So I, I do appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation now. And I think there are a couple of things that um, I, I like to start out by talking about because the context of this is so important. So we get questions that are really focused on very specific issues. All of those issues are really important issues. Like they're all, um, you know, the question of waitlist fees, that's an important issue. Um, the question of, of how do we support our ECEs and, and um, like what benefits do we provide for them, that's an incredibly important question. Um, but it is really important to understand the context of this transformation um, as we think about those individual issues. So I, I just want to paint that picture before we get into talking about the specific issues. So if we, if we just talk about what is our starting point or what was our starting point and where are we going, I think that that's a really helpful frame. So uh, you've probably heard me refer to our child care sector as, as a patchwork quilt in the past. And I think that is really a good way of, of understanding what we had. Um, we have incredibly passionate, um, educated, devoted, caring caregivers, care providers, um, operators and ECEs all across the province. But historically, I would say this has not been a system. We have not had what one could truly think of as a system. So we have had over 300 individual operators, and those are business owners. Those are our mothers or parents who've, who've decided to bring kids into their home. Um, some are ECEs. There's been a wide range of training in a wide range of circumstances. Um, and those folks operate their own individual uh, businesses 
or nonprofits, and and they've really kind of they've created their own individual sort of terms of operation. That means they have created their own um, terms of employment with the employees that they hire, with um, uh, which wages that they set. Um, they've created their own arrangements in terms of hours that they provide um, to their families that they service, and. Uh, they've created their own arrangements in terms of facilities and size of, of, of the operations. Um, so in every way, these are individual operators who've really kind of done their own thing based on the needs of the families that they serve, based on their own skills, based on their own capacity, based on the availability of the workforce that was at hand. And so, so that's, that's what we dealt with historically. Um, so how were those folks funded? Well, predominantly, those operators were funded by parent fees, so out of the pockets of, of Nova Scotians. Um, and the, the primary way that all of our operators across the province were funded previously was through, through fees paid by parents. Um, there was some individual and this is where the patchwork uh, initially came from, some types of grants that existed for those operators, um, but the vast majority of the funding for the operators was, was through parent fees. Um, and so, so that's what we had previously, and we know it didn't meet Nova Scotians' needs. We know that as a result of, of that unfolding the way that it did, um, we didn't have ECEs supported with wages that were professional fair wages. We know that that evolution of individual operators did not allow Nova Scotians all across our province to have access to licensed childcare. Um, through that that prior patchwork quilt, um, Nova Scotia evolved deserts of childcare where there was no licensed childcare anywhere um, uh, for, for people to access. Um, we know that there were not enough spaces available. And, and so it, it was in that landscape, or it was as a result of that landscape and that need that has existed for decades. I mean, I felt that need when my children were young, when I, when I was uh, pregnant, expecting, and um, you know, looking for childcare so that I could go back to work. I was on multiple, multiple wait lists because that wasn't a system that, that uh, provided access to me and to many of my family and friends who were looking for childcare. So out of that need, out of that, um, out of that landscape, has evolved the federal commitment and our provincial commitment to transform childcare. And so, so what does that look like? Well, that means we need to truly build a system. We need to take that patchwork quilt of individual operators and we need to support them to create enough spaces to meet all of the needs across Nova Scotia. And we need to provide them with the funding to support fair and professionalized ECE wages, not just right now, not just in this snapshot in time, but in a way that will support um, the growth of those wages and support the growth of that sector. We need to provide the training and education opportunities, um, not just in, in the centres where it's currently available, but also in other areas, in rural areas, um, for folks who maybe historically haven't been represented in this sector. Um, we need to provide funding so that uh, no longer do parents have to pay the, the majority of those fees that, that we support um, affordable childcare. And so that's the journey that we're taking. And it's a journey that is, is, is at least five years in the making. And it's a journey that's going to cost over $600 million. So, so that's the landscape. That's the trajectory that we're on. The other thing that's really important to understand about the journey that we're on is the snapshot in time that we're taking these steps. So, so in addition to this sector being historically underserved, underfunded, and neglected, we're also doing this work at an unprecedented time where we have affordability issues everywhere. So every sector is challenged by the cost of building right now. Not childcare, not childcare alone. This is something that is every sector's challenge. Every sector right now is, is grappling with a workforce that is more and more people retiring 
So that's not exclusive to childcare. That has nothing to do with the work that we're doing in childcare. People are leaving the workforce because they are hitting the age where they want to retire and they are retiring. That is not because of the transformation we are doing. That is because of the demographic reality we're facing. And we could talk to anybody in this chamber relating to uh, any other sector. If we look at skilled traits, we see people retiring. If we look at healthcare, we see people retiring. If we look at agriculture, people are retiring. So our childcare operators are, are we see them leaving the sector, but we are not seeing them leave the sector in droves because of the transformation work we're doing. They're leaving the sector because they're retiring. That's the age. That's the age of our, our, our workforce right now. Um, so that's a challenge that, that we in this sector are facing, but so is every Nova Scotian. So is every Canadian. That's, that's just a demographic reality. Um, rising cost of property. The rising cost of property is not an issue that is specific to childcare. That is an issue that we are facing in Halifax. That is an issue that we're facing across the province. That is an issue that we're facing across the country. These are all things that will impact our operators. So as our operators get to retirement age, as they see their their predominant asset, which may be the building that they have provided their care in, um, as, we, as they see the, the cost or the, um, uh, the value of that rise, some operators are making decisions um, to, to retire. And, and you know what? What we have in childcare right now is a fantastic opportunity because those challenges, the historic challenges in the sector, the unprecedented challenges that every sector is facing right now because of the rising costs, because of the retiring demographic, right now, our government is investing historic amounts of money, is spending unprecedented time, effort and energy in transforming the sector. So we have in childcare an opportunity with this investment, with the focus that we're putting on it, to overcome not only the historic disadvantage and the historic neglect, but also the challenges that every sector are facing around a retiring demographic, around increasing property values. And so the work that we're doing right now is helping us mitigate those challenges that are challenges that are beyond Nova Scotia challenges, challenges beyond this government. These are national and, and in many cases international challenges. For childcare, we're doing the work that mitigates that. We're doing the work that is protective of that. And we're doing the work that will take us from that patchwork quilt of, of childcare centers that I described to a system that is truly a system, that is funded in a way that is sustainable and that supports all of our incredible offer operators, our private and are not-for-profit operators and the ECEs who work in those centers to be able to deliver the spaces where we need them, childcare at the times that it's needed. So childcare, you know, early in the morning if your shift starts then, childcare late at night if that happens, and childcare everywhere that it's needed. So, Madam Speaker, I, I think it's really important and I wanted to take that time to really talk about um, that context because we really don't get, I don't get to do that in the 45 second increments when questions come at me, but it is really important to understand the breadth of this work um, as we're talking about any issue because any issue that comes up needs to be understood in that context. Like none of these pieces can be done in isolation. None of this work can be done in isolation. It all needs to be in lockstep. So what exactly does that lockstep look like? What are the components of the transformation? And so there are, there are some major components to this work. So the components include work around our ECE workforce. So that is ensuring that the workforce, not only do we have enough ECEs, but they're trained in a way that supports them and enables them to do great work, the great work that they love to do. Um, it means that we have to be able to create physically the spaces uh, to support the needs of Nova Scotians. So it's an entirely separate pillar, but you can't do them separately. We need to build out the affordability. We need to continue to, to fund our operators in a way that enables them to provide this, um, uh, to provide these services um, and, and support 
affordable childcare for Nova Scotians. And, um, and we need to do all of this with a deep understanding of specific Nova Scotian needs. So, Madam Speaker, we have already taken incredible strides in all of these areas, and, and I, I'm really excited about the work that we've done. I want to take a minute quickly to say um, we could not have done this work in the way that we've done it um, without the support of the engagement table. So we knew early on um, when I took this office, it was, it was really clear to me um, that, uh, that what we needed was to be informed by the folks who are in this day to day, and we needed to have an and now we do have a table of folks, of operators, of private and not-for-profit operators. We have ECEs at the table. We have experts at that table. We have families at that table. And that has really guided the work. Um, and that, that also brings me to a couple of things that I want to comment on. Uh, because, um, I, you know, I connect with our provincial and federal colleagues regularly. And I will say... Nova Scotia is leading the way in the work that we're doing. So, uh, and, and there's a few ways in which we're doing this. Um, one thing that I want to point out is that our affordability, the work we're doing around affordability and our reduction in fees in Nova Scotia is universal. That means every single family who has access to licensed childcare is getting that fee reduction. Um, so people may not realize that in other provinces, that's not the case. In other provinces, there are um, individual spaces that may be affordable, but that doesn't apply everywhere else. So we've been lauded nationally for that work to ensure that our universal affordable childcare really truly is universal. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about is the innovation. And we are being watched nationally because we are in fact innovating. So one really great example of this is the work that we're doing with Health Park. So Health Park is um, a centre in Cape Breton and they are, um, they are now providing as a demo site, as a pilot, um, extended hours childcare for healthcare providers. And that means that um, healthcare providers will be able to access childcare um, in extended hours through the week and on weekends overnights. This is a first. This is There are no centres like this across Canada. And so our, our provincial colleagues are looking with great interest um, at the way we've been able to do this and, and, um, and, and we're leading the way in this innovative step that we're taking. So we are in fact a leader in the work that we're doing. Madam Speaker, I have managed to still leave myself only 45 seconds to talk about the variety of ways that we've already taken taken steps to improve access to childcare in Nova Scotia. So I, I, I'm just going to do the same thing that I've done before and now start talking faster. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we've already increased our ECE wages 14 to 46 percent. That is a significant, significant improvement in wages for a sector that has been historically underfunded. Madam Speaker, we've reduced fees by half for families. So families across Nova Scotia, Madam Speaker, are saving hundreds and thousands of dollars a month. Madam Speaker, I'm going to say that again. Hundreds and thousands of dollars a month. That is huge for affordability, Madam Speaker. And we're continuing this work, and we look forward to doing this work to truly build a Nova Scotia childcare system that meets all of our families' Great needs. Job, thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh, 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, just happy to, to get on my feet and provide uh, a few comments on the bill uh, because that's what we're debating. Uh, and also talk a bit about child care uh, as well. Um, and uh, I always want to recognize the folks uh, in the Department of Childhood uh, Education and Early Childhood Development. Um, you know, as politicians, we play a big part in the policy decision making and we make decisions. Uh, here in the legislature or as uh, if you're uh, in cabinet or in caucus, uh, you're making decisions, but um, I, uh, I was the minister at the time and we had a heavy negotiation to get the child care deal done, uh, which was an historic deal for the province. It was a $605 million deal plus uh, some uh, other money around incentives and training opportunities for, for folks who wanted to get become an ECE, but I always like to give credit to the staff because it was a monumental task. Some of them are still in the department, some of them have moved on to other departments. Uh, I hope you're watching. Um, 
because I asked you to do a lot at the time, and, and they stepped up big time. And as a result of it, and I also want to recognize uh, the member from Timberley, former Premier. Uh, child care uh, meant uh, everything to him too as well. We saw the challenges and we heard the challenges. And as the minister said uh, at the time, uh, you know, historically, uh, there was no kind of universal system in place that represented child care all over Nova Scotia. Kind of one system that, that we could, that, that families could access. And we knew that there was gaps all through the system. Uh, and we knew that the pay uh, for ECEs was not enough. Uh, we knew that more training opportunities and incentives were going to be needed to, um, to uh, encourage folks to, get, to become ECs, uh, so we went to work. Uh, and now Nova Scotia has a $605 million child care deal. Uh, and I, and I, I do like hearing you know, the stories, and, and the minister's passionate about it, and that's great. He talks about the reduction in fees, exactly, that was in the contract. Uh, you talk about the, the n number of seats that are going to be added, perfect. That was also in the agreement. This was all negotiated out uh, over time. So um, uh, we have some concerns around uh, how fast it's moving. Uh, and I will say this, and, and, and this is, uh, you know, we've heard the government say, well, for years there's been wait lists and all that stuff. Yeah, that, sure, that's, that's fine. That's one of the reasons why we looked at uh, the deal, but I do want to remind folks of pre-primary. And pre-primary gave every four-year-old thousands of seats, gave every four-year-old in this province the same opportunity. And the government back then was adamant that it never came. And they fought and fought and fought against the implementation of pre-primary. And uh, I remember those debates, Madam Speaker, in here. Uh, and I remember my colleague, uh, the leader of our party, who was Minister of Education at the time. Um, uh, he championed the cause and he had to deliver pre-primary for four-year-olds and he delivered pre-primary for four-year-olds. And um, so when I hear that, that comment that for years it's been neglected, uh, there is some validity to that when it comes to the round to the system and, and trying to evolutionize childcare uh, for for Nova Scotians. But uh, the government was adamant that pre-primary never came, and that you know there's lots of new faces on that side. But uh, I can say their leader and, and some of the veterans they fought tooth and nail to make sure that pre-primary never came, and we saw the benefits of pre-primary. Obviously, every four-year-old, regardless of socioeconomics or regardless of where they lived, all had the same start. They all had the same start entering school, and this was the goal around pre-primary, or, or around the child care deal, is that we knew that one in four families were accessing child care, and I would argue in some communities that was probably, that was probably, that statistic was probably worse. And we knew that the cost was a massive barrier for people. So with the first opportunity we had to start negotiating with the federal government on a new national provincial deal, we did. And it was, it was months. And it was, it was feedback from the sector. It was feedback from stakeholders, as the minister mentions uh, the panel. Uh, that, uh, those stakeholders have been engaged from the beginning, so that's nothing new. Um, uh, we went to work. Uh, and it was, you know, for me, it was, it was a proud moment for us to sign that contract, uh, that the federal government uh, worked day and night with us to make sure that Nova Scotia could have a, a, a deal that would get not only $10 a day, an average of $10 a day, because we know, Madam Speaker, some families, it's a barrier. Any cost to child care is a barrier. So we wanted every kid, uh, every child starting out uh, to have the same. So when you do that, you look at incentives and, and why we're here today to talk to the bill. <coughs> which I feel like nobody's really, except for the person who tabled the bill, has actually talked to the bill, is, is around this incentive to support uh, ECE's child care. And uh, I think it's a great bill, and I think it's the continuous evolution of how we try to attract people to the sector. And um, as we said, uh, and as the minister said, and I agree, uh, over, over years, and really, that there's been no, there was no set system in place. And as a result, 
urban centers, uh, you would see more options for childcare. Now, mind you, it's gone the other way. Uh, where there's a lot of less options for childcare, but y you saw, you know, a lot of areas of rural Nova Scotia uh, were impacted. Uh, there was there was less opportunity for childcare, and 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 with and with the new deal, um, you have increased wages for ECEs. You have reduction in fees. You have targets set for those reduction in fees. Uh, and a system that looks at our three-year-olds and how we can build them in uh, potentially into our school system, looking at every option, giving every option we possibly can to ensure that child care is available but also affordable to everyone. So we looked at a bunch of incentives, we, you know, and, and you look at the, the core foundational stuff. You look at, okay, wages we knew were an issue. Okay, so let's look at that. And now you're starting to see what's being implemented by the government in the deal of the increases in wages for ECs. Then you're looking at access. So how can we utilize and, and take the money that we received in this deal to, to provide more spaces, uh, whether we're using uh, daycares or infrastructure schools or, or whatever is necessary to help give all those kids uh, the same chance. You're looking at training opportunities. How do we encourage folks to, um, who want to become ECs, how can we help them? Uh, and you know, we looked at the time. We looked at many training opportunities uh, and money and, and money associated with it, so that, that if, if if someone wanted to go become an EC, uh, that we could help pay their way. And uh, very similar to some of the other initiatives that government has put around CCAs and, and, and some of the other departments, uh, that that was kind of the goal for us at the time, Madam Speaker, was how can we, how can we, what, what incentive can we put in? Because we knew we need we needed more ECs in the system. And uh, now we come to this bill, uh, which my good friend from Timberley Prospect tabled. Uh, and this is coming from him, and, and he's out engaging, as I am. We're out engaging, talking to families and talking to, uh, to uh, operators and talking to, to, to residents who, who want to become ECs. And, and, one of the bar and one great incentive, I believe, is, is that if we can encourage uh, folks to become ECs, um, we can do it in a way that not only gives them training opportunities, helps with their tuition, uh, but, but we know that in a lot of cases, and as he says, statistics show that, that there's young families, a lot of folks that want to become ECs, and you know, statistically there, there are young families involved. So what an incentive to say, okay, well, if you want to support our children, we'll cover the fees for your children. And uh, I think that's, that's a great incentive. And, and I give my friend credit, like he's put a lot of thought into this because it mattered to him. It mattered to him when he was premier. This was, he was passionate about this, and he gave me the honor of, of, of negotiating on behalf of the government at the time with staff. And uh, you know him bringing this forward, and he's now a dad, and he's, you know he's doing his thing, and he's starting to feel the costs of you know what it is, right? And uh, you know, uh, but I love hearing the stories of families that that tell me, and, and regardless of what government's in place, this was all part of the, the deal that we signed. Was that you love hearing the stories of people saying, "Man, my Derek, oh sorry, uh, talking to me saying my fees just were reduced, like I'm saving uh, I'll, my family, saving a lot of money." That's fantastic. I love that. You know, I love hearing that story. That's that was the whole point for us. Is that, especially you know, and I use Cape Breton as an example. We have some high poverty in communities, and we know the kids would never have the chance uh, to to get that start. And and the, the New Deal is doing that, and that's what pre-primary did as well. It gave every four-year-old the same playing field, and uh, you know, we knew that. Uh, we started seeing the results very quickly, and you're going to start to see the results with this. Uh, because uh, because of because of the deal, and the government has some work to do, mind you. Uh, uh, they're having uh, a, a tough time meeting their targets. Um, you know, I would argue that, uh, and others have argued that uh, they're moving uh, very slowly. Um, they are starting some new initiatives. Again, the, the initiative that the minister mentioned around Health Park, that, that's a great organization. Uh, great leadership there. Uh, I was there the day the minister uh, was there. Appreciate her, uh, the minister coming to the island. Uh, and again, this was all stuff we talked about in the deals, like how can we be more flexible around childcare options for, we talked about healthcare workers uh, when we were negotiating the deal. We talked about first responders. We talked about 
uh, all these. I know the, go the other one, uh, the government made an announcement at the Cove Guest Home in Sydney too as well, and they, 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 they put a child care centre in there too as well uh, to, to support the workers there. Uh, so, so this is great. This was all part of the conversation and event the eventuality of signing an over $600 million child care deal for the province. So, uh, what again, so like on the bill, this is something that uh, I bet if implemented would uh, be such a huge boost for not only people entering the the um, not entering the system. It'd be an incentive for people to become uh, become an ECE. But if you're already in there, it probably would give people more flexibility to work more hours. And that's the other side of it too, as well, is that you know people are trying to balance life, and you know wages are what they are, and they're starting to increase. But there's still some work to do there. Uh, but at the same time, if, if you have an ECE worker that maybe is only working part time because they just, you know, they can't afford full time childcare costs, you know, if, if we have this incentive for them uh, to cover the costs of, of their child entering childcare because they're looking after everybody else's children, uh, I think it's something that, that merits uh, looking into further. So, um, you know, I only have uh, two minutes left here. Uh, and um, I, I'll just finish by saying. Uh, Childcare is evolving quickly, not only in this province but across country, and uh, we saw that a few years back. And um, it's funny; I had a conversation with former Prime Minister Paul Martin, who talked about uh, childcare, trying to implement a childcare uh, policy across Canada. Kendra, uh, Kendra yeah, and th th there was a few of them involved. And when we signed the deal, I got a phone call. And it was from it was from uh, the former prime minister congratulating us on something they tried to do 20 years ago, and uh, it was uh, so this this matters and, it's, and as the minister said it's going to continue to evolve, so wages will always be uh, part of this, uh, that's uh, important, um, and uh, the more incentives that we can provide. Uh, ECEs to enter the field, but not also, also enter the field, but continue to develop in their career as an early childhood educator. Uh, this would give them more flexibility, I believe, to help them uh, to help them uh, along that journey. Uh, and this is something I believe that the government can implement. Uh, hey, it will come with a price tag, but uh, I'd say what a what a valuable investment for our kids and for families and for workers. So uh, with that, uh, I'll take my seat. I believe I need to adjourn to be. Yes, and, and uh, Madam Speaker, I uh, move to, I uh, just need my bill number here. Oh, 401, thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move to adjourn a debate on Bill 401. There is a request to a uh, motion to adjourn debate on bill number 401. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. I recognize the I recognize the Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I move uh, second reading of bill, uh, or no, I'll uh, make sure I get my wording right yeah. there. Can, can, can. Oh, sorry, can I please call bill number 306, the Serious Illness Leave Act. Bill number 306, Serious Illness Leave Act. I will recognize the honorable leader of the official opposition. Thank you very much, uh, much Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm happy to, to stand and speak in favor of Bill 306, the Serious Illness Care Act. Uh, this bill is being brought forward as, as uh, in second reading here. This is a bill that was tabled by the member for Bedford Basin. Uh, in the last session of the legislature. And I want to commend uh, the, the member for Bedford Basin for being a champion for this uh, and for uh, uh, bringing it forward again uh, this session. This is certainly something that we as a party uh, fully support. So I, I do think it's important to explain to the House and anybody listening what this would do. Uh, this would bring the employment insurance rules uh, that have been brought in federally, that were brought in federally in December 22, to allow persons who are suffering from illnesses to to access, access employment insurance for up to 26 weeks. So people who are suffering from serious illness like cancer, MS, heart disease, diabetes, 
anything that can impact their ability to perform work. Uh, this bill would bring uh, their rights to collect employment insurance and, and, uh, and have work protection in line with the federal law. Because Nova Scotia currently doesn't have uh, any of these protections for Nova Scotians. Nova Scotia's labor law currently only guarantees employees working in provincially regulated industries a maximum of three days unpaid leave due to illness, which certainly is, is in, insufficient, as I think we can all recognize in this House. That means people with serious illnesses such as cancer, heart disease, MS, Parkinson's, uh, the list goes on. Illnesses that Nova Scotia has very, very high rates of, <coughs> higher rates than other provinces, uh, risk losing their job after three days leave and uh, also don't receive uh, income. Uh, the Canadian Cancer Society have been uh, big proponents uh, of, this, of this piece of legislation. So again, this would ensure that Nova Scotians now have ser serious illness have access to employment insurance uh, up to 26 weeks. That would change from three days. And in Canada, there is a wide range. Three days is the lowest. Nova Scotia has the, the lowest amount of days that are covered by uh, employment insurance mm -hmm. for serious illness. We are at the bottom of the pile. People who get severely sick here in Nova Scotia are at the greatest financial risk. And you compare that with a province like Quebec, which actually has gone the full 26 weeks. Uh, with EI coverage. So this is something that we need to make happen in Nova Scotia because we know that individuals dealing with severe illness uh, are really struggling, not just with the illness itself and with the treatments that come with some of these illnesses, but also with the financial impacts uh, that come with, with the illness and, and paying for treatment that might not be covered by insurance or, or MSI, uh, and also travel and potentially losing, uh, losing employment. So the Cancer Society estimates that there are, uh, this is in 2002, is, is the latest numbers I have, that there are 6,800 Nova Scotians who would be diagnosed with cancer. Uh, that number may be going up in the province over the last couple of years. And again, we, we, we lead the country in Nova Scotia with certain types of cancer, in particular, uh, uh, GI related cancers. We have the highest rates of Crohn's disease, of colitis, of IBS, and of course the highest rates of, uh, of GI related cancers. So there's a lot of Nova Scotians disproportionately actually that are impacted by uh, this sort of cancer and other illnesses like diabetes uh, and like heart disease. We are also leaders in the country with the rates of, of these illnesses. So these are all long-term serious illnesses that can result in very acute symptoms that are debilitating uh, for people and they can't go to work. And uh, according to the Cancer Society, that means that in this province, an individual who takes time off due to work, or due to illness, sorry, risks losing their job only after three days of unpaid leave. So these individuals who are getting sick are not protected and they risk losing employment. The average length of treatment and recovery for those dealing with cancer is between 26 and 36 weeks for breast cancer, 37 weeks for colon cancer, two of the most common types of cancer in Canada. Nova Scotians should not have to choose between receiving cancer treatment and working. And this is according to the Canadian Cancer Society. Currently, the Nova Scotia Labor Standards Code does not protect the employment of those who have critical illness like cancer from termination after three days unpaid leave. And we know that prior to the sickness benefit extension, it was estimated that 77% of sickness benefit claimants that exhaust the 15 weeks do not return to work immediately. About three quarters of these claimants took at least an additional 26 weeks off. So the fact that we have not moved on this, um, I think can be, can be viewed as, a, as, as very cruel. This is a cruel outcome for people who are dealing with the most challenging situation in their life, uh, oftentimes fighting for their life, uh, fighting to stay alive, to see their families, uh, fighting to uh, provide uh, for their families. And there's been incredible local uh, advocates who have been pushing for this as well. Uh, advocates like Kathy McNaughton, who became an advocate for extending employment insurance, sickness benefits, and job protection for people with critical illness following the, uh, the death of her husband, David Frazier. 
Uh, Kathy worked with us in the last session to push the majority PC government to accept uh, this bill. And certainly I know she stands behind us now as we, uh, as we, we push the government to look at this again. Uh, Kathy's and David's stories are, are quite moving. In the final two months of David's life while battling esophageal cancer, uh, which again we have very high uh, rates of here in Nova Scotia, and this is a very dangerous cancer that metastasizes quickly and uh, unfortunately oftentimes more than not does claim the lives of those individuals that, that get it if it's not caught early. And this is what David had. And this is a really challenging cancer. It affects an individual's ability to, uh, to eat, to breathe, uh, extremely debilitating. And in the final two months of, of David's life, he took on a job installing floors to pay for insurance uh, on his family trucks so that his family could continue to have a vehicle uh, to drive around, uh, presumably to and from uh, health care appointments, but uh, of course to the grocery store um, and everywhere else they had to go. Kathy's words were to put a person, a sick person in that situation because of financial reasons is just so wrong and that's why I'm going to change this, McNaughton told reporters at Province House. Money was tight for the family because at the time federal employment insurance, and I'm reading from an article that I'll table, federal employment insurance sickness benefits ended after 15 weeks. And again, here in Nova Scotia, the, these protections are not in place after three days. Despite the fact that Fraser had 45 weeks built up of EI, he could not uh, make claims beyond the 15 weeks. McNaughton and the Cancer Care Society successfully lobbied the federal government to change the rules. And I know Minister Sean Fraser was a big part of that happening federally uh, because Kathy does come from his area. I believe she comes from the Pictos. And the benefit was extended federally to 26 weeks. All David did through his sickness was worry about where the next dollars were coming from, and that's not what he should have been concentrating on the last months of his life. McNaughton is really focused on job protection too. We've got to protect our sick people so that they don't have to worry, they just have to get better. And it was, of course, the member for Bedford South that introduced the bill. Uh, last session that would do just that by providing 26 weeks of unpaid job protection for someone with a critical illness and create provisions to allow them to return to work based on their own treatment and recovery process. Uh, and I will quote the member for Bedford South too, who's been a, Bedford Bath, Basin, sorry, who's been a great uh, champion for this, as well as the member for Bedford South, uh, I'll add. But it was the member for Bedford Basin that pushed this. Uh, and in her own words, this guarantees that people can focus on their recovery if that's the way their journey goes. And they don't have to worry about their family not having any money coming in. They don't have to worry about losing their jobs because that happens too, she told reporters. Heather Mulligan, manager of advocacy for the Canadian Cancer Society, said the issue has been raised with, labor, with, the, labor, with the current labor minister and officials in the department. Uh, Heather Mulligan told reporters that when the federal law was changed, it affected more than 169,000 people across the country. Now they are lobbying provincial governments to adjust their respective job protection legislation to mirror the federal EI changes. Right now, it is only Quebec that provides the 26 weeks of leave protection. And uh, Ms. Mulligan said, there are examples of people who, after undergoing treatment for cancer or other critical illness, return to work to find their jobs have been reevaluated or reassessed and they no longer have the same role. So this is, a, this is a big concern, because again, you, you have people that are literally fighting for their lives, that have some of the most uh, severe and debilitating illnesses, that also come with some of the most severe and debilitating treatments, who now not only have to worry about the health impacts of this and whether they're going to, uh, to live and, and see their families for an extended period of time, but are also worried about uh, whether they get to keep their job or not, whether they lose their income. And this is a really, really uh, problematic uh, situation. And um, the minister, to her credit, uh, did laud uh, Kathy McNaughton for coming forward, noting that it, it can sometimes take a personal story to understand the impacts of the issue. And she drew a parallel between this issue and when uh, the Liberal MLA from uh, uh, Dartmouth Cole Harbour shared the story of her daughter's pregnancy loss and the need for employment leave in such cases. 
she said that was a situation that, that led to change in, in legislation, and it did. And I, and I think uh, Kathy and David's story should lead to changes in legislation uh, today because the minister even said in her own words, I can see this as a very similar piece of action. Uh, the minister did say she also had meetings. This is after the last session with her provincial and federal colleagues. And she said she expects the subject also be discussed at that time. Um, unfortunately, since, since last session, we've not been informed of any progress that's been made on this. Um, we have not had any reports to the House. We have not heard any announcements that have been made by the government. I am concerned that this issue has uh, fallen off the radar. And again, I don't think we can allow it to fall off the radar as an opposition party. I think this issue is, uh, is, is far too important and affects so many Nova Scotians. Again, just looking at the cancer numbers alone, we've got close to 7,000 Nova Scotians uh, yearly uh, who are diagnosed with cancer. I think the numbers are now uh, one in five people. Sorry, one in two people, 50% of us. I mean, look at, look at this room. This means half of us are, are going to experience cancer at some point in our lives. Uh, we shouldn't have to experience uh, a job loss or a loss of EI benefits. Uh, as a result of that. And again, Nova Scotia is at the lowest rung of support and protection in this country. We are at three days, folks. Three days. We, we all know, all of us in this house have been impacted by cancer, either in our family. Uh, some of our members are, are being impacted currently. We know what chemo and radiation do to the body. We know what continuous surgeries do. You know, three days is 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 really not sufficient by any measure uh, to help to help people dealing with this uh, this situation and to occur, and to not have protection in the uh, in the labor code for people that are de dealing with serial illness I, I I think is a real gap in in law in this province and it leaves people in their most vulnerable moment uh, being made to potentially be very vulnerable from an employment and, and financial perspective. Uh, and with no surprise, there's a lot of support for this amongst Nova Scotians. In fact, a narrative research poll that was conducted in August of this year found that 86% of Nova Scotians overwhelmingly support the extension of job protected leave to 26 weeks. That's almost 90% of respondents. A move that would give employees the opportunity to access treatment and heal without worrying whether they will have a job to return to or even during the time they access treatment or heal, whether they'll, they'll lose their job. So I certainly do want to uh, urge the government uh, to move forward with this. I, I do think it's critical. Uh, we have to recognize that somebody's struggle with cancer or heart disease or diabetes or MS, uh, Parkinson's or, or any other debilitating uh, disease that requires extended treatment uh, should not also be accompanied by a uh, major financial burden for them and their families. And again, we know that a lot of these treatments, uh, particularly for cancer and some new treatments that are coming online, aren't even covered by the province. So not only uh, are the, is the risk that people can, can lose their, their job, lose funding, they might not be able to actually pay for the treatments that they require to fight for you know, days, weeks, or extra months, hopefully years, uh, on this earth. So again, considering that we have some of the highest rates of uh, chronic and severe illness in this province, higher than any other province in the country, considering that we are at the lowest when it comes to job protection for individuals who become sick, I urge this government to move on this bill and pass it. Thank you. Un unfortunately, uh, MLA for Cape Britain Center, Whitney Peer, you have spoken on this bill on April 23rd, and you can only speak once. Okay, I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Shibakto. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I think the uh, probably the first thing we should say about this bill is to establish the the, the present context in uh, Nova Scotia Employment Standards Law, uh, where we are in category after category after category, uh, the weakest in the, provi the provision of job um, protections of any 
uh, province in the country. Uh, a, uh, a jurisdictional scan of labor standards, uh, particularly in these categories uh, that this bill refers to, of job protection, is, uh, is, is really shows Nova Scotia in an embarrassing and scandalous light. So anything uh, that uh, moves us somewhere closer to the middle of the pack um, in uh, labor standards, uh, job protection, uh, is certainly welcome. We can, we can think of the, the the significant number of studies that have been done about this in recent years. The one in my mind uh, is the the one from uh, maybe five years ago from uh, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives um, that uh, just had laid out how how clear this is that we are. Uh, uh, we, we, we are tenth out of ten in in many many categories and and I and I think that the leader of the uh, uh, liberal opposition would would have to acknowledge that this is an area where although uh, this initiative from from the Liberal Party is certainly welcome that th this is an area where uh, his party did not prove itself uh, extremely energetic uh, in the uh, uh, years in which they had an opportunity to address labor standards um, uh, in the province. I, I think in particular this, this general uh, bill raises the area, the, the, the key area of debate uh, that's in this subject of labor standards, of course, is, is sick days. Um, and the provision of sick days, uh, of paid sick days, uh, is a, a subject that uh, came on the screen of public discourse in Nova Scotia. Um, with uh, with COVID, although in fact it had been a matter that had been uh, discussed uh, and it, uh, was the subject of legislation that our party had brought forward prior to COVID, but it was uh, it was with the onset of the pandemic uh, that the the subject of paid uh, sick leave uh, and improving our labor standards in this area uh, really came uh, to be part of public discourse in the province. Um, I have been repeatedly uh, disappointed by the present government's uh, failure to realize what an opening uh, the how well-paid sick leave worked during the pandemic is uh, for them to improve labor standards in this area, as I was uh, disappointed uh, previous to that uh, in, uh, in the years of the, uh, of the McNeil government, uh, when uh, similarly, Many, many calls which uh, had come from those who studied labor standards in the province uh, that came uh, from the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor and that came from uh, our party uh, for a system of uh, paid sick leave, whether it was uh, uh, five, six or ten paid sick leave days in a year, uh, was never uh, picked up and acted upon. So, so this is an area, the area that this bill is uh, uh, speaking to, uh, the Serious Illness Leave Act, is an area where Nova Scotia is behind, um, where uh, the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party have uh, failed uh, to take the initiatives that would be needed uh, to bring us up to the um, to bring us up to the standard that most Canadians are able to expect uh, in the area of job protections. And so for these reasons, uh, it's, a, it's a, a proposed piece of legislation uh, that is, uh, is, is particularly needed. It's in, in an area where forward steps are particularly needed. And this is um, true for lots of reasons. Uh, one, one of them uh, is, of course, the recent changes that the federal government has made in EI legislation, which uh, provide uh, uh, these kind of more extended uh, uh, employment protection provisions. And uh, when uh, the country as a whole moves forward in an area of job protection, particularly uh, sickness job protection, we want uh, our labor standards in Nova Scotia uh, not to lag behind that, but to be in sync with that uh, and uh, of a piece with that. And so these uh, provisions proposed here in Bill 306 would move us in this direction. I also think that the kind of the gold standard in this, uh, uh, in this kind of proposal uh, is, the, uh, is the call 
and the endorsement of the Canadian Cancer Society. Um, uh, in this in this case, th this is a this is a change that the Canadian Cancer Society, with uh, with all of their um, uh, purview of the lengths of time that people's uh, employment is affected uh, by uh, the, the range of types of various cancer treatment, on the basis of which they have recommended that these are changes that. Uh, uh, that, that are needed. And so I, I think whenever the Canadian Cancer Society uh, speaks in the area of uh, protections in the society and in, and in the province of Nova Scotia that are required as a, as a result of um, uh, um, uh, cancer treatments, that's something that we ought to listen to. I, I thought that the uh, leader of the Liberal Opposition uh, was very clear in his remarks about how in Nova Scotia, um, we, we have a number of uh, medical conditions uh, that call for uh, extended areas of treatment uh, which are in their prevalence uh, 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 quite, um, uh, quite singular in the amount of them that we see in Nova Scotia. This is uh, uh, true for a, a whole series of uh, types of malignancies as it is for uh, a series of types of uh, neurological disorders, all of which have in common uh, that the, um, the prognosis is serious if left untreated and the treatment of its nature uh, is extended in a way uh, that uh, people could expect to have uh, uh, a potential compromising uh, effect on their, on their employment. And, and we all know um, from our own families that when uh, the time comes, as it uh, comes in every family, when uh, our attention must be turned to illness in the family uh, and uh, how it is to be coped with, we all know that how important it is to be able, uh, as, a, as a family, uh, to be able to look at the number one problem before us and to give it uh, our number one attention and our number one resources and not to be um, undermined or uh, kept from giving it that primary attention by our awareness of potential financial implications uh, having to do with whether or not uh, a person is going to be able to keep their job. Um, it certainly is the case that, uh, that three uh, unpaid sick days, as we have it presently in our, in our labour standards, um, is inadequate. Uh, and stands out in need of improvement. Three unpaid sick leaves that, days, that, uh, that doesn't begin to speak to the range of uh, illnesses and treatments that this bill envisages. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not adequate to deal with uh, even very, very common uh, illnesses that uh, uh, can compromise a person's ability to uh, uh, be able to be present on their job in the way that they uh, would wish to be. Uh, so we, we know that uh, everyone, uh, when they come into a time of health care crisis, uh, uh, has uh, demands made on their life situation um, that are unlike any other period. I had a, a, a colleague in, in the ministry a number of years ago who got a, a, a difficult uh, a cancer diagnosis and was continuing to do her work. Uh, while receiving treatments and uh, one day uh, she said to me, you know, actually I, one problem is besides the medical problems, I, I actually don't have time to be a cancer patient. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, she uh, spoke about all the many uh, related things that were uh, required uh, from her, uh, 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 appointments other than the appointments you might think about, um, uh, secondary appointments, uh, different, uh, uh, different things that had to be organized at home and so on that were all just very, very time consuming and, and demanding. Uh, so I, I think we all recognize from uh, uh, our own uh, immediate and family experiences that this is, this is really the case. Um, and, and so I, I think that uh, uh, when we recognize how weak 
the situation of our employment standards and labour standards, particularly in the area of uh, uh, protection of, of jobs, is concerned. Uh, when we recognise that that's the case, when, and then we, we recognise from our own experience uh, uh, what is required uh, when a person is uh, dealing with a, a difficult uh, diagnosis which has uh, long-term uh, uh, ramifications in terms of its treatment, when we think about that, and then when we think also about how the whole issue of uh, paid sick leave has come on the screen in the last few years uh, in a way that it never had been before, and the door has really been opened to a discussion of this whole area of, of sick leave uh, and, uh, and job protections in, it never, in a way that it never was before, I think we can, uh, we can seriously say that the provision of a 26 week unpaid serious illness leave for medically certified chronic illness of the sort that is uh, envisioned and proposed here in this legislation is in fact uh, something wh whose time has come uh, and uh, something that commends itself to the attention of the government uh, and something that should become a part of uh, legislation and regulation in Nova Scotia. And so we uh, in the NDP appreciate this uh, proposal uh, having been brought forward and uh, we hope that by its being raised to public attention uh, through this bill today, uh, the pressure will be increased on the government to bring about uh, initiatives for improvement in this area of the sort that uh, in the first two years of the mandate uh, we, we haven't yet seen. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to make a few comments on this proposal. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise to speak on uh, Opposition Bill Number 306, the Serious Illness Leave Act. Um, as everyone knows here, I'm a physiotherapist who has spent almost 40 years working with those with chronic illness. And, it, and as someone who actually had a chronic illness myself that took me out of the workforce for seven years, I know how devastating chronic illness can be. So I'm pleased to speak to this legislation today. One of the things that all members would know is that when legislation is introduced, um, you don't just take it back to your department and uh, snap your fingers and make it happen. Um, there's a lot of consultation that has to go into it. And I know that the, the Minister of um, LSI would like to speak to this, but she's already spoken to it. Um, so she did want me to remind the House that after the bill was introduced last session, her department were already looking into um, the bill starting the conversations. And just, just for those who aren't aware, uh, when you introduce a bill, sometimes it takes a while for it to become law. And as an example, on March 14th, 2019, I introduced the Adoption Information Act. And on March 12th, 2021, the then government passed the Adoptions Record Act. It took two years of good consultation with the community to pass legislation that was extremely important, highly sensitive, and it was done very well. I am very confident that the Department of LSI are doing that consultation and taking the opportunity to make sure that they have the conversations with everyone who is involved. One of the things that I want to mention, though, that people may not be aware of is... Order. It's getting awful loud in here. I act, ask that we respect the person wh whom is speaking. Uh, the Honourable Minister for Seniors and Long-Term Care. One of the things that I want to draw everyone's attention to, because you may not be aware of it, so it's important for all of us to hear it, is when I first had an orientation by the WCB CEO, when I first became an MLA, I asked her, I said, what's the number one reason people call, uh, sorry, not WCB, the Human Rights Commission? And I asked the Human Rights Commission, what's the number one reason people call? And it was not at all what I expected. It was failure of employers to accommodate someone's disability in the workplace. 67% of all phone calls were an employer who was either unable or unwilling to accommodate illness. 
And I can tell you as somebody who did functional capacity evaluation testing, there are a significant number of us, some are here in this house, who are getting older and who are not able to do the jobs that they originally went to school to do and did for many years, if not decades. So one of the things that we as a government and as a society have to grapple with is that we have a lot of occupations that some of us are going to age out of the capacity to do so. And as a health professional, I have been encouraging every employer and every healthcare department and educational school to we have to start anticipating that a CCA may not be able to lift somebody out of a bathtub when she's 60 years old. And I use an example of someone I wrote a capacity evaluation form for because I was trying to reduce her chronic illness. She worked in a place where she had to climb up a ladder to put a case of rum on the top shelf. Well, there were only two people in the workplace doing that job. So for her to be accommodated in the workplace, it would have created undue hardship on the other employee. So there are a lot of things that we need to do as a government and as employers to reduce the injury rate. And I'll give you an example. We raised the staffing level in long-term care to 4.1 hours of care. One of the reasons was to provide better care for the seniors, and that is happening. But the other reason is that in long-term care and in home care, we had the highest injury rate of all professions, and that includes a lumberjack who's lifting heavy things. With the investment of extra staffing, safety equipment, the ability to have somebody there beside you when you're doing things, we have shown two years in a row a reduction in the injury rate in home care by 9% and in long-term care by 14.3%. That has a positive impact on the employer as well as the employee. So while we need to look at the benefits that we give to those who have a chronic illness, we also need to get at the root causes of chronic illness. And one of those things is looking at what supports we give to employers so that they can better accommodate people in the workplace. Because we also know that there are those who are not working because of mental health challenges. And there are not a lot of employers who have the knowledge of how do we support somebody who has those things. And I can tell you, as somebody who was off work for seven years, I was treated like I was a malingerer. Even people in my own profession who went to school with me looked down on me because I was injured and off work. And they didn't understand the illness that I had it was a chronic pain, chronic respiratory illness that they did not understand. So the stigma against those with chronic illness is alive and well. I understand the purpose of this legislation is to protect those who are chronically ill. And I know that the Department of LSI is doing that consultation work right now. But we also have to look at how we as a society treat those who are chronically ill. And we have to encourage all employers to consider having those accommodations. And one of those accommodations I know full well is those who are looking after elderly parents. They're stressed out from trying to look after their elderly parent and their children at the same time. And if they happen to work in the legislature, they might be here till midnight some nights. There are a lot of societal stressors that we didn't have 10, 20, or 30 years ago. We've got cell phones going off at all hours of the night. We've got people who can't get jobs because they don't have the technology. And employers are just struggling to make the bottom line. And so there are other opportunities to provide employers with supports to help those with a serious illness. The other thing that we need to do to support those with serious illness is to help them understand where they can get the help that they need. And I know we haven't talked about it much in here, and in some cases people made light of it. But one of the things that I heard over and over again when I was in private practice as a physiotherapist was, where do I go to get home care? 
how do I get my mother on the long-term care wait list? So when I got the health, My Health NS app, I plugged it on, I typed in, where do I get home care? Boop, there's the answer right there. We're changing the access points for those who have acute illnesses and those who have chronic illnesses. Because not knowing where to go get help is almost as big a barrier as getting the actual help itself. And we as a society need to be better educated on what we all can do to accommodate those who have chronic illnesses. And even things, I, I, I think back to an example, when I was a physiotherapy student, I was at the old infirmary, and they put all four of us physio students in wheelchairs, and they made us go up the street in the wheelchairs. Of course, the first thing we did was we were crossing the street, and we all tipped out of the wheelchairs because we were going down a, a thing, and then everybody's car stopped, and they were slammed on the brakes to get out because they thought we were handicapped, and I did feel terrible about that. But I went into, I won't say which store, on Spring Garden Road, and I could not get my wheelchair around because the aisles were too narrow. So I just want to say, in terms of this bill, protecting leave for those with serious illness, there is a huge emphasis on our government to try to reduce the injury of serious illness at the same time as we are looking at what more we could do to protect those who do have a serious illness. And one of the other things that I know is important to the minister is making sure that that consultation gets done. And uh, they're reviewing the issue and they are monitoring what is happening in other jurisdictions. Uh, it is always an issue that the, the minister raises when she is speaking at the inter-ministerial uh, conferences. <laughs> Their department is also aware that the federal job protection and employment insurance sick leave benefit has changed. And they appreciate that the Canadian Cancer Society for taking the time to meet with the LSI department to discuss this important issue. We know that the Canadian Cancer Society has advocated for job protection which aligns with the federal government's employee insurance sick leave benefits, which increased in December of 2022 from 15 weeks to 26 weeks. And as always, all of our departments are impacted by any legislation that protects injured workers. You'll recall that last year we passed legislation regarding the end of pregnancy leave. And as members would know, it took a year to do proper consultation. That issue had been raised by another member of this House. The LSI department took the time to review it, understand what other jurisdictions were doing, consult on the topic, and they brought forward a strong and conclusive and inclusive piece of legislation. Madam Speaker, serious illnesses such as cancer affect the lives of Nova Scotians and their families. It literally affects every one of us. The minister wants you all to know that she is listening and looking into the issue. She wants to hear from all Nova Scotians as well as employers, because any time you bring in legislation that impacts employers, you impact their bottom line, the cost of goods and services. And so it is not something that you can just do lightly. There has to be an impact analysis done both the pros and the cons, and everyone needs to have the opportunity to weigh in. So we are encouraging all Nova Scotians who have feedback on this to reach out to the Department of Labour, Skills and Immigration to provide that feedback. We also know that we want to talk to the Human Rights Commission in terms of what they are doing to help employers accommodate people in the workplace because WCB will tell you that the longer an employee is off work, the less chance they have of going back to work. I think the year is two years. I kind of broke the standard after being off for seven years, which were the worst seven years of my life. So being able to keep people in the workplace is the ultimate goal. Sometimes accommodation needs to be made and the more we're willing to accommodate, the better. So I want to encourage all employers who may be looking at this legislation as something to be of concern, to consider it an opportunity to look at what you are doing 
to welcome your employees back in the workplace after they have been injured or to anticipate and even have prevention programs that you can put in place to anticipate that as someone ages in place, that they are given a job that has the functional capacity for them to complete. And there is an opportunity for employers to even provide rehabilitation and prevention style programs like fitness programs to help their employees stay in as good a shape as possible, as well as the mental uh, resilience that they need in the workplace. So in conclusion, Madam Speaker, I know that the, all of our departments are impacted by anyone with a serious illness. We understand the importance of this issue uh, and that we are doing our due diligence across all of our government departments uh, to look at any changes that might come to the labour standard codes. We're going to talk to all the employers and employee groups to better understand their perspectives and if we move forward, how we would define a serious illness. And I want to thank the member for bringing forward this bill. And I look forward to hearing the closing remarks uh, from the member. Thank you, Madam yeah. Speaker. If I am to recognize the honourable member for Bedford Basin, um, it will be to close debate on second reading. The honourable member for Bedford Basin, or adjourn. Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so, as we have heard from uh, from my colleagues here um, previously, this really is resulting from uh, concerns that have come forward from the community and also from actions that the federal government has taken. So, so um, they changed the employment insurance rules back in December 2022 to allow people who were suffering from illness to access employment insurance for up to 26 weeks. And, and of course, what we have heard is that Nova Scotia labour law is um, only guarantees employees working in provincially regulated industries a maximum of three days unpaid leave mm -hmm. due to illness, and that's not adequate for a lot of people suffering from serious illnesses. What we do know, what we do know is that um, According to a narrative research poll conducted in August 2023, 86% of Nova Scotians would actually like to see um, the extension of job protected leave to 26 weeks. And, and that's already been done in, in industries that are, that are um, governed by federal jurisdiction, things like um, transportation, communications, uh, also the federal government, etc. But in those federally um, governed uh, industries, they have this ability already. But those those of us, most of, and most of the population is in fact um, does work in provincially regulated uh, uh, jobs. And so this is what we're talking about: that that sort of vast majority of the population that that currently doesn't have the ability to get job protected leave to be able to go off on EI. Because some people can go off on EI, but they don't know if they're going to have a job there when they come back. And so that, and, and not every employer is going to want their employee to go away and then come back. And, and we have heard uh, throughout this process about people who would come back to very different jobs. Uh, because while they were gone, their employer had changed what their job was. Now, one of my colleagues has noted that, well, you know, the Liberal government before didn't do anything about this. And the fact of the matter is, neither did the NDP government. We all need to do better. We all need to do better for Nova Scotians to give them the support that they need when they are fighting serious okay. illness. Period, final, full stop. All parties in this House need to do better for Nova Scotians. So when I look at at, um, there's a variety of things that have come forward over the last little while, but the, one of the really interesting things is actually what happened today. Something happened today that should make us all sit up and take notice. Ontario, with a progressive Conservative government, came out uh, with a news release 
and uh, says, and I'm just going to quote from it here, to help workers dealing with a critical illness, the government will be, get, will be launching consultations on a new job-protected leave to match the length of federal employment insurance sickness benefits, which is 26 weeks. A job-protected leave could ensure employees who receive a diagnosis of cancer or other diseases will have the peace of mind that their job will be waiting for them while they seek treatment. Quote, Ontarians should be able to focus on their cancer treatment without worrying about what it means for their job or how their family will pay the bills, said Hilary Buchan Terrell, advocacy manager for the Canadian Cancer Society. We look forward to engaging with the government during this consultation to ensure the perspectives and concerns of cancer patients in Ontario are heard. Are heard. End quote. Uh, I also found it was interesting that. Um, that employers, uh, that, that uh, the Ontario government indicated it would also soon introduce legislation that would have passed require employers to disclose salary ranges, uh, along with consultations to restrict the use of non-disclosure agreements in cases of workplace sexual misconduct. So they are moving ahead on a number of items that the opposition parties have in fact raised here in the House of concern to Nova Scotians. Clearly, they're of concerns to, uh, concern to Ontarians too, and they are in fact moving on these, and that is on Ontario, and, and I, will, um, I will table that. So, so we have these concerns that have been raised. Now, um, it is true that it does take time to consult, and, and uh, the Honourable uh, Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care noted the particular instance of the Adoption Information Act, which took a long time to consult. But one of the things that actually happened during that consultation period was that people knew we were consulting. We didn't just say, hey, we're going to consult or we're going to talk or we're going to think about it or we're going to take that back and then did nothing. We began consulting. We did interviews about it. I believe there were news releases about it. People knew we were consulting. They knew this process was happening while it was going on. Since introducing this bill last spring, which had positive comments from the Minister of Labour, Skills and Immigration, and I would note positive comments from the Premier, we have heard nothing. It's been crickets. We have no idea if they're consulting because we haven't heard anything. And that's why we've been raising, we've been asking questions about it why we had uh, a resolution come forward about it um, last week, I think it was. Um, that's why we've been pushing it, because people who are fighting serious illness need help. And so it's not just good enough to say, yeah, that's a good idea, uh, we got to ask about it, and then do nothing. And in indeed, if, if in fact consultation is going on, we'd love to know about it but we haven't heard anything about that. And so that is why we have been pushing this. Uh, we've heard you know, some, some important stories. Again, my, my colleague, the leader of our party, talked about Kathy McNaughton. This woman from Picto, Nova Scotia, put this issue on the national map. She got the federal government to move on this front. That's a pretty amazing thing for anyone from anywhere to do. And this woman raised it and raised it because she saw what her husband went through during his battle for cancer. He was actually working to pay his family's bills. When you're going through when you're going through cancer treatment to have to go out and get a job so your family can live, I found that heartbreaking. And as my colleague, the Honourable Le Leader of the Official Opposition noted, Nova Scotia is really at the bottom of the heap in terms of the number of days of job protected leave that provinces give across the country. There's a range of between uh, three weeks, uh, three, sorry, three days uh, and then there's 26 weeks, which is Quebec. And now we have Ontario now moving to consult on this. So 
if the province of Nova Scotia is in fact going to consult, it would be really great if they issued a press release because because we do see a lot of press releases come out of this government about a lot of things, and usually about they're about them, you know, if there's a program, it gets announced several times. So it would be really great if they if they did in fact share a press release so people know this is actually being worked on. For people, it it could give them some hope that they will have this job protected leave and the ability to collect EI while they are fighting their cancer. That would be really nice. And we could join Quebec. I was hopeful that we, with the reaction to, when I introduced the bill in the spring, I was really excited. I thought Nova Scotia could be one of the first in the country. Quebec already has it. But then today, there's Ontario out the door. They're consulting on it. And we have not been. Back in, back in April, the minister said she and department officials are reviewing the legislation and intend to consult with the public and business operators. We have heard nothing about that consul consultation. And, and the minister was right. It is an important issue for Nova Scotians. And I think, you know, we, we've all, everyone in this house, uh, my honourable colleague, the leader, talked about, you know, the statistics, um, 6,800 Nova Scotians would be diagnosed with cancer in, in 2022, the Canadian Cancer Society said. And for every person who's diagnosed with cancer, there, there may be a spouse, there may be children, there may be parents. There are friends, loved ones. There's, there's, it's like a spider web. It goes out from there. And so we believe that this is of critical importance to people who are suffering from cancer, as well as their friends and loved ones. And we think that this is an idea whose time has come. The Canadian Cancer Society has been advocating for this for quite a long time. Over and over in various jurisdictions across the country. Other advocacy groups are advocating for it as well. And I do note that, that in one of their bulletins that they did put out on this particular issue, they noted that by the year 2030, projected cancer cases in Nova Scotia will increase significantly. As a result, Nova Scotia must be prepared to increase supports for people living with cancer in order for them to receive the treatment they need to recover, be healthy, and adjust to a new normal. Nova Scotians should not have to choose between receiving cancer treatment and working. And really, I mean, that's what we're here, what we're here talking about. We want to make sure that when people are in the fight of their lives, they have as much support as we can possibly offer them. And really, does it seem right that if you're if you if you're working in a federally regulated industry, you get better benefits than you do if you're in a provincially regulated industry? This is not just a, talking about civil servants. These are talking about you know industries. So it can vary from uh, you know it, it could. Transportation, you know, I, I was talking about that. It, it's all set out in sections 91 and 92 of the of the Constitution Act, which, which, um, which jurisdiction governs which industry. But it does seem to me that there's something that's patently unfair. If you work in a, in a federally a regulated industry, you get job protected leave for 26 weeks. But if you work in a provincial one, you get three days. Doesn't seem fair to me. 
And so Nova Scotia has a chance to join Quebec in consulting on this and then moving on this. It has a chance to join Ontario in consulting on this and I hope that they will move on this. I don't, my family doesn't have a history of cancer, so it, you know, this isn't, this hasn't touched my family, but it has touched my constituents' families. It has touched my friends' families. All of us in here have constituents who suffer from cancer and other ser serious illnesses, and I think it makes sense to consult in a vigorous way, to let people know you're consulting, and to actually move on this particular bill. You know, I remember when I, I think I told the story, but I'm not exactly sure whether I did or not. I remember one of my mom's best friends uh, when I was growing up, her husband was an accountant and he got cancer. They declared bankruptcy. And while some protections have improved since that time, many have not. And so I do believe that Nova Scotia has the opportunity to move on this, to make things better for our constituents, which is why we're in this house, uh, sitting long hours in some cases and not sitting long hours in other cases. And Madam Speaker, I now move to adjourn debate on Bill 306. Thank you. I, I recognize the Honourable Host Leader for the official opposition. Oh. I recognize the Honourable Member for your the, the motion is to adjourn debate. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those who are not in favour, nay. The uh, debate is adjourned. I rec recognize the Honourable uh, Member for Yarmouth. Hi, uh, Madam, S Madam Speaker. I just want to bring the House's attention to the West Gallery. We're joined by some municipal dignitaries. We have Warden Amanda Mumperkett, uh, Councillor Michael Digden, and CAO Trevor McCulloch, who have come to watch uh, tonight's proceedings. I ask the House to join me in recognizing our, our visiting guests and thank them for coming down to Province House. Welcome to the host. I hope you enjoy your time here. Thank you. I recognize the honorable host leader for the official opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That concludes uh, opposition business for the day, and I'll pass uh, the uh, floor back over to the government host leader to continue with government business. As there is no adjournment debate for tonight, we will not interrupt proceedings at the moment of interruption. I recognize the honorable uh, government host leader. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Would you please call the order of business, private members, public bills for second reading? Private member bills, <clears throat> private members, public bills for second readings. I recognize the honorable government host leader. Um, Madam Speaker, I will be calling bills 119 and 396 for second reading. Um, bill 119 is the Endometriosis Awareness Month Act. Bill uh, 396 is the Sickle Cell Awareness Day Act. Uh, the government will be supporting these bills, and to permit that to happen swiftly, I request unanimous consent to permit these bills, if they pass second reading today, to bypass the Standing Committee on Law Amendments uh, and Committee of the Whole House on Bills, and to be permitted to call today for third reading. There has been a request for unanimous consent to permit permit bills 119 and 396 if they pass second reading today to bypass the standing committee on law amendments and committee of the whole host on bills and to be permitted to be called today for third reading is it agreed agreed it is agreed i recognize the honorable government house leader Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, would you please call bill number, or would you please call public and private bills for third reading? I call public and private bills for third reading. Would you please call bill number 39, whoops, sorry, bill number 119, uh, the Endometriosis Awareness Month Act. Bill 119, Endometriosis, endometriosis Awareness, I recognize, um, 
I recognize the honorable sponsor of the bill, so that would be you, the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, yes, endometriosis awareness. Uh, we should all practice saying it, and that will help us with our awareness of this very important uh, bill and this very uh, debilitating condition. Um, I, uh, first of all, want to thank the government for calling this bill for debate. Uh, it is uh, an issue that affects many, many people with uteruses in our province and in our country and around the world. And so first, uh, I would just like to remind members uh, what exactly the act says, because it gives you a very good sense of what uh, endometriosis is and, and the, um, the pain and debilitation it can cause. So an act to provide for the designation of Endometriosis Awareness Month. Whereas endometriosis is a common condition experienced by one in 10 women, trans and non-binary people of reproductive age, and can cause debilitating conditions, including chronic pelvic pain, and is sometimes associated with infertility. And whereas there is no cause yet for the disease, cause yet known for the disease, and diagnostics and treatment can often be severely delayed from the onset of symptoms, and whereas in many cases people get, can go up to eight years or longer without a diagnosis, and whereas research shows that youth with endometriosis symptoms are more likely to miss one or two days of school per month, causing them to fall behind in their studies and lead to adverse effects on their grades and self-confidence, and adults with endometriosis can lose 10 hours of product productivity per week, causing the, uh, costing the Canadian economy an estimated $1.8 billion a year, and whereas increasing public awareness of endometriosis is imperative as many people spend years unaware that their symptoms are abnormal, and whereas delays in diagnosis and treatment can negatively impact education, work and quality of life for those with endometriosis, and whereas, last one, this is an opportunity to educate the public about this common yet misunderstood disease and to encourage conversations and education about what is a normal period Therefore, be it enacted that the govern governor and assembly as follows, by the governor and assembly as follows, that this act may be cited as the Endometriosis Awareness Month Act throughout the province in each and every year, March, shall be kept and observed under the name Endometriosis Awareness Month. So um, I'm going to go over that a little bit again. So essentially, endometriosis affects one in 10 people with uteruses. Uh, and don't forget, people with uteruses are, make up 51% of the population of the planet. Uh, and yet this condition is hardly talked about. There's a taboo around it. We don't like to talk about uteruses. We don't like to talk about periods. We don't like to talk about painful periods, God forbid. And we don't like to talk about menstrual cramps. <laughs> but endometriosis is a lot more than menstrual cramps, and that is why we need a month to be able to um, educate the public, educate ourselves, educate po uh, politicians, educate physicians and, 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 uh, and healthcare professionals about this. So endometriosis is an inflammatory disease that affects people with uteruses, as I've said, mostly during reproductive years. It means that there's tissue similar to the lining of a uterus growing outside the uterus. The clumps of tissue that grow outside the uterus are called implants. Implants usually grow on ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the outer wall of the uterus, the intestines, or other organs in the abdomen. And in rare cases, they can even spread to further areas. And there's no known cure for endometriosis. As I said, it affects uh, one in 10 people with uteruses. And the symptoms and conditions include chronic pelvic pain, nausea, excessive menstrual pain, and infertility. But because the condition affects mostly women, trans, and gender non-binary people, and because of the stigma and social, science, so, social silence around menstruation, it's poorly researched and understood. Misdiagnosis and lack of treatment support are common experiences for people living with endometriosis. Not all medical professionals take pelvic pain seriously, dismissing it as a bad period, a, a baked-in womanly pain, and prescribing birth control or painkillers. 
Some people will go to family doctors or walk-in clinics dozens of time before, times before anyone takes their concerns seriously, and there are even stories of people traveling to other countries to receive care. For those who do receive a referral for specialized care, wait times can exceed years. Research has found that women identified people of color are even are uh, the least likely to have accounts of pain taken seriously by medical professionals. And research shows that endometriosis costs the Canadian economy $1.8 billion a year, with adult sufferers forced to miss work due to pain, and youth sufferers often falling behind in their studies at school. Tracy Lindemann is an advocate for people with endometriosis, and she says what happens, what ends up happening, is a lot of people with endometriosis end up feeling like failures in life. You can't do the basic things that everyone else seems able to do. And I'll table that afterwards. Many people have gone, to pu gone public with stories about lack of access to their OBGYN care for in endometriosis. The Coast magazine conducted a survey that found that, uh, uh, that, found that, of, six, that of the respondents, I'm sorry, 64% say their pain was dismissed by a medical professional while seeking care. And the survey also found that the average wait time for an OBGYN among the respondents was 14 months, and some people waited three and a half years. So there is a new IWK uh, clinic that has opened happily, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, the, Atlantic, it was, uh, the, uh, the IWK has opened the Atlanta Canada's first clinic devoted to endometriosis and pelvic pain, which is amazing. Billed as the first dedicated multidisciplinary endometriosis and chronic pain clinic in Atlanta Canada, it will offer gyneco gynecology, anesthesiology, and physiotherapy, and will serve the entire region. But, and there's always a but, uh, the wait to get into the clinic is 18 months, and even getting a referral can be challenging in provinces where thousands of people have no family doctor. So the clinic will help, but we need to do more, and awareness, Madam Speaker, is part of the puzzle. So Endometriosis Awareness Month began in March 1993, and it is now observed worldwide through activities such as education, fundraising, and marches. The Endometriosis Association is a self-help organization uh, with including women and families with endometriosis, doctors, scientists, and others interested in exchanging information about the endometriosis disease. And these are some of the reasons why our caucus introduced this bill that would recognize the month of March as Endometriosis Awareness Month. Increasing public awareness of endometriosis is very important, as many menstruators spend years unaware of their symptoms, or unaware that their symptoms are abnormal. So I just want to take a moment here and just quickly talk about the fact that our legislature now has more people with uteruses than ever before, or no, actually that's not true. In 2017, it was more than ever before. We're slightly below that now, but there's a lot of uteruses in this room, <laughs> Madam Speaker. And that wasn't the case, say, 10 years ago. And it certainly wasn't the case uh, uh, longer ago than that. And I will say, as I've said before, that that is a good reason to make sure we are electing when people with uteruses we should be making it a goal to have 50% of this room uh, women or non-binary people. And this is exactly the reason. Because we can stand up and we can talk about endometriosis as an actually important and debilitating disease that many people suffer from, and we can pass laws that will help the issue and ultimately bring comfort, literally physical comfort, one day to the people that have endometriosis. So uh, I said before, Madam Speaker, to the speaker at the time, that as health critic for the NDP, I want to be talking about women's health, people, people with uteruses' health, more and more. And I think I made the speaker at the time blush a little bit, uh, <laughs> because I said a lot of things like, 
periods and uteruses and vaginas and menopause and those kinds of words that we don't like to talk about. But I am here today on my feet talking about them because we need to. Yes. And because if you don't talk about them, then people have endometriosis for eight years undiagnosed and live with debilitating pain. So when I was young, pre-childbearing, well, no, childbearing years, but pre-child uh, bearing, uh, I had terribly painful periods. I would, uh, there were times, and it was unpredictable, but there were times when I would uh, be at work, and thank God I worked in a situation where I could like go off and do stretches in the corner because I was an actor and that's kind of what we did anyway. But, you know, I, I would like leave the rehearsal. I would go over and cry in the corner. I would stretch until somehow the pain or the drugs kicked in. And it was brutal. And there were days where I couldn't get out of bed. And I didn't even have that bad <laughs> of a situation. So I know that we're, you know, in the situation that I was in where I would have to leave the, the, the workspace, as it were, not the workplace, but the workspace, uh, and take time to, to get in control of the pain that I was having. Um, uh, if it had been any worse, I wouldn't have been there and you know, wouldn't have been able to work. And I know that for people with endometriosis, the pain is l much worse than that. Uh, and for many days and all the time, uh, not all the time, but uh, you know, often every period. Um, and this idea that things are just, it's just normal, periods hurt. Uh, shouldn't be the way it is. So I just want everyone to contemplate that for a minute. I again want to reiterate that I am very pleased that the government is taking a look at this bill and that we will pass this bill. I would also like to thank uh, Maggie Archibald uh, and the coalition of people who suffer with endometriosis who have brought this situation to light with their constant ag advocacy on social media to government, to uh, politicians, uh, and thank them for their hard work. Um, and I hope that they will get to see the benefits and the, and the, and the result of this advocacy uh, with this uh, bill being proclaimed. Um, but I will also say, in closing, of course, that an Awareness Month is important, but what's more important is you know, real uh, training, real research, uh, real advocacy into medications that will address this condition so that people uh, and, and um, uh, medications and surgeries and, and treatments that, that so that people will actually, endometriosis can actually be um, something that people used to suffer with uh, but don't anymore. So with those words, I will take my seat. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Public Works. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm pleased um, to rise for a few moments here this afternoon to speak uh, on Bill 119, uh, brought forward by the member of Dartmouth North. Um, this bill designates March as Endometriosis Awareness Month. Uh, March is observed globally as Endometriosis Awareness Month with formal recognition by several regional governments within Canada, including most recently the province of Ontario. As the bill outlines, the endometriosis is a common condition experienced by one in 10 women, trans and non-binary binary people of reproductive age. That means the odds are that we all know someone who suffers with endometriosis. The disease can be debilitating conditions, including chronic pelvic pain, and it is sometimes associated with infertility. Research shows that youth with endometriosis symptoms are more likely to miss one or more days of school, which my colleague just talked about, causing them to fall behind in their studies and leading to adverse effects on their grades and self-confidence. For adults with endometriosis, this can translate to a loss of 10 hours of productivity per week. It is estimated that endometriosis costs the Canadian economy $1.8 billion per year. The IWK Health Centre is home to Atlantic Canada's first clinic dedicated to endometriosis and chronic pelvic pain. We are proud of the wonderful work that is being done at the clinic that serves the entire region. It's a multidisciplinary approach with a number of services in one place. Increasing public awareness of endometriosis is crucial to helping people understand that the symptoms they are experiencing are abnormal. And I wanted to speak to this bill um, because I do 
want to talk about the importance of awareness. And my daughter's best friend, her name was Laura, and she was one of the most beautiful girls I've ever met. And she spent a lot of time at my house, and she was she was, became one of my other daughters. It always felt like I had three daughters with Laura. And Laura suffered from endometriosis. And she suffered for a long time. And in the end, um, Laura passed away from uh, a surgery while she was trying to find some type of relief from this chronic condition. And I can tell you, because I thought I was her mother, I watched her suffer. I watched her miss so many things. Uh, and my daughter would miss those special times too, so that she could be with Laura. Uh, and when we lost Laura, I always said that it was something that I would champion. So I just want to say thank you so much to the NDP for bringing this bill forward. When I saw it, it touched my heart. I know it's touching my daughter's heart right now in PEI because I'm pretty sure she's listening to me. And Laura, I hope you're listening too because this is for you. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Bedford Basin. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So uh, I do find it interesting that all the speakers on this particular issue have been people who have or I shouldn't make assumptions, or have had uh, <laughs> uteruses, because, I, because the point that my colleague from Dartmouth North made, that these conversations didn't happen before we had sort of a critical mass in this house of women or people with uteruses, I, it's been you know, something that, that I've spoken about previously, because quite frankly, a lot of the things that we talk about in here would, would be different from what they were even when I was first elected 14 years ago. Um, not long ago, I was working on a bill that had something to do with periods and, and ledge council, God bless them, they wanted to say menstruation. I said, no, I want to say periods because that's what everybody calls them. So let's use plain language in here. Let's not use the Latin term for whatever and, and cloak it in mystery, you know. 50% of us have or have had uteruses, so let's call them what we, we call them. So to me, that's important. And, and making the concerns of women become an everyday topic that we discuss in the House is important. Now, I never um, suffered from endometriosis, but I had friends who did. And it was excruciating. They missed work. They would be in emergency rooms writhing in pain. They had growths outside their uterus on other organs. It is not just a, just a minor women's problem. It is not just a, a bad period. The other thing that goes along with this is the tendency, and I hope it's less now, for health care some healthcare professionals, I want to be very careful how I say this because not everybody's like this, to dismiss the concerns of women because they don't understand it or they don't know how to relieve it or how to diagnose it. And all too often, women's health concerns are dismissed, shunted aside, they're told they're crazy. And, and so, that's why I think it's important that we have endometriosis awareness month because people need to understand that this is a real condition. It is not just a bad period. It can be debilitating. It can affect fertility and, and a woman's overall health. If you have growths on organs outside your uterus, that is going to affect your overall health. It is not just a once a month or a few days a month kind of thing. It can affect you in very serious ways. So that is why I am pleased to see that we are debating this bill today because it's an important bill for women and people with uteruses. And it's important for the people who love them, who may in fact have uteruses and may not. But women's health 
is Nova Scotians health. And so the more information we can get out to people so that, that conditions like endometriosis are better understood, accepted, and that means, you know, my, my one friend who had it was a television anchor. And I remember she had her, she had her TV makeup on and she had, she had an episode. And so she goes into ER and she said, you know, um, I don't, and, and she said, I had black everywhere. She was mortified by the way she looked. And, and she, she, she thought that they might think she was like in a stage play. She was like, whatever. And she was like, I'm a television anchor and I'm here to tell you I have this terrible, terrible pain. And she wanted to be taken seriously and she was worried when she went in with all this makeup and it's running everywhere and everything that they wouldn't, they wouldn't take her seriously. So I think it's bills like this, days like this, months like this, they help to ensure that, that the concerns of women are taken seriously when they go to ERs, when they go to see their family doctor. If they can't get in to see their family doctor, it's another thing. and. Um, that makes it difficult for anyone who has any condition to sort of pr progress through their treatment. But I do want to, I do want to note that, that the more we do this, the more we make people aware of conditions that have previously been shrouded in secrecy and sometimes shame, the better off all of us are going to be. So I want to thank my colleague for bringing this bill forward and thank the government for calling it today. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, in, in the gallery opposite is Maggie Archibald, and Maggie is the force behind this month. And so I'd like all members to help give her the warm welcome of the House. Welcome to the House. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So Maggie is no stranger to this place. Um, and I remember driving on a highway in Cape Breton in a blizzard uh, with my colleagues. And uh, the member for Halifax said, it'll say, well, Island saying, yeah. we got to call Maggie Archibald. <laughs> and I said, are you kidding? Like, it's a whiteout and there's no service. And she said, no, we said we'd call Maggie. She's got to talk to us about this bill. So we called Maggie and miraculously the cell service held and we didn't go off the road. And, uh, and she shared with us some of the reasons um, that we have heard uh, already tonight about why this bill is so important. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge that and I want to thank you Maggie for doing that um, but you know I think also there's a cautionary tale in this story um, I think that Maggie and other advocates have had to move mountains to convince uh, not just politicians but the medical establishment that their pain is real mm -hmm. and um, you know as the member uh, for Bedford Basin said uh, it is um, women and non-binary folks who, you know, so far are speaking to this bill or slated to. Um, and, you know, I, uh, we talk a lot about the challenges and triumphs um, faced uh, predominantly by men in this chamber, <laughs> frankly. Um, but I think it's also important that we acknowledge um, the, the pain and the silence that is so often experienced um, by by women and non-binary folks in our in our society, and that can be physical pain in the case of endometriosis, or all kinds of other pain. Um, and and so I think that that speaks to, uh, as has been said, the need to really acknowledge this and to to ground it in people's real experience. And um, I I uh, I thank the minister so much um, for her comments. 
um, because that uh, remind those kinds of stories remind us why we're here. Mm -hmm. um, they remind us why we pass legislation like this um, because things touch us. Uh, they touch us in our personal life and they touch us in our professional life and. Uh, Occasionally, if our better angels are on the right side and the stars align, uh, we can turn that into legislation um, that can help people. And I do believe that this can help people. Um, I also have friends and family who have suffered uh, with this disease. And let me tell you something. Every single person in this chamber has friends and family that have suffered with this disease. And, and so it's really important to think about that. Um, imagine, uh, for those of you who haven't had this experience, you know, going into an emergency room and saying, I have debilitating pain, going to your family doctor and saying, I can't work, my pain is so bad, and having someone to tell you to take a couple of Advil and lie down and you'll feel better. This is what routinely happens. Um, I think we often talk. Um, uh, those of us who have given birth about the pain of childbirth and um, and the ways in which people who haven't had that experience don't understand that pain. Um, but you know, I think that this say, you know you know the same is true for lots of other conditions, and I think that this is one of them. And so you know, I really uh, have always believed that the most important thing we can do in this chamber and in these jobs is to do our best to be empathetic to the concerns of Nova Scotians, to the concerns of constituents. And so I think this bill is really a display of that empathy. And I think that you know what we're trying to do with this bill is to say to people who are experiencing this pain, who are, cha are challenged to find treatment, are challenged to be believed, we hear you, we see you, we believe you, we acknowledge your pain, we know that it's bad, and we will be a continuing part of the drive to ensure that everyone can get up-to-date, effective treatment uh, for endometriosis. So thank you, Maggie. Uh, thank you to the other members uh, for supporting this bill. And with those few words, I'll take my seat. If I am to recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North, it will be to close debate on Bill Number 119. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and uh, yes, thank you very much to everyone who uh, offered their um, their words and um, uh, to this debate. Um, and with those few words, I move to close debate on Bill 119. Second, second reading on Bill 119. The motion is to close debate on second reading of Bill Number 119 and. Endometriosis Awareness Month. Um, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried and the bill will be read uh, a third time on a future day, which could be today. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would you please call private and public bills for third reading? I recognize the Honourable uh, House Leader. Madam Speaker, would you please call Bill Number 119, the Endometriosis Awareness Month Act. Okay. I recognize the Honourable uh, Member for Dartmouth North on Bill 119 on third reading, Endometriosis Awareness Month Act. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do move third reading of Bill 119, the Endometriosis Awareness Month Act. Uh, I'm going to take my seat and uh, my colleague will say a few words. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I did want to start by acknowledging Maggie's presence in this House. Um, so Maggie was good at getting in contact uh, with her MLA and her MLA's office, um, and we and, and it really. But I mean, in seriousness, this is the work we do, right? And this is how we understand how these systems do or don't work. So you know, here was a young person in Nova Scotia who could not get access to care, and was in pain. And you know, we really, you know, 
it took a lot of shaking and, and Maggie's persistence to like make that system work a little bit better. I know it's not perfect, Maggie. We're going to keep on working on it. Um, <clears throat> but the other side is also that, um, Maggie, you're so active on social media and in the public. And um, this is really at the heart of the bill that, you know, um, my colleagues have talked about the need to talk about um, lots of different types of health, including um, for folks with uteruses. Um, and uh, endometriosis is such an important issue. And I think, uh, you know, I, I would agree that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't talk about this. I remember I'd never heard of it until I was in sort of my mid-20s, and my friend started to confide in me and say, well, no, I don't think I'm going to be able. They've told me I can't have children um, by, by birth um, because I have endometriosis, and that's why you don't see me sometimes in classes, and that's why sometimes I have to miss work. And I'd never heard of this condition. Um, for all the other friends I'd had who, who had been sick in various different ways, um, and so I, I, f I think about that friend who patiently uh, described the condition and explained it and bravely explained it to me t in my mid-20s and that book ends with, with Maggie's advocacy uh, right now in Nova Scotia. And, you know, and I think it's really important to note that, I mean, women's health and women's pain, people with uteruses are often really dismissed and particularly um, when it's the more difficult um, concerns. You know, and I know in the U.S. Um, that African American women are 50% less likely to be diagnosed with endometriosis um, because we're not only dealing with misogyny and sexism at that point, but also the impact of racism in the health system that creates uh, enormous barriers to, to health care. Um, and I mean, I you know, I I think there's also it, ongoing barriers for 2S LGBTQIA plus folks. Um, especially, I will say, around sexual health and reproductive health. Um, people often just don't quite know what to do with you. Um, and um, so this is a really important, so important to create awareness. And, you know, people have spoken to the barriers that it creates for people, you know, in their education, the barriers it creates for people in their employment, loss of income, um, and often with very limited social and societal supports, right? So it's really hard to be, um, this is not a predictable cycle of debilitating pain. Um, and it's really hard to be, you know, trying to talk to your teachers, trying to talk to your profs, trying to talk to your employers and explain why you seem actually a little flaky and unreliable, but actually you're dealing with a really serious chronic health issue that in Nova Scotia still takes years, years to get a diagnosis, years mm. to get treatment. Um, <clears throat> even once you move through your primary health care provider, if you have one, um, uh, you know, the wait at the IWK is long. Um, and really the only way to fully diagnose endometriosis is through laparoscopic surgery. Um, and so you have to line up for that. And um, so this is, you know, this is a very uh, uh, serious chronic issue <clears throat> and often has longer term effects around um, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, anxiety and depression. Um, so awareness is a great start. We obviously need to do more in terms of service access. Uh, we need to treat chronic pain as the issue, the real issue that it is, and not dismiss people. Um, and I'm very happy that we have the chance to pass this bill um, to start that journey in endometriosis in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. If I am to recognize the honorable member for Darkbeth North, it will be to close. Uh, Sorry, it will be to close third reading on bill number 119. Would all those in favor, oh, go ahead. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I do move to close the third reading on bill 119, the Endometriosis Awareness Month Act. The motion is to close third reading on bill 119 the Endometriosis Awareness Month Act. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill 119, an act to provide for the designation of Endometriosis Awareness Month. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read 
by the clerk ordered that the bill be engrossed. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would you please call private and public bills for second reading? I now call pu public and private uh, bills for second reading. I recognize the Honourable Leader, uh, uh, House Leader of the Government. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 396, Sickle Cell Awareness Day Act? Bill Number 396, Sickle Cell Awareness Day Act. I recognize the Honourable Member for Lucas Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, through you to the House, I move second reading of Bill 396, an act to establish a sickle cell awareness day. Um, so this was uh, initially brought uh, forward uh, by the member for Cole Harbour, uh, who has been an advocate uh, throughout his life, but certainly since he uh, became elected. So I want to thank him primarily for uh, his focus on, on this subject. Uh, sickle cell is an inherited condition, uh, most commonly affecting people of African, Caribbean, Middle Eastern, and South Asian an ancestry. Uh, it requires uh, blood transfusions and bone marrow transplants to treat or cure it. Um, the disease causes strokes, organ damage, uh, and increases the risk of complicated infections. Uh, so it is up to us uh, to take part in, in trying to uh, fight the disease and, and bring awareness to it and establishing uh, a sickle cell, sickle cell awareness day uh, scheduled for June 19th uh, is, is, is one simple way that we can demonstrate our uh, our thoughtfulness towards uh, fighting this disease. Um, I will I will say that uh, I I recognize uh, that uh, blood donors are few and far between. Uh, it seems like generally speaking, and even more so with respect to uh, the aforementioned communities, the uh, members of the African, Caribbean, Middle Eastern, uh, and South Asian. So, South Asian, excuse me, uh, folks that identify uh, from those communities, and we need to uh, work hard to break down barriers associated with uh, connecting with with members of, of those communities in the interest of uh, providing better access to uh, to healthcare, to blood blood uh, donations, blood uh, availability. Uh, we need to work hard to build more trust with these communities and, and, and meet them where their needs are, where, they're, where, they're, where they physically are and where they, uh, where they are uh, perhaps mentally and uh, it's up to us to, to make sure we demonstrate a conscious effort to, to meet, meet patients, meet uh, those Nova Scotians where they are. I'll also note that uh, the Canadian government the World Health Organization and the uh, United Nations also recognize June 19th uh, as Sickle Cell, Aware Sickle Cell Awareness Day. Uh, and so I think it is, it, it's certainly a, a great gesture to join suit, uh, become uh, a province that's joined, joined in that effort. Uh, and to wrap up, my remarks, I want to thank uh, the folks that are working at the Canadian Blood Services, uh, the folks working at the Nova Scotia Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Uh, I want to thank the, the government uh, for partnering with the Liberal Caucus to advance this recognition day. And uh, last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank the member for Coal Harbour for bringing this forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise today um, to say a few words on the Bill 396, uh, the Sickle Cell Anemia Awareness Day. Um, uh, similar to the bill that was just passed here in the House, um, it has a number of uh, a number of uh, hidden hidden things that happen when folks have sickle cell anemia. And um, I, I want to take it back to a time where um, I, I had a close friend that that um, had sickle cell anemia, but we never knew for many years because he hid it. He, we, we just had no idea why our friend would miss school. He wouldn't be in high school. He'd miss classes. An amazing, amazing kid. Uh, he wasn't a kid, but amazing teenager. Um, an amazing, um, fun-loving person who would light up a room and you would never know that he was sick. And so he constantly had, you know, a number of appointments, a number of, of, of times at a school, and we were always wondering, where's our friend? His name is Lawrence Njoku. And we were like, where's our friend at? And so, you know, um, getting closer to when uh, he, he, his passing, um, we were like, what's going on? Where's Lawrence? How come he's not at school? And, and when we went to go visit him, we were like, why didn't you tell us? But it was because he was such a bright light, and, um, and, and these things like this are hidden because you know we don't have enough information on that so I think um, you know just just to point out the fact that these are really important um, diseases and illnesses that need to be made aware by people and it affects um, the African Nova Scotian and the Caribbean community um, a lot more because of um, just the, the nature of the disease. So um, I, I stand here to, to in tribute to my friend who who um, passed away um, as a teenager, and I wasn't thinking I was going to be upset. Um, but um, the whole while, um, he didn't let us know he was sick because he didn't want us to worry about him. He was very strong. He was a great person. And his family, God love them, they continue on the awareness, um, the awareness vein. His brother is constantly talking at schools about sickle cell anemia, about blood, um, giving blood and, and getting yourself checked and tested to, you know, to make sure that you have the right tools um, in order to protect yourself if that's the case. Um, but I will say that I'm grateful, grateful to be able to, to stand here today and stand in my, in my place to talk about an awareness day for sickle cell anemia because we know that a lot of folks are affected by that and we want to make sure that we can do as much as we can to help folks that, that need this information and teach people about how to take care of themselves and as well what to look out for. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for African Nova Scotian Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am pleased today to rise to speak to this important bill that recognizes June 19th as Sickle Cell Awareness Day. I am acquainted with sickle cell as I have a cousin who has this disease. I note that June 19, 2024 is World Sickle Cell Day. I am pleased that Nova Scotia will join with other jurisdictions around the world to raise awareness. According to the Reproductive Care Program of Nova Scotia, about one in every 6,200 babies born in the Maritimes has sickle, sickle cell disease. It is estimated that 5,000 Canadians have this disease. That number is projected to grow in coming years. What is sickle, sickle cell? Well, it's a generic disease which causes red blood cells to become sickle-shaped. Cells with sickle cell hemoglobin are stiff and sticky. When they lose oxygen, they form into the shape of a sickle or crescent, like the letter C. In Canada, sickle cell disease is most common in people who come from or whose ancestors came from Africa, Central America, especially Panama, South America, Caribbean nations, Mediterranean countries, India, or Near East countries. 
This disease has significant impact on patient quality of life and impacts daily life. Blocked blood flow can lead to serious problems, including stroke, organ damage, eye problems, infections, and episodes of pain. Sickle cell disease is a lifelong illness. Bone marrow transplant is currently the only cure. In Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, sickle cell disease is screened in newborns by the Maritime Newborn Screening Program. Early diagnosis for sickle cell disease through newborn screening allows for immediate intervention and treatment. Early interventions have been shown to prevent early mortality and severe um, illness in children born with this life-threatening disease. It may reduce hospitalizations and increase life expectancies. Ultimately, newborn screening can lead to longer, healthier lives. Without newborn screening, newborns may suffer irreversible damage to health, and without newborn screening, affected individuals may suffer recurrent infection, debilitating pain, anemia, and chronic organ damage, which includes stroke, kidney, and respiratory failure. Uh, that's why awareness of this disease and why this bill is so important. Proactive measures are essential in providing the most effective treat uh, treatments for those with sickle cell disease. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If I am to recognize the Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains Lucasville, it will be to close debate on third reading. Second reading, sorry. I recognize the Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains Lucasville. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister and the Member for Halifax Needham for adding uh, certainly a personal touch to uh, the remarks expressed in the House today. Uh, and I move, uh, I move to close second reading on uh, Bill 396, please. The motion is to move second reading of Bill number 396, Sickle Cell Awareness Day Act. Would all those in favour of the mo motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. Bill 396, the uh, Sickle Cell Awareness Day Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be, oh sorry, we're still on second reading, my fault, sorry. I really want to rush things. The bill will be read a third time on a future day, perhaps today. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that you now rise um, and the House resolve itself into Committee of the Whole House on Bills. We will take a short recess to set up for Committee of the Whole House on Bills.
Order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mix uh, Speaker. Mix Chair, could you please call Bill number 348, Lunenburg Common Lands Act? Bill 348, Lunenburg Common Lands Act. I recognize the Clerk. Bill 348 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Private and Local Bills on October 26, 2023, without amendments and contains one clause. Shall Clause 1 carry? carry. Shall the title carry? carry? Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mix Chair. Would you please call Bill number 351, the Bethel Presbyterian Church, Sydney Act? Bill 351, the Bethel Presbyterian Sydney Act. I recognize the Clerk. Uh, bill 351 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Private and Local Bills on October 31st, 2023, without amendments, and contains one clause. Shall Clause 1 carry? carry. Shall Title carry? carry? Shall the bill carry? carry. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mix Chair. Would you please call Bill number 369, the Riverport Electric Light Act for polling district number two in the County of Lunenburg, an act to amend. Bill 369, the Riverport Electric Light Act for polling district number two in the County of Lunenburg. I recognize the clerk. Bill 369 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Private and Local Bills on October 31st, 2023 with amendments and contains 21 clauses. I understand the bill was amended by the Standing Committee on Private and Local Bills. And unless this committee wishes to pre proceed immediately with consideration of the clauses, I would ask the clerk to explain how the bill has been amended. The clerk. Chair, Clause 11 was amended by adding an additional clause after it to cure a typographical error in Section 42 of the Act being amended by pluralizing the word provision. Clause 12 was amended by adding a new clause after it to renumber a duplicated section number in that Act uh, and to correct the misspelling of the word unless in the same section of the Act being amended. For the benefit of this committee, I want to explain that as we consider this bill, we are considering the bill in the form containing the amendments already made by the Standing Committee on Local and Private Bills. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mix. Uh, Mix Chair, would you please call Bill number 340, the Municipal Reform 2023 Act? Bill 340, the Municipal Reform Act. We resume debate with six hours and 29 minutes remaining on the time allocated. Is there any further debate on Clause 6? Shall Clause 6 carry? carry. Shall Clauses 7 to 13 carry? carry. Clause 14. Carry. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, um, Mix Chair. I will draw the member's attention to NDP 2. Changes recommended to the Committee of the Whole House on Bills, page 4, Clause 14. Add after proposed subsection A3 the following subsections. 
four, notwithstanding section two, the total municipal fiscal capacity grants payable to municipalities in a fiscal year may not be in an amount less than double the total amount municipal financial capacity grants paid to municipalities in the fiscal year immediately preceding the coming into force of this section. Five, notwithstanding subsection two, the total municipal financial capacity grants payable to municipalities in a fiscal year may not be an amount less than the total amount payable to the previous fiscal year adjusted in accordance with a change to the consumer price index as determined by Stats Canada. So, uh, mixed chair, the, uh, the, this, to boil this down, it is doubling the capacity grant and indexing to CPI in layman's terms. So the municipal financial capacity grant is a topic of concern for municipalities. In response to a survey conducted by the Sermgar committee, the committee identified two key areas regarding the municipal financial capacity grant. Update the formula to ensure it accurately reflects the financial needs of municipalities, and two, increase the funding for the, for the municipal financial capacity grant to provide much needed support to municipalities. These two key areas were aimed at addressing the chronic um, underfunding that has, um, that has almost made, the, made this grant um, ineffectual for many municipalities um, and, has, and, has her, and has created uh, and has compromised, I should say, I think that's the word, compromise is what I'm looking for, the grant's ability to provide municipalities with a comparable level of services at a comparable tax rate. So increasing the funding to the capacity grant has been a priority for the NSFM for many years because of this chronic underfunding and the need to offer the reasonable comparable services at reasonable comparable tax rates to residents. The amount of equalization, as the capacity grant is often referred to as, has remained frozen since 2014 to 2015. Currently, about 20.4 uh, 20 million of that, mon of that money, um, which is about 67.33% 67 of the funding comes from Nova Scotia Power. While 9.9 .9 million roughly, which is 32.67%, comes from the province. So in 2021, the NSFM was requesting a 20 million increase in the provincial funds for the grant over three years. This at the time was not implemented. In 2017, the NDP put forward a bill to, and we have reintroduced this bill, I believe on two more occasions, uh, which would have granted um, 50, for the CBRM particularly, 50 million for three years so every three years um, while the MOU or the formula was being worked out. This amendment is in alignment with the resolutions of the NSFM that they've put forward over the past five years. The Sermgar Committee pr uh, proposal, which was an increase of 15 million in the provincial funding and to index the CPI. If this proposal had been accepted by the minister and the premier, it would have increased the total funding to 45.36 million and increased the province's funding share to 57.47%. The change would have been more, would have ac more accurately reflected the growing costs and needs of municipalities. What the minister and province could have done also was update the MF the MFCG by 15 million and index by and do a CPI index annually. The minister and the premier could have implemented floor payments for municipalities facing reduction and freeze funding at updated amounts for municipalities undergoing um, consolidation. 
during the review of the class one and class two and the class two classifications. I have spent, and the reason why I'm going to be talking about, I, I'm, I'm spending some time talking on this is because I spent a lot of my career um, in politics advocating for the doubling of equalization. Um, quite a long, a quite, a quite a, and quite a lot of my, even my time, even before politics, when I was just a kid in grade, in grade six, this became a part of my life. Um, it was something that was constantly talked about with um, family um, and political family. And so it's something really close to my heart. It's something I feel really passionate about. Um, because in the in the CBRM, the municipality the, the municipality is highly reliant on equalization. The CBRM it currently receives roughly one half of the entire fund, and the CBRM has the highest tax rates in the province, by far, at at over two dollars on the hundred. It does not have the taxation capacity required to address the ever-increasing infrastructure and operating needs uh, you know, of, our, of our community. The CBRM has pressures that other municipalities do not have, such as the, um, the increased amount of transit that it has to provide, the wastewater treatment infra infrastructure, also to name some. The CBRM believed when the, when the municipal capacity grant uh, was doubled in 2021 and there was a commitment made to modernize the municipal capacity grant formula, was a, they believed it was going to be a turning point for all struggling Nova Scotia municipalities. However, what is being proposed in Bill 340 falls very short of what was expected. Instead of adding more funding, the municipal capacity grant remains the same, with the CBRM expected to lose a couple million than what they currently get. Because what the new formula, d formula does, it doesn't increase the pot. What it has done is just redistribute, redistribute it the same 1995 funding and is leaving 17 municipalities with less money than they are currently receiving. For th so for this, re for this reason is why the residents of the CBRM, residents critically need the funds provided. They are paying $2 plus on the 100. We cannot expect the residents of the CBRM to pay more taxes. It is, it is already crippling many residents. It is lowering their purchasing power. It is causing hardships paying their property taxes. This government cannot expect them to pay more. And the, because the, what this capacity grant does is help with the cost of delivering core services and it protect, to the residents, and it protects the residents against increases in tax rates beyond what they currently pay. Mm -hmm. So to lose a couple million in a few years is going to be harmful. That is why we're talking about doubling the capacity grant. That's why we're talking about indexing it to CPI. I understand that the bill, you know, modernizes the formula, yet for some reason the minister and the premier did not change or modernize the increase in the funding. It did not index to inflation. But this oversight can be corrected today. 
this evening to amend Bill 340 to include the recommendations from the CBRM, to double the municipal, the municipal capacity grant, and index to inflation. This bill needs to be amended so municipalities facing increased challenges will will get the help that will get the help that they need without it being on the back of another municipality or 17 other municipalities. They will not get the help that they they will not get that help by making a struggling municipalities continue to struggle more. So by doubling it, we are lifting all boats of all municipalities that need the money. There are 17 municipalities that will struggle. If this bill is not amended to double and index, uh, and double and index, these municipalities are going to receive less funding, and not because they need it less, but because other municipalities need it too. And if other municipalities need it too, that means, that says to me, that we need to double the funding now, and we need to index to CPI. So I please hope that you take these into consideration because this is too important to a lot of municipalities, to the people in my riding, and to the CBRM. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Shabukto. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I just uh, briefly want to uh, uh, add a little to the, uh, uh, our, our support to the line of reasoning which has been put forward so strongly and forcefully uh, in favor of uh, th the, this doubling amendment by the member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer. Um, I do think it's important to uh, remember that this is not something that uh, she or our caucus have drawn out of the clouds. Uh, this reflects the original uh, recommendation from the foundation of this whole edifice of the present municipal tax reform, the recommendations of the Service Exchange uh, review and um, uh, Municipal Government Act uh, review uh, committee. Uh, and I, I, I want to uh, just put it before the government as clearly as possible um, that this amendment uh, does point to a, a whole series of uh, difficulties, but the core difficulty uh, of this bill, which this amendment is addressing, um, is that the bill, if it is to proceed without amendment, does not adequately address the structural fiscal incapacity of the CBRM. Now, there were many um, clear and strong presentations made about the bill to uh, the Law Amendments Committee. I, I thought one that was particularly uh, focused and cogent was uh, the one that was uh, presented by CBRM CAO uh, Marie Walsh, um, who followed her analysis with a very simple sentence. I, I will uh, uh, table it after I'm finished. She concluded what she had to say by saying simply, this is paramount to the sustainability of the CBRM. So the, the structural fiscal capacity of the CBRM is the single greatest problem facing municipal tax reform in Nova Scotia. And the doubling of the capacity grant and the tying of this to PEI, to, to CPI, uh, will effectively address this core and central problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. PEI. I recognize the honorable member for Sydney, member two. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, mixed uh, speaker. Um, just to offer a few quick comments. Um, could have said this before. Uh, I know that the the, the committee recommended uh, a lower amount when it comes to the capacity grant, uh, and I think that I think that's be, kind of became some of the challenge here, not only for CBRM but for other communities too as well that that may um, 
that may uh, not see uh, as much of a benefit. Uh, I think if the if the government would have actually followed that recommendation, I think we probably could have stopped a lot of the debate that's actually happening. Ultimately, a lot of this comes down to money. It was a recommendation made by the committee. And, I, and I'd say the same thing. I was in that department. So, so you know, I'm not saying that flippantly. you got to make decisions around money, right? But that was one of the things that when we got into the, even the MOU talks back in the day, uh, and I've said this on the record before, I can appreciate what the minister's doing because this conversation has been going on for a while. And money was always kind of part of that conversation. Uh, and. And uh, this, this amendment, I'll support this amendment uh, because I think fundamentally it's not just for the CBRM, I think it's also for other communities too as well that could have uh, been supported by taking that recommendation from the committee and, and increasing the capacity grant. Shall the amendment carry? No. There are several no's. The amendment is defeated. Or oh, sorry, didn't hear. Pardon me. Um, there has been a request for a recorded vote. The, the bells will ring until the lips are satisfied, which I understand is a short period of time. Order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. There has been a request for a recorded vote. The clerk will conduct the vote. Brad Johns. No. Tori Rushton. No. Barbara Adams. No. Kim Maslin. No. Tim Houston. Alan McMaster. No. Twyla Gross. No. Michelle Thompson. No. John Lohr. No. Trevor Boudreau. No. Tim Hallman. No. Kent Smith. No. Dave Ritzy. No. Brian Wong. No. Susan Corkum Greek. No. Brian Comer. No. Colton LeBlanc. No. Jill Balzer. No. <clears throat> Pat Dunn. No. Greg Moreau. No. Becky Druin. No. Larry Harrison. No. John White. No. John A. McDonald. No. Keith Bain. No. Chris Palmer. Melissa Sheehy Richard. No. Danielle Barkhouse. No. Tom Taggart. No. Nolan Young. No. Steve Craig. No. Patricia Arab. Yes. Keith Irving. Yes. Brendan McGuire. Yep. Derek Mombercat. Yes. Zach Churchill. Kelly Regan. Yes. Ian Rankin. Susan LeBlanc. Yes. Claudia Chender. Yes. Kendra Coombs. Yes. Susie Hansen. Yes. Gary Burrell. Yes. Carla McFarland. 
Rafa Di Costanzo. Yes. Tony Ince. Laura Lee Nichol. Yes. Ben Jessam. Yes. Braden Clark. Ali Duale. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Yes. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. Elizabeth Smith McCrossing. The results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 16, nays 29. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 14 carry? Yes. Shall clauses 15 to 17 carry? Yes. Clause 18, I recognize the honorable member for Sydney member two. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, <clears throat> so I refer uh, the host to uh, change sheet lib for CWHB lib four. Uh, page four, at immediately after clause 18, the following heading and clause, Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Uh, section 19, one, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing shall develop and implement a new municipal funding agreement between His Majesty and the right of the province in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. And two, a new municipal funding agreement referred to in subsection one must be developed in negotiation and collaboration with the Cape Breton Regional Municipality and reflect the uniqueness of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. And I'll just, I'll say a few words on the amendment. Uh, we want to bring this forward. And this is something the government has actually talked about uh, doing uh, anyway. So I would hope that they would support uh, this amendment because um, we've had conversation here about uh, developing a charter uh, for the CBRM and uh, members have said that publicly that that is now on the table um, and uh, you know as I've said uh, before this is this is the part that doesn't cost you any money until you negotiate the deal and then it costs you money but uh, the point being is that you know, we, we've, we've debated in here many hours, Mick Speaker, about, about the uniqueness of, of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality and, and its sheer size in comparison to the other communities that uh, are in the MOU uh, that we're very happy for if, if this deal works for them. Uh, we know, obviously, you know, based on what we heard at Law Amendments and, and based on, uh, you know, our own information and my own experience that, that uh, the Cape Breton Regional Municipality is, is much larger in scope. Uh, and some of the challenges that they face and some of the financial pressures that they face. So, so really what this amendment is is exactly what the government has is, is publicly said. So it's that uh, we are willing to sit down with the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Uh, we're willing to negotiate with the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Uh, and by supporting this amendment, uh, essentially, uh, is, is what the government is saying. So I hope that the government does support this uh, because, uh, as, as I said and, and as the government said, they're willing to do a new charter. They're willing to sit down and have that conversation. Uh, so uh, support of this amendment, uh, I believe, is important. It, sh it would show tonight that the government is willing. Uh, again, it doesn't cost anything, this amendment at this point, but it just it shows the, the willingness of uh, the government, which they've indicated publicly already, uh, that they're willing to sit down and have that conversation uh, with the CBRM, come up with a, a new uh, relationship, come, you know, kind of reestablish the relationship a bit uh, as well. Uh, you know, I've said that, you know, time to, CBRM has accepted that they're in Bill 40 right now. So um, uh, they've accepted that. Uh, they're not happy with it in the long run. It's not the best uh, for the community, but um, this amendment, uh, developing and implementing a new municipal funding agreement with the, with the Cape Breton Regional Municipality and an agreement based on uh, uniqueness and collaboration with the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. It's a kind of a, a no-brainer for me. This is exactly what the government said they were going to do. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'll leave my comments there for now. I hope the government supports me. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Mix Chair. The, this amendment is the last effort that we have to amend this bill that would protect the residents of CBRM and of the CBRM ridings that are represented in this room. 
Lib 4 amendment accurately reflects the CBRM Mayor and Council's position. When the Mayor proposed uh, this amendment in law amendments, um, she believed it would strengthen Bill 340. In her comments in law amendments, the uh, Mayor Amanda McDougall Merrill stated, I ask for an amendment to Bill 340 that in one year of the MOU, the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing engage in meaningful consultation and fair negotiations with the CBRM to develop a separate agreement. The amendment is simple. It, is simp it simply allows the CBRM and the minister to begin negotiations on a separate agreement. The town of Truro's mayor, uh, Bill Mills, lent uh, tr uh, the town Truro support to the CBRM receiving a separate agreement. In Mayor Mills' submission, he stated, while this agreement provides financial benefits to many municipalities, some will be disadvantaged. In the case of the CBRM, the province should extend the new agreement to CBRM until such time se a separate, separate terms can be negotiated and implemented for their unique circumstances. It is important that the province negotiates fairly with the CBRM and recognizes the critical importance the regional municipalities play in the sustainability of Cape Breton as a whole, and I'll table that. The NSFM also lent their support to a separate agreement. Uh, Victoria County also stated in the in by Warden Bruce Morrison's submission to law amendments or to a letter actually sent to sent to a few of us, including the minister the uh, the minister of municipal affairs and housing, and it states we we see the integration of feedback from all 49 municipalities as key to the success of a new MOU, and as key to achieving what is the best interest of Nova Scotians. The expressed desire of our neighbors in CBRM to have a separate agreement with the province is something we can fully support. And I will table that. This amendment comes from the NSFM, the CBRM. It is supported by municipal units. To me, this amendment is a, is a simple solution to the problem that is before us in Bill 340. The issues I have with this bill are due in part to how it will affect the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, the residents of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, the, re re the residents we as CBRM MLAs represent. The government side has said no to taking education to, to taking the full scope of education and, and taking that transfer payment, the transfer payment burdens off the municipalities. The government side has said no um, for regarding Simgar's suggestion of um, all surplus schools instead put in pre-1981. The government side said no to doubling the municipal capacity grant. The minister and premier refused to accept the Simgar propo uh, propose, proposal requesting an additional $15 million. The only amendment that could at the very least negate some of the problems that the MOU of the MOU with the CBRM would be for the government to develop and implement a new funding agreement between the provincial government and the CBRM, which would reflect the uniqueness of the CBRM. This is, this is the last one that we can put, this is the last amendment we can put forward that will protect the residents of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality and protect the residents of the other municipalities that are going to lose funding. But in the case of the CBRM, we cannot raise taxes anymore than we than already have. They are overtaxed and are not receiving the comparable services of that tax. That's what this grant is for. And so this amendment is that last ditched effort to have some protections 
for my constituents, for the constituents of Sydney member two, for the constituents of um, Northside Westmount, constituents of East Bay, of, of Cape Breton East, um, the constituents of, Gla of Glace Bay Dominion, and for the residents as well as in parts of Victoria the Lakes. So with that, I ask that the, this uh, amendment be looked on favorably by the government, and I, with that, I'll take my seat. Thank you. I, rec I recognize the Honourable Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So uh, I just, just do want to make a few comments. Um, first of all, uh, I know there's been a lot said about education, and in the MOU that we are proposing, we are taking over ownership of the pre-1981 schools. Um, I will say that when we were uh, when we first started talking about the pre-1981 schools, I was surprised to learn that that's not an easy list to put together. What are the pre-1981 schools? Because when you look at who owns the pre-1981 schools, in some cases they're owned by religious groups that donated the land to the municipality for the school, and they revert back to the religious group. Or there's other groups actually in. Uh, uh, but by and large, pre-1981 schools are owned by the municipalities. The reason the pre-1981 schools are owned by the municipalities, ask yourself that question. Why do the municipalities own the pre-1981 schools? And, and the reason is that in the past, municipalities were responsible for education and funded education. That's why they own those schools. That's why they own that property. And at some point in the past, the province took over the responsibility for education. And really, it makes sense. It, the, the educational experience for a child in Yarmouth or Cape Breton should be essentially the same. The curriculum or in Indianapolis Valley, I mean, it is something that it logically should be uh, uniformity across the province. So it makes sense. But in that takeover moment, the municipalities agreed to continue to contribute some money to the cost of education and the amount that is contributed through property taxes, which originally funded 100% of education, is, is now a small fraction. So that, that, that is the reason why the pre-1981 schools uh, were the municipalities. The reality is the pre-1981 schools come with many issues, like the, well, the pre-1981 school I went to had seaweed in the wall, and uh, they our, our community lived in fear of someone burning it down. If it ever caught on fire, it would have burnt down just like that. The reason we could still continue to go to school there when I was in grade 10, 11, 12 was because like, there were a million ways out. It was a one-level school, and there were lots of exits. So it wasn't like if it did catch on fire, the odds of somebody being caught in there was very low. There were lots of ways out. Other pre-1981 schools have asbestos in them and in fact the one I was in probably had asbestos too I don't really know but so there's there's massive costs with dealing with these pre-1981 schools and uh, I know for many communities I heard one community made the comment nine years too late so they took over the pre-19 <laughs> the municipality owns the pre-1981 schools uh, and and has the burden of dealing with them so we're taking that on in terms of uh, will Will we accept this amendment? No. But will we commit to continuing to work with CBRM and working through their uh, challenges, both in the short term and the long term? Absolutely. And, and we will continue to work with all of our other municipalities on, on the, uh, you know, some of the outstanding issues of what we call Schedule A, which are some of the other issues in uh, for our municipality to recognize, and I know this will be led by the Minister of Justice, policing is a massive issue right now, uh, and, and other issues. So we're absolutely committed to working with uh, and continue to work with CBRM. This is a, this is a good deal for this current MOU. Is, the reality is it's $4.5 million to the better of either CBRM or the residents of CBRM, depending on whether it's a tax break to the residents of CBRM or a uh, uh, you know, depending on how CBRM ch chooses to use it. So it's a, it's a terrific deal for CBRM in, in that way and, and for all our municipalities. So that's all I, I want to say about that right now. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Of course, the, the, the point that the, the minister has made is, is vociferously uh, uh, countered and opposed by uh, virtually every single voice that has come to this deb debate uh, from the CBRM itself. And over the, the long course of our debate uh, about this bill to this point, I have uh, listened carefully to the uh, justifications that the um, government has offered to the uh, repeated strenuous points made by the CBRM itself uh, that the bill will have in its present form uh, a negative impact on the municipal unit which is least able to stand having uh, a, uh, a negative impact. And it has seemed to me as I've listened to the uh, the government's responses to those points, uh, an awful lot of the, uh, what the argument has been kind of, uh, well, the, the CBRM was offered this, or the CBRM said that, or the CBRM did some, done something else. And it seems to me that, that all of this is to miss the fundamental point. Um, the fundamental point is that this is a, a, a moment uh, of historic importance, the establishment uh, of a new MOU to uh, guide the financial foundations of these many municipal relations to the province of Nova Scotia. It has so many good dimensions which uh, we have uh, spoken about and which have been outlined and about which there isn't any question. But I, but I want to submit that uh, for all the work that has gone into uh, this uh, historic uh, renewal of the foundation of municipal tax uh, uh, in uh, reform in Nova Scotia, uh, for all the good things that have come out of it, if this enterprise of this bill does not address the alienation of the CBRM, the bill and the enterprise and the project is a capital F failure. Uh, um, and we know that the, the root of the alienation of the CBRM is the structural fiscal incapacity of the CBRM in the present system about which every single voice from the CBRM and many very capable ones and experienced ones have spoken about this in the course of this book. Every single voice has agreed. Uh, whether they have traveled here uh, uh, from uh, Cape Breton to say so uh, or whether they are uh, MLAs here in this house with that experience has, has said uh, that, that, that the effect is to be negative. Um, uh, and so it seems to me that this whole great enterprise which has involved so many people over such a long period of time and drawn in such expertise is on the precipice of uh, uh, becoming a, a bust. It's on, it's on the precipice of becoming a failure because the core challenge before it addressing the alienation uh, of the CBRM rooted in the CBRM structural fiscal incapacity has not been adequately met. And that's why it seems to me this amendment which the Liberal Party has put forward uh, is so extraordinarily important. Um, this bill is on a trajectory uh, to uh, make this historic municipal tax reform a failure. That trajectory can be stopped and reversed uh, and make this whole enterprise and project a uh, successful um, municipal reform project. But the path to do that is a separate MOU for the CBRM. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton East. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to have a couple of comments just to have on the record, certainly this evening. So I, I would certainly say it's, it's been a difficult few weeks uh, in Cape Breton, for sure. Uh, certainly care deeply about my community. I have a great deal of respect you know, for the CBRM, the mayor and the council, for sure. Um, I would say I'm very thankful that the minister has committed to having you know, conversations with CBRM, both for the short term and long term, uh, within the municipality. Uh, so essentially, this is a redundant amendment. Right? He's, he's already going to have the conversation with the municipality uh, for the short and long term. I would just like to add to that uh, I think this is a better deal t today than the deal they've had for the last number of years. Uh, I know there's been a disagreement of facts, certainly 
uh, with taxation and, and those sorts of things. Uh, but we can have those conversations certainly with the minister and his staff, and I have full confidence in his ability with that uh, that issue. Uh, so certainly, uh, the long-term viability of Cape Breton is certainly something that I think a lot about. Uh, so I think there's been a lot of discussion, sort of short-term, short uh, I would say, vision uh, by many kind of throughout this discussion. Uh, so I think the long-term conversation and the short-term conversation are a valuable piece uh, to moving forward. Uh, I'm very thankful for the minister's work on this file and uh, looking forward to those conversations continuing. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? Record vote. There has been a request for a recorded vote. The bells will ring until the whips are satisfied. Order. There has been a request for a recorded vote. The clerk will conduct the vote. How we vote? <laughs> Brad Johns. No. Tori Rushton. No. Barbara Adams. No. Kim Maslin. No. Tim Houston. Alan McMaster. No. Twyla Gross. No. Michelle Thompson. No. John Lore. No. Trevor Boudreau. No. Tim Hallman. No. Kent Smith. Dave Ritzy. No. Brian Wong. No. Susan Corkum Greek. No. Brian Comer. No. Colton LeBlanc. No. Jill Balzer. No. Pat Dunn. No. Greg Moreau. No. Becky Druin. No. Larry Harrison. No. John White. No. John A. McDonald. No. Keith Bain. No. Chris Palmer. Melissa Sheehy Richard. No. Danielle Barkhouse. No. Tom Taggart. No. Nolan Young. No. Steve Craig. No. Patricia Arrow. Yes. Keith Irving. Yes. Brendan McGuire. Yes. Derek Mombercat. Yes. Zach Churchill. Kelly Regan. Yes. Ian Rankin. Susan LeBlanc. Yes. Claudia Chender. Yes. Kendra Coombs. Yes. Susie Hansen. Gary Burrell. Yes. Carla McFarland. Rafa mm -hmm. DiCostanzo. Yes. Tony Ince. Laura Lee Nickel. Yes. Ben Jessam. Yes. Braden Clark. Ali Duale. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Yes. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan.
The results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 15, nays 28. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 18 carry? carry. Shall the remaining clause, clause 19 carry? carry. Shall the title carry? carry. Shall the bill carry? carry. Okay, there has been a request for a recorded vote. There has been a request for a recorded vote. Uh, the bells will ring until the lips are satisfied. There has been a request for a recorded vote. I will ask the clerk to conduct the vote. Brad Johns. Yes. Tori Rushton. Yes. Barbara Adams. Yes. Kim Maslin. Yes. Tim Houston. Alan McMaster. Yes. Twyla Gross. Yes. Michelle Thompson. Yes. John Lohr. Yes. Trevor Boudreaux. Yes. Tim Hallman. Yes. Kent Smith. Yes. Dave Ritzy. Yes. Brian Wong. Yes. Susan Corkum Greek. Yes. Brian Comer. Yes. Colton LeBlanc. We. Oui. Jill Balzer. Yes. Pat Dunn. Yes. Greg Moreau. Yes. Becky Druin. Yes. Larry Harrison. Yes. John White. Yes. John A. McDonald. Yes. Keith Bain. Yes. Chris Palmer. Melissa Sheehy Richard. Yes. Danielle Barkhouse. Yes. Tom Taggart. Yes. Nolan Young. Yes. Steve Craig. Yes. Patricia Arab. Yes. Keith Irving. Yes. Brendan McGuire. Yes. Derek Mamberkett. No. Zach Churchill. Kelly Regan. Yes. 
Ian Rankin. Susan LeBlanc. No. Claudia Chender. No. Kendra Coombs. No. Susie Hansen. Gary Burrell. No. Carla McFarland. Rafa DiCostanzo. No. Tony Ince. Laura Lee Nickel. Yes. Ben Jessam. Yes. Braden Clark. Ali Duale. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Yes. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. <laughs> Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. The results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 38, nays 6. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Gover Deputy Government House Leader. Mr. Chair, would you please call Bill Number 323, the Regulated Health Professions Act? I, I recognize the Honourable uh, Deputy Government House Leader. Home by my orders of one, two, three. I got to stop counting. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, would you please call Bill Number Three Three Nine, the Financial Measures Act? Uh, Bill Three Three Nine, the Financial Measures Act, Fall 2023 Act. I recognize the clerk. Bill 339 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Law Amendments on October 24th, 2023, without amendments, and contains ten clauses. Clause one. Shall clause one carry? Carried. Carried. Uh, clauses two to four. Shall clauses two to four carry? Carried. Carried. Clause five. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we'd like to introduce the following amendment. So, uh, CWHB NDP one. Page two, add after clause five, the following clause. Six, schedule B of chapter four is further amended by adding immediately after section 70, the following section. 70A, notwithstanding section 70, where A, the consumer price index for the province for the previous 12 month period commencing January 1st of any year exceeds 3% and B, the funded status of the pension plan exceeds 105%. The trustee shall consider providing and may provide to the beneficiaries of the pension plan a cost of living increase effective January 1st in the year following the year referred to in Clause A. 
renumber and adjust cross-references accordingly. So um, I'll just speak to this amendment briefly. You know, I think, um, you know, this is another rushed bill. This is, uh, with, uh, this is another uh, fall FMA, um, which is unusual um, and actually contains really significant um, propositions um, that um, haven't had the full benefit of the review. And so I will read um, a, a, a quote from the, from the submission from the NSGU um, regarding the, pension, the proposed pension plan changes. Um, we understand that Minister of Master stated that the public sector superannuation plan trustee, Inc., is supportive of the PSPPTA overall. We are aware that the uh, trustee, Inc., has supported the idea generally, as have our unions. However, our support was at a high-level principle and did not pertain to the specific proposals in this bill. The details of this transfer are incredibly complex, and the legislation enable, enabling them should therefore require serious and thoughtful study. This section of the FMA should not move forward until all stakeholders are able to conduct a proper review of the legislation. And I'm just going to grab uh, what else they had to say. So I think the other thing that opening this legislation um, does, it does call to attention the fact that, in fact, um, the actual value to beneficiaries has been re reduced by one-fifth um, since 2010. So in 2010, changes were introduced in the structure of the Nova Scotia pension plan that uh, um, provide for um, uh, indexing based on the current status of the plan and current economic conditions. And basically, since then, there's been uh, non-delivery of full indexation. So the unions say, and I can table this, the unions share a serious concern about the 15-year record of non-delivery of full indexation under the PSSP, um, and that PSSP pensions are not keeping up with the ever-increasing cost of living for the provincial province's retirees. And we note that the government contribution rates have not changed during this 15-year period. The unions strongly believe the situation should not continue. The plan must implement a credible strategy to begin delivery of indexation to PSSP retirees. And so this amendment that we're proposing um, works with the current structure of the pension, but proposes a, a, sort of a, a, a way to provide for cost of living increases, which we can only imagine. Um, First of all, the impact of not having any full indexation since 2010, um, but also the current, the way that the current decisions are made, people, the trustee Inc. has to sort of lock in um, for a five-year period. So this would permit um, the plan to be much more responsive to um, the actual economic conditions experienced by retirees in Nova Scotia. Um, and so with that, that's the proposal that we would like to bring forward. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Chair, I'd like to thank the member opposite for putting forward the, uh, the amendment here. Um, I just want to make a couple of points. Um, there is nothing more important for a pension plan than prudence. And when this plan, uh, when the significant changes were made to it uh, years ago, uh, and I may remind the member under an NDP government, um, those measures were put in place to protect the plan so that uh, when you're thinking about getting a pension i want to empathize with anybody who is uh, wanting to see indexation for their pension seeing the costs of living rise um, but mr chair the the reason the measures were put in place years ago for this plan they were put in place prudently, uh, with prudence in mind, and um, to, to suddenly change and, and provide indexation here on the floor of the legislature, um, I don't think that would be a responsible thing to do. Um, indexation is possible with the plan when it reaches a certain level of uh, status, funded status. and. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I, I cannot support the, the amendment put forward, 
but I want to empathize uh, with, with pensioners. Uh, but I also want to state with them that it's important for government to uh, participate in this plan, and we are participants. It's a jointly, it's a jointly uh, managed plan, uh, and the union has representation on the, on the board, um, that we want to make sure that there's a steady hand on this plan. We know there are other plans in this province um, who are not in near the shape this plan is in. They're in much worse condition. A steady hand is needed, Mr. Chair, and um, while I can appreciate the intent of the amendment and how it could help, I also want to be mindful of how um, providing, uh, drawing more resources from the pension um, can actually cause a pension uh, to be placed in a position where it can offer less benefits going forward. And I've seen that so often. Uh, and having gone through uh, moving beyond public sector pension plans, I think of the new page pension plan and how people in my area uh, took a 40% or more cut in their pensions uh, because decisions were being made that really weren't in the interests of plan members in the long run. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, just wanted to uh, uh, speak on the discussion here, and uh, I think I am standing here uh, somewhere between the middle of the NDP and the government uh, on this. I uh, agree with the Finance Minister uh, that uh, probably we should not approve this amendment. I agree with him that it is important that the, amend, that the pension remain viable for the long term. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I, th I think that is, is, is prudent uh, on behalf of, of the contributors uh, and the beneficiaries of the pension plan. However, I do want to agree with the points raised by the union documentation and my colleague is that uh, the pension currently is not being funded to support indexation. And I would uh, suggest that it is uh, important for the government and the managers of this pension to seek a way that we can get this pension uh, to a position where indexing becomes the norm rather than the exception. And I think uh, to, to have lost the uh, benefits of indexation over the last decade uh, to the beneficiaries of this pension is creating a, fur a, a further hardship, particularly in high inflation times. With 7.5% inflation last year, there are many pensioners that have just lost a significant portion of their pension. So I would encourage uh, the government uh, to sit down uh, and have a, a fulsome discussion on how we get this pension back to a position where indexation is the norm, because I think that is the intent of public service pension plan. I think that's where we all would like to take care of our pensioners and those civil servants that have served the citizens of Nova Scotia for their full career. Um, so I would uh, encourage uh, uh, the government uh, to take on that task. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Just going to pop up for a couple more minutes. I would like to say that I appreciate the minister rising and responding to the concerns um, on the floor and that were raised by the unions. Um, and I, you know, but I think uh, I think really the, maybe the minister didn't realize how much uh, he was actually supporting what I had to say. Um, in that, uh, you know, what we have before us is a is a critical piece of legislation. Pensions are critical. Um, for those who receive them, but also for the financial health of this province. Um, I was around when the, when the pension revisions were undertaken. I do understand that at that point we were also facing a crisis. And so again, I would say, you know, the response in 2010 was this model. 
But what we have found now that we're in 2023, that it's not sufficient for the current economic cli climate and for what's happening for people in terms of affordability. Um, and so it really is time to look at this, but it is a hugely complex piece of legislation. And, you know, I would just really emphasize um, how disappointing it is um, to have um, you know, anything open in terms of pensions that doesn't actually allow for uh, an, an enough uh, time to for consideration and, um, and consultation. You know, the unions in their submission note that they had less than six days to review and analyze this detailed piece. So again, this sort of irregular step of having um, a mid-year Financial Measures Act, um, again, really just makes me wonder why we're why either a the work wasn't done in time, uh, so we would see this in March and April of this past of, of this past March there in April, or why we don't actually take the time to do the work well and wait for the upcoming year. So, um, you know, you know, our our amendment is to try and make the best of a situation, but actually, overall, I think uh, the minister's comments confirm that this is not we have this this bill has not had enough time. Um, to be considered fully by all by all stakeholders. Uh, shall uh, amendment NDP one carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause five carry? Carry. Carried. Clauses six to eight carry. Carry. Carried. Clause nine. Recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I have another amendment to introduce. So, uh, CH CWHB NDP 2, page 4, clause 9, delete and substitute the following clause 9, section 12, ZB of chapter 31, as enacted by chapter 3 of the Acts of 2013 is amended by adding immediately after subsection 1 the following subsection 1a. In subsection 1, amend means to make a change to the parts referred to, to in that subsection that would in any way reduce the rebates provided under those parts. And so, you know, this, this, uh, this FMA fall 2023 that we've been presented with um, does mash together a few different issues, and this is one of them. And so it's removing a provision uh, that would require a provincial referendum and the approval, thus, of the majority of Nova Scotians before the provincial portion of the HST can be added back to things like home energy, children's diapers, children's clothing, children's footwear, books, feminine hygiene products, first-time home purchases, new vehicles for, the physically, for, for folks with disabilities, computers for folks with disabilities, firefighting equipment used by municipalities and volunteer fire departments. And so again, since we received this bill, well, the day it was being introduced, um, and there's been so little time to, ha to hear from the minister and to have consultation on this, um, you know, I think we know we're, we're concerned um, about why this is being targeted. Certainly, I can't imagine during this uh, time of affordability crisis that the, you know, this would be removed so that the HST can be added back to these essential goods. Um, and uh, but that leaves the question: Why, in fact, is this proposal coming forward? Um, we haven't had a chance to have those discussions, um, and uh, so we think that our amendment actually. Uh, provides, I think, a little more flexibility in the bill, but does not remove um, the requirements, sorry, I almost used a prop there, um, for uh, for referendum for the HST to go back on these really essential core goods. Um, so again, I, I mean, I'd invite the minister to rise and talk about the rationale for this particular portion of this bill, um, but our amendment seeks to, uh, I guess, reinforce and solidify for Nova Scotians our commitment to making sure that we're not making uh, life's essentials more expensive. Mm -hmm. Shall amendment NDP 2 carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 9 carry? Carried. Carried. Shall the remaining clause, clause 10, carry? Carried. Carried. Shall the schedule, the private sector pension plan transfer act, carry? Carried. Carried. Shall the title carry? Carried. 
Carry. Shall the carried. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable uh, Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 323, the Regulated Health Professions Act? Um, uh, Bill 323, the Regulated Health Professionals Act. Uh, we will resume having carried clause 63. Right. Shall the remaining clauses oh. so? Uh, shall the remaining clauses uh, 64 to 241 carry? Carry. Carried. Shall the title carry? Carry. Carried. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Carried. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that you now rise and report progress on these bills. That motion carries. Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills reports, uh, recognize the clerk. That the Committee of the Whole House on Bills has met and considered the following bills. Bills 339, 340, 348, 351, and 369 without amendments. 
and Bill 323 with certain amendments. And the Chair has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favourable consideration of the House. Order that these bills be read again a third time and a future date. I recognize the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call government bills for third reading? Government bills for third reading. Would you please call bill number 321, Conseil Scalaire Acadian Provincial Act? Bill 321, Conseil Acadian Act. Oh. I reckon. <laughs> Conseil Scolaire Acadiem Provincial Act. I recognize the uh, Honourable Minister for uh, Education and Childhood Development. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. I move that Bill 321 now be read a third time and do pass. So I'm pleased to stand here today to briefly reiterate the importance of the Conseil Scolaire Acadiem Provincial Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by thanking my colleagues across the floor for their support of this legislation. The leader of the official opposition noted that they were pleased to see this bill being introduced. It speaks strongly to the merits of the legislation and our strong partnership between CSAP, Acadian Affairs and Francophonie, and the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development. Mr. Speaker, many of us in this chamber have Acadian or Francophone communities in our constituencies. We all know how important it is to our French-speaking constituents to have French first language schools that preserve and promote this vibrant culture. I was honoured to be able to introduce this piece of legislation, the first piece of legislation I've introduced as Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. The goal of the Act is simple, to support the achievement, well-being and success of Acadian and Francophone students in Nova Scotia by providing a world-class education and ensuring children see themselves and their culture reflected in their schools. Mr. Speaker, in 2018, this legislation was promised by the previous government. When I became Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development in 2021, no movement on this commitment had yet been made, despite the hard work of the Department and the passionate advocacy of the CSAP. Valuing the Acadian and Francophone culture and language, it was a priority of mine to build a constructive and collaborative relationship with CSAP as an important educational partner. CSAP showed a willingness to engage and work together, and this act is the result of the collaborative efforts of CSAP and our Department of Education and Early Childhood Development under the direction of our government. I want to re reiterate my appreciation to both Marcel Cotreau, the former board chair of CSAP, and Michelle Collette, the superintendent of CSAP, who have been very vocal about their support of this act. Marcel recently finished serving his term as board chair, and I want to thank him for his support and his collaboration. I look forward to working with Diane Reset, the new board chair this year. Marcel and Michelle joined me in the House when I first introduced the bill, and more recently they attended at law amendments to show their support of the bill. Within this legislation, we have clarified the roles and responsibilities of the CSAP board and removed duplication in existing education legislation. This act reaffirms the current duties and powers of the CSAP and ensures consultation on policies and regulations related to French first language education, empowering the voices, the voices of Acadian and Francophone communities. The act also includes a memorandum of understanding between myself, the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development, and the CSAP. As I shared in my second reading, the MOU signifies our shared commitment to collaboration in responding to the needs of Nova Scotia's Acadian and Francophone students and their families. And we will be hiring a director of French First Language within the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development to support this important work. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to address a few questions that were raised about the bill. First off, the Conseil Scolaire Acadien Provincial Act and the Education Act work together. They are complementary. CSAP will continue to deliver the provincial curriculum and be guided by important policies like the Provincial School Code of Conduct and the Inclusive Education Policy, while continuing to promote the Acadian and Francophone culture and language. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm proud that Nova Scotia will be the first jurisdiction in Canada to have a dedicated French First Language Education Act. This is about recognizing the role CSAP plays in upholding minority language rights and our government's unwavering commitment to preserve and promote the French language in Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the CSAP, the Minister of Acadian Affairs and Francophonie, Nova Scotia's Acadian and Francophone communities, and members opposite for their support of this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to hearing closing remarks from other members. I recognize the honor honourable member for Clare. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Va dire quelques mots en français par pensée appropriée que je suis en fait discuter la loi 321, la loi sur le conseil scolaire acadien provincial. Euh, J'aimerais dire que nous sommes en support de la loi. Euh, je suis content de voir que le ministre l'a introduit. Euh, J'aimerais prendre cette occasion aussi pour reconnaître le travail du CSAP, surtout Michel Collette, le, le, le directeur général, et Marcel Cottrell, le président du CSAP. Et, et j'aimerais aussi de reconnaître le travail qui a été fait auparavant avec euh, Kenneth Goddard, qui était le président du CSAP pour plusieurs années, et euh, Michel, Michel Comeau, le, le euh, directeur général, qui a fait beaucoup de travail euh, sur, sur cette loi ici. Certainement, c'est une bonne loi, euh, c'est le premier au pays, et c'est pour la communauté acadienne et francophone de Nouvelle-Écosse, c'est certainement à quoi être fier. Uh, ça va renforcer la langue et la culture acadienne et uh, je, comme je dis, je suis certainement en faveur. Um, I'll just uh, try to re repeat that as much as I can in English. I stand, uh, I'm happy to stand in support of Bill 321, uh, the Co uh, Conseil Scolaire Acadien Provincial Act. And certainly it's an important act for the Acadian and Francophone communities across the province. As is, I was mentioned, it was the first in uh, the country, and I think we have to recognize that. I also want to thank the hard work of the CSAP, uh, especially Michel Collette, the Director General, and uh, Marcel Castro, the President of the CSAP. But I also think it's important to recognize the work of the last few years when uh, Kenneth Gada who was a strong advocate for the, the Acadian and French communities in this, this province, who was president of the CSAP, and um, Michel Comeau, the former uh, director general, that did a lot of work um, to, to try to fight for this bill. So again, I, I want to recognize their role in this. It's been, uh, I mean, many, many years of uh, advocating on their behalf. Um, it will. I believe have an impact on protecting and promoting the French language in our, our communities. The CSAP plays a, a big role in, in preserving our language and our culture. Um, um, I don't want to talk too long about the impacts it, it does have, but we've seen you know, how our communities, and especially the youth, uh, prior to the CSAP and the introduction of CSAP schools, and now we see, you know, many many students going, you know, taking an extra step and going to university in France, Moncton, or, or University Saint Anne. Um, I guess the the three points or pillars that the CSAP was looking for when I, uh, you know, we worked uh, in, in advocating and, and we did put a bill forward. Uh, the three pillars of that bill was essentially uh, a, a separate and independent law, um, that it would be charter compliant and it would give the ability to, for the CSAP to govern themselves uh, with a little bit more control. So. This act, and I did speak to a number of elected members of the CSAP, it is a good base, a good solid uh, law that they feel they can continue to work on and try to build as, as you always do. You try to improve and you try to build. So the only concerns, and uh, you know, I hope they don't, they don't re be, uh, become a realization, is that a lot, a lot will be in, uh, in policy 
in regulations rather than in the bill itself. But um, I mean, that's always a concern with most any bill when you have to, you know, trust that some of those regulations and policies will be in place uh, with uh, put in place with the appropriate consultation. So, so again, I, I do. Uh, we do support this bill. I think it, it is a good bill for the Acadian and Francophone communities. And I want to congratulate again the CSAP and everybody who, who did work on that. So uh, with that, I'll take my seat. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ça me donne énorme de plaisir de me lever afin de donner l'appui de notre caucus pour ce projet de loi. Uh, il faut, comme mes collègues ont mentionné déjà, il faut absolument commencer par reconnaître que le, le rôle primordial de la communauté dans cette affaire. Donc, uh, c'est toujours le cas avec la question de la langue et de la culture acadienne et francophone en la nouvelle classe. Chaque pas en avance, chaque projet de loi, ça, ça cause de l'engagement uh, uh, de la communauté, ça à cause de les affaires pendant plusieurs des, des années. Donc, il s'agit des de décennies. Et pendant l'année prochaine, il y a quelques uh, uh, moments importants pour la communauté acadienne et francophone en la Nouvelle-Écosse. Donc, on a l'éducation en tant que base, mais après ça, on s'attend que le gouvernement dépose un projet de loi sur la livraison des services en français, ainsi qu'on va accueillir bientôt tout le monde pour le congrès acadien. Donc, uh, so I will just do a quick translation and then continue. So, I just wanted to say that it's, it's uh, I'm happy to support this on behalf of our caucus. Um, as other colleagues have noted, um, so much of this work is, is as the result of the of community efforts. So every, every project, every bill, every step ahead in terms of uh, language and culture of the Acadian and Francophone communities is because community is there to build that and to work on that. Um, and, you know, I think it is significant that we have this um, bill with, on education, which is the base. Uh, we understand that there'll be another bill brought forward on the delivery of French language services, and then, of course, the Congrès Mondial des Acadiens that's coming next summer. So it's an important year. This is an important base. Um, I think it's an important step. To, we, you know, we have a commitment to growing our francophone population. We have a commitment and a plan around francophone immigration. Um, and education and having access to schools is so important. So I, I'm part of the Francophone de Halifax like Facebook group or whatever. And so many times people drop in there to say, I found this group. We're moving from France. We're moving from Quebec. We're we are, or we're a Francophone family from wherever. And but we need to know what like what schools where where can our kids go to school. And immediately the community responds and says, well, no, like, it's okay because we have the CESAPE. And so I think this is a really important piece to, to build on. Um, you know, I think I would echo uh, my colleagues' notes about concerns about leaving so much to regulation. Um, that's certainly not in the spirit of making transparent and accountable lawmaking um, and it is always a concern when things when the actual implementation is left to regulation um, and then I think the other thing that I really want to emphasize is you know as I said like and as we've all recognized you know this happens because of the work of people and communities and uh, you know having this incredible resource reflects what happens when community um, is engaged in education. And so this, this government was elected with a commitment to restore school boards. Um, we haven't heard anything about that. There's been a revised commitment, uh, uh, some walk back to some sort of community structure, but we still don't hear anything about that. I think that if we support this bill and we support this structure, and we all recognize what makes it good and special, then we need to support and consider how we welcome community into all of our education system. Thank you. 
I recognize the Honourable Minister for Acadian Affairs and Francophonie. Um, merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm really pleased and honoured to be able to provide a, a few comments uh, en anglais et en français, in English and in French. En français, yeah. <laughs> Let's see what the answer, how trans answer transcribes that one. En français, yeah. Uh, Bill 321, the Conseil scolaire acadien provincial act, la loi sur le Conseil scolaire acadien provincial. Uh, Madame la Présidente, la communauté acadienne et, et francophone de notre province est en pleine croissance. Our Acadian and francophone community here in Nova Scotia is, is growing. Uh, and with that growth certainly comes uh, some challenges, but more so opportunities. And, and as a government, we recognize those, those, those opportunities. We recognize, of course, also the importance of, of supporting our Acadian and francophone uh, community, and that's why you know, I note a couple examples that um, our government has has initiated and supported. You know, my the honourable my honourable colleague, the Minister of Labour, Skills and Immigration, and I had the opportunity last November, I think perhaps to this day, uh, to present our government's uh, francophone action plan on immigration. Il y a environ un an, Madame la Présidente, que moi et la ministre du Travail, des Compétences et de l'Immigration ont l'occasion de présenter notre plan d'action sur l'immigration francophone. Alors, c'est ça, ça une des initiatives, je note vraiment euh, euh, visée sur le système d'éducation, l'engagement de notre gouvernement pour appuyer une nouvelle école euh, acadienne, une nouvelle école du CSOP dans la région acadienne de Torbay, euh, un moment historique pour cette région qui vient d'être reconnue il n'y a pas si longtemps que ça comme une nouvelle région euh, acadienne en Nouvelle-Écosse. Madam Speaker, I, I also note our government's commitment to supporting a new francophone school, a new school for the Conseil scolaire Acadia Provincial uh, in the new, newest Acadian region of Torbay, uh, a, a historic uh, moment for that, for that region uh, that's been a long time coming, because we recognize that the language is the foundation of our culture. La langue est la, est la fondation de notre culture. Si on parle notre langue, on est sur la mauvaise voie qu'on va certainement perdre notre culture. Uh, L'autre engagement qu'on qu a fait comme gouvernement, comme euh, ma collègue a mentionné, c'est certainement accueillir le monde, le monde acadien, le monde francophone l'année prochaine. Uh, we will be welcoming uh, next year, Madam Speaker, thousands, tens of thousands of Acadians and francophones from around the world uh, for the Congrès mondial acadien uh, in my constituency of Argyle and, and in Clare as well. And as a government, we've, we've supported that uh, world-class uh, event with uh, $2.5 million. We're very excited to be able to showcase uh, the birthplace of Acadie, uh, le berceau de l'Acadie, right here. And, uh, and hopefully uh, um, we look at also the, the opportunities uh, in the future um, for the Acadian and, and, and Francophone community. Uh, and finally, uh, Madame la Présidente, I note also uh, an announcement recent that is a demand of the community. Um, au mois d'août, le Premier ministre et, euh, et moi ont eu l'occasion de, de proclamer, de faire la déclaration que le mois d'août, commence en 2024, sera maintenant connu comme euh, le mois du patrimoine acadien. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, uh, in last August, uh, actually it was August 15th, National Acadian Day, the Premier and I had the opportunity in my constituency to proclaim that starting in 2024, in August of 2024, that uh, August will now be known as Acadian Heritage Month. So symbolic for a number of reasons, because National Acadian Day already takes place in August, but also uh, the significance that we'll be, we'll be welcoming tens of thousands uh, from around the world to, um, to Nova Scotia next year for the Congrès. Um, Madame la Présidente, nous avons plusieurs communautés acadiennes et francophones ici dans la province de ma circonscription d'Argal, um, dans le sud-ouest de la Nouvelle-Écosse, à Chétican, um, et comme j'ai même mentionné, uh, à, à Torbay. Um, ce projet de loi que la ministre de l'Éducation et de la petite, du développement de la petite enfance a, a présenté dans cette chambre um, marque un moment historique, un moment historique ici en Nouvelle-Écosse, un moment historique pour uh, le pays uh, qui va certainement appuyer uh, la qualité de langue et l'enseignement du français de langue primaire ici en Nouvelle-Écosse pour les étudiants, les enseignants euh, et puis certainement nos communautés acadiennes. Euh, 
Madame la Présidente, ce, ce projet de loi a des répercussions positives et durables sur l'avenir des étudiants. Euh, J'ose dire, à la section 23 de la Charte des libertés et des droits du Canada reconnaît l'importance pour s'assurer que les, nos enfants aient l'accès euh, en, euh, en éducation de langue euh, minoritaire partout à travers le Canada. Uh, Madam Speaker, Section 23 of our Char Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, mm -hmm. recognizes the significance of ensuring that our children have access to education in minority linguistic communities across Canada. Um, I don't want to repeat what my colleague, uh, the Minister of Education, has noted, but certainly this uh, project law respects the role of the CSAP uh, to ensure that it will à l'enseignement de la langue française ici en Nouvelle-Écosse. Euh, Madame la Présidente, en terminant, j'aimerais vraiment souligner et reconnaître le, traba le travail de collaboration. Le travail de collaboration qui a vraiment pu mener à cette réalisation aujourd'hui entre euh, mon équipe à l'Office des affaires acadiennes et de la francophonie, en l'équipe euh, de la ministre euh, au ministère de l'Éducation et de la petite enfance, euh, l'équipe euh, du Conseil scolaire acadien provincial, je note euh, Marcel Cotreau et ainsi que Michel Collette. Et, et certainement, je remercie euh, Marcel pour tout, pour tout son travail et lui souhaite du bon succès dans son avenir. Et, et, et félicite publiquement euh, Diane Rasset, la nouvelle euh, présidente du CSAP, ainsi que Claude Yevillard, le nouveau vice-président, qui est de, euh, un représentant du CSAP dans mon coin. Euh, so, Madam Speaker, um, I remember what I said there, just in French, I'll, I'll repeat quickly. Um, I just want to acknowledge and really recognize the, the collaborative uh, efforts that have been put into this piece of work, into this piece of legislation. Um, it's been a long time coming, um, but truly um, what we are debating and what we'll be passing this evening is the result of a lot of collaboration between the CACP. So I want to recognize Marcel Cotreau and Michel Collette. Uh, Marcel, um, no longer the president uh, of the CACP, not the CACP, but now Diane Rasset from uh, the South Shore area, and uh, of course Clyde Deviller, who is the new vice president from from my uh, from my neck of the woods. So I want to congratulate them, as well as uh, Michelle Collette, and of course the staff at Acadian Affairs and Francophonie, and the minister staff at Education and Early Childhood Development. So, um, encore une fois, Madame la Présidente, uh, je peux pas souligner assez uh, l'importance de ce projet de loi uh, pour assurer de la protection des droits linguistiques des francophones ici dans notre province. Très fier de pouvoir participer dans cette étape mar très marquante pour notre population acadienne et francophone. Et de là, je vous remercie beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. If I am to recognize the Honourable Minister of Education, it will be to close debate on third reading. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And as I rise to move closing third reading on this bill, I just uh, I do want to comment. Um, members opposite observed that um, this kind of um, legislation happens because of the work of communities, and it happens because of the advocacy of the CSAP. And I I, I couldn't agree more with that. But I think it's also um, important to point out that those two things are alone are not sufficient. You also need a government who is willing to collaborate in good faith with communities and with organizations. Madam Speaker, we are that government. And so with that being said, I move to close third reading on Bill 321, an act respecting the Conseil scolaire acadien provincial. The motion is to close debate on third reading, Bill number 321, Conseil scolaire acadien provincial act. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary-minded nay? The motion is carried. Bill 321, an act respecting the Conseil scolaire acadien provincial. Loi concernant le Conseil scolaire acadien provincial. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. I recognize the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, would you please call Bill 322, Opioid Damages and Healthcare Costs Recovery Act, an act to amend. 
Bill number 322, Opiate Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act. I now recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Speaker, I rise today on third reading of amendments to Bill 322, Opioid Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery. Speaker, the proposed changes are being made so that we can hold opioid companies accountable for the impacts and damages caused by their actions. As one of the members opposite said, these damaging impacts have and continue to be felt broadly in our society by people struggling with addictions to opioids, by their families and their friends, and by communities all across our province. Speaker, these impacts are deep, far-reaching, heartbreaking, and often tragic. Many Nova Scotians have experienced the impacts of the opioid crisis firsthand. Whether they are dealing with a substance use issue themselves, they know someone who is or has had their lives impacted by it, or they work in a profession that helps and respond to people struggling with these issues. Hundreds of people in our province are dealing with opioid use disorder and dozens die each year from overdose. All genders, all races, people across all socioeconomic status, opioid addiction does not discriminate. 35 Nova Scotians have died this year alone due to opioid overdose. Speaker, these people are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, children, spouses, and friends. Their tragic and preventable death is something that these families will never fully recover from. We are making these amendments to help protect Nova Scotians and prevent other families from having to experience this loss. With these amendments, we can try to recover past and future health care costs due to opioid-related diseases, injuries, and illnesses. And we can hold opioid manufacturers, distributors, and their consultants accountable for their deceptive practices, practices that have directly contributed to opioid addiction and overdose in Nova Scotia and across Canada. Speaker, British, uh, British Columbia is leading this lawsuit against more than 40 opioid manuf manufacturers and distributors on behalf of all jurisdictions in Canada, including Nova Scotia. Amendments to this legislation will allow Nova Scotia to support the class action process. They will make consultants subject to potential legal action and align definitions and formulas in our legislation with those in other provinces and territories. By working with other provinces and territories, we are helping to address a significant health issue that affects our province and country and ultimately improve the health outcomes of Nova Scotians. In closing, Speaker, I want to thank the members opposite for their support for these amendments and for the many Nova Scotians who are and who have been impacted by opioid addiction. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I do want to say that uh, this caucus does support uh, the, um, the Act to amend Chapter, Forks, uh, Chapter 4 of the Acts of 2020, the Opioid Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act. Uh, I do just want to note that there were some people who seemed to be under the impression that this was delaying treatment of people who have um, issues with opioids or delaying um, a settlement. And I just want to be really clear that this bill has effect on and after March 10th, 2020. So although we are making changes here, this, will, this bill is already in effect, number one. And the changes we're making it here, making here today, will enable Nova Scotia to join a class action across the country, being led by British Columbia. These these amendments were requested or suggested by British Columbia, and we support them. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Atlantic. I'm just going to be really quick on this one. I just want to say that uh, I wholeheartedly support this bill and what, what is happening here today. Uh, I've lost friends and family members uh, to addiction. Uh, I've had friends and family members and community members that have gone to jail. Uh, and served and continue to serve time because of opiate addiction and what I would say to the minister is I hope you take them for every red cent they have and I hope they burn in hell. Thank you, Minister. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. 
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, <clears throat> we obviously support this bill, um, but I also think it's an important opportunity to um, consider together sort of what else we can be doing to respond to the poison drug crisis and to the opioid crisis in our province. So since we have been sitting, there have been a number of reported overdoses amongst young people in HRM, with at least one fatal overdose in Cole Harbour. And I also hold my friend Adam Richardson in my heart when I think about these issues. I've spoken about Adam before in this house. Adam was failed by our health system, by our mental health system, and our education system. And he died of an accidental overdose before he turned 15. <coughs> he was also my neighbor and friend, a scooter expert, a daring snowboarder, and he was very, very smart. And so I think we need to hold these young people with us as we consider you know, where we are with this crisis in Nova Scotia. So uh, in 2022, um, we had an official number of 62 is the number of deaths from opioid overdoses in Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia he NS Health is, is reporting 35 deaths to date, to date. However, many health professionals and community service providers feel that this is an underestimate because the deaths are, are determined to be of, of different causes. Um, and as others have spoken, obviously the cost of opioids is not only measured in deaths, but in uh, other struggles. And so I think there are some, some things that we're doing well in this province in terms of our naloxone program. Um, and, but I also think, you know, we need, um, we need increased support for more safe consumption sites. Um, again, the evidence is there. Safe consumption sites avoid people using alone. You can provide testing kits, clean gear. Uh, obviously, you can respond in the case of overdose. And it also allows people to connect to other services. So um, I actually spent some time as a volunteer doing the needle exchange program at the Lower East Side Harm Reduction Center in New York City. And what I can tell you is that if people have a job and a place to live, um, that actually using opioids doesn't always have a, a particularly negative effect on their lives, and that people can be quite functional employees, parents, spouses, um, but they can't do that if they're not if they're not well supported. And so, being able to connect with the community is really important. Um, I think, you know, uh, we really need to think about our commitment to harm reduction in this area. So, you know, Nova Scotia does have a commitment to harm reduction, harm reduction principles um, in, uh, in substance use issues. Um, and, but I think we all need to consider, you know, how we can reaffirm that in, in the different programs that we offer um, and, and how we consider this issue going forward. Um, I think, you know, a couple of areas where we could really learn from harm reduction principles and enhance our work um, is definitely the engagement of folks with lived and living experience um, in the policies and programs that we develop. Um, I think it's also important um, to take harm reduction at, into consideration when we think about the evolving substance use trends in Nova Scotia. So, um, and I'm sorry, I don't have this right here to table, but I will table it before the end of the night, perhaps, if I can get the, the, thing, the story printed. Um, but you know, I mean, Halifax actually had the highest uh, proportional usage of, of cocaine tested in our wastewater um, over the summer of, of any Canadian city that was getting tested. Um, and we're seeing more and more deaths linked to stimulants. And so, you know, these principles that we have around substance use, um, including the principles embodied in this bill, we need to be able to turn them towards the, the evolution of what we see coming. Um, and, you know, I think we also really want to talk about safe supply. So, uh, you know, the principles around safe supply are, are obviously to make sure that we get uh, uh, substances out of the hands of illegal elements um, and that folks are, are able to know what they are doing uh, when they choose to use substances. Um, we have some, some good, we have a good start on testing in Nova Scotia, so we do have fentanyl strips available. And again, these are the types of things that people will find at a supervised consumption site, but you know, those are things that we can have in our MLA offices, for instance. We can make sure our libraries have them. Um, and I also know that we're looking at building on a model from BC 
and again, I'll table this uh, article uh, before the end of the night as well, um, that would expand our ability actually to test substances. So it wouldn't just be about fentanyl, it would be about looking at things like tainted uh, cocaine and other substances. And again, this is the evolution, this poly substance use, um, you know, greater use of stimulants. We need to be ready to respond uh, with respect and with care across different types of substance use. So I think we need to be thinking about that. Um, I mentioned the Loxone kits, which has also been a great Nova Scotia success rate. Again, I hope everyone has them. I hope you have them in your constituency office. I hope your kids have them in their backpacks when they go to school. I hope that you have them in your car, although you can't leave them in the car because of extreme temperatures, but you get the idea. Like, however you travel, take care of them and get pick up new ones every year so that uh, your kits are current. Um, and then I think just thinking about the social determinants of health. So. Um, it's very hard uh, to seek uh, treatment for substance use issues um, when you don't have a, a safe home, when you don't have a home, um, when uh, the child welfare system ha has let you down, but when you're facing a number of these issues. And so I think, you know, we're not actually, like this is, this bill is, you know, a, a great sort of law and order uh, approach to things, but actually change uh, comes with addressing the social determinants of health. And like I said, uh, I've certainly seen over the years, um, and, and, you know, and I've done a lot of work with Stepping Stone as well, where folks can use substances and be um, and be okay when they have all the other parts of their life um, in ways that are safe and respectful. So. Those are some of the things that we just wanted to put on the table about this issue. There, there is a lot more that we need to do. And I think as well, um, you know, if you look at the proportion of opioid deaths um, across Canada, we actually have been relatively isolated from a lot of the poison drug supply. So actually, um, uh, you know, this is actually a problem that's just gonna grow. So we need to be thinking about it and responding to it um, uh, in ways that are effective and rights-based and based on harm reduction principles. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I don't often take the time to, to stand up and, and share my thoughts and feelings. Uh, there have been probably five or six times since I've been here that, that I really wanted to get up and say something, and I just couldn't pull the trigger, couldn't get up and say it for one, one reason or another. Um, when it comes to this bill, I felt like I really had to just share a little bit of, of the story and the impact and, and how much I, I support the work that we're doing to, to bring this legislation forward. Some members here would remember um, last summer during our emergency session, I, I did a member statement on my sister who had just passed away. So my 46-year-old sister passed away on June 22nd last year, and I told the host that she passed away from uh, Crohn's disease and chronic illness, which is true. But the crux of the issue and the, the real story behind her death was years and years of opioid addiction. She, she fought it for a long time, and it was incredibly, incredibly challenging on our family and, of course, her. She lost everything that she had in life. She lost her friends, she lost family, she lost everything. And ultimately, it, it took her life. So I won't go on and on and on, and I, I don't want to stand here and, and be emotional, but I do want to make sure that I took the time to stand here and say, I'm so proud of this minister, and I'm so proud of this government for bringing this legislation forward that can take these opioid manufacturers to task, and hopefully other families will get some, at least some restitution at the end of the day. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Shelburne. Yeah, just a couple of short words to add to the uh, the conversation. Uh, remember, going back to the your ma the maiden speeches here, um, Madam Speaker, um, thinking about the, you know the opioid issue and stuff to the province. And I just wanted to say that uh, 
You know, it's, it's a drug that doesn't discriminate. Uh, you know, it, it does not at all wealth, like anything. And uh, thinking of the people that I lost um, that were close to me, that, that went down the path and stuff. So I just want to be on the record that saying that I'm really proud to support this bill. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Public Works. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I was not going to rise tonight either, so I really just have been scribbling a couple notes down here. But I, I think it's really important um, for me to rise here tonight because um, I am the mother of a beautiful daughter, uh, athletic, brilliant, intelligent, kind, genuine, and innocent. And when the member from Shelburne says opioids does not discriminate, he's right. We're not a wealthy family, but we're a good family. And the day that I found out that my daughter was addicted to opioids, I was floored. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe that it would actually happen to us. I'm the mother who knows what it's like to lay awake at night and know that she's not in her bed. Where is she? I'm the mother who would get up in the middle of the night, 4 a.m., rainstorms, snowstorms, get in my car by myself, driving back dirt roads, driving to houses where I thought she might be, wondering when I went around the turn, what was I going to find? Every night, there was not a night that went by that I didn't think this is probably going to be the night that I'm going to lose her. And it didn't matter how much I tried and she tried, they had her. The monsters and opioids had her. I know what it's like to look in my daughter's eyes and there's nothing. There is nothing there. And I know what it's like because I was the mother who laid on my daughter's bedroom floor on her little body when she finally made the decision, enough's enough, mom, I'm not doing this anymore. And she laid on that floor and withdrew. And I will never forget that night, watching her body, you know, literally almost convulsing as this unbelievable, powerful drugs were coming out of her system. But she is now the person, she's now the daughter of a mother who is so friggin' proud. Because she made the decision, she made the decision herself to go to that hospital, to sit in that waiting room for 13 hours because she was not gonna leave till someone helped her. And thank the God above for Andy Blackader in the opioid replacement clinic at Queen's General, because if it was not for them, I would not have this beautiful, kind, gentle, very smart, brilliant girl who I absolutely adore. I cannot imagine my life without her. To the Minister of Health, thank you, thank you, thank you. From a mother who has been through hell, and I echo the comments of my colleague across. I hope they all burn in hell. If I am to, oh, I am so, so, so very sorry. I recognize the honorable member for Glace Bay Dominion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I may wish that you did miss me when I'm done. <laughs> So, <clears throat> coming from a community that is destroyed, <clears throat> devastated by drug overdoses and, and addictions, uh, I'm not immune to that. Uh, growing up in junior high school, my, my best friends, I'm the only one that survived. And I, I think I carry a lot of uh, survivor's guilt over that. My best friend died in Vancouver after his drug addiction led to selling drugs, and he was shot death nine top nine shots. Uh, he was my best friend growing up, and his cousins both died. My my best another one of our friends died of IV drug use. So 
I know many of you know of the story of Cotton Land, the movie that was shot in Glace Bay. And it was, it, was, it was real. It devastated our community, and it continues to today. It really does. A lot of people that, that have come by, that, that have beat the addiction, are still, their lives are still not the same, uh, not, not great. They're, as a member from Queens has talked about, the addiction goes on. It's a beast. It continues. Um, as the member from Eastern Shore had mentioned. So none of us, I, I believe our lives are like a river leading to an ocean and everything you do along the way, you, you change, it changes who you are. And, and seeing that when I was growing up and the water being dirty kind of thing, thinking like that, and it, it becomes part of who you are, it normalizes it, it, it really does. Um, but it changes you as well because when you come to, same analogy, if you come to a, a dam in a river, it almost filters the water as it goes through. And you come out on the other side, a different person. So, <clears throat> so I was saved <laughs> as a kid by, by people in the community and I love my girlfriend, Ty, my wife today. <clears throat> but thinking I got away, and I, I, I did until July 28th, 2005, <laughs> when I was hit by a guy drinking and driving, my wife with me. And of course, when you have injuries, the first thing to do is pres prescribe medication. And uh, at one point, I was taking. Know, 10 or so perks sets a day, I guess. Probably 15 tunnel threes. I was, I was in my own world. I rubbed my face, felt like somebody else's face. It was, nothing around me mattered to me. Uh, it changed who I am. If I call that the, uh, the dam in the river, then so be it. When I came out the other side, it took, I don't know, probably seven years, I think and the strength of an amazing woman who stood by me the whole way. When I finally told my doctor I didn't want any more, I remember laying in bed in a fetal position and I didn't know if I was gonna see the morning. I can remember hearing my eyes move like hydraulic pressure and my eyes just swishing back and forth although my eyes were closed. I remember hearing my fingers move like hydraulic pistons. It was an awful feeling. I remember, I didn't know if I wanted to throw up or, or just shoot myself, I don't know. Anyway, it, it changes. It changes who you are. And you guys in this house, you folks in this house, see me on my good days and my bad days. And it is what it is. I make no apologies for who I am. It is what it is. Um, I, I come from a place of doing the best I can to try and prevent those things from other people, to try and help people. Uh, I know, as the member across the floor mentioned, the locks on kits. I tried to bring them in Glace Bay High, and I wasn't allowed. I was the only one in school with one. My youth group had them. We were all trained on it. It's an amazing tool to have. My daughter saved a person's life here on Godgen Street in January with, with naloxone. She's a pharmacist. She knew what she was doing with it. But as I said, if I go back to the analogy of a river, we gather, we walked in here today at each other's throat. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but, but fighting with each other and sitting in his house till midnight. Uh, I, I was saying to my caucus that I, I think it was good for us to spend time together. But nonetheless, it wasn't good in this house. We all know that. And, and we walked in here today different than we are walking out tonight. Listen to the stories. We're passing around a box of Kleenex. Not a prop, it's a box of Kleenex. <laughs> it is what it is. But, but we are different because we share and because we realize we're all human. And this piece of legislation we're passing is, is a game changer. 
Ironically enough, the minister was one of the ones that told me to stop taking pills because we were doing a master's in counseling together. And it was ironic, but here she is, saved my life again, I guess. <laughs> but I, I really think that when we come to work, we, we come in here and our interactions with each other change. It changes who we are. And that's why I didn't mind being out with, with our staff last couple of nights with our caucus because I was hearing their stories and who they are and what they're here for and what makes them good and bad and all the ugly and everything that is being human. Our rivers collide each and every day coming in here and we can walk out different. We do, we walk out changed. Sometimes it's turbulent, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it puddles, sometimes it pools. We do that and here we are today uniting like Niagara Falls, look at, the, look at what we can do when we unite. Just look at what we can do, all these little rivers, you know. I do, I do want to say this before I sit down. I, I, I can't say much more because I'm going to make a mess of myself. I do want to say there are a lot of people in Glace Bay and Dominion and across the province who are still struggling. And I want them to know that I will do everything I can to help each and every one of them. If it means contact me in the middle of the night, I have no problem with that. That's why I took the training I took, so I could help those in need. I, I have a caring heart, believe it or not. <laughs> I do. But, I, but I do want people to know that I will help a total stranger, I'll help anybody. I, I realize my story is different than anybody else's. I don't know what they're going through. We never know what each other are, are going through. You think you walk the same road, it's not the same road because all of the twists and turns and dams that we've crossed and passed in the past are how we make sense of the present situation. And that is how we survive, it's how we live, it's how we make sense of what we in front of us. So with that, with that, I'll sit down. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs>
it changes the perspective. And we all have our own time and challenges, but I encourage members of this House, uh, we need to look eye to eye sometimes and look the human side rather than the politics. My message for this House and the public is, you're not alone. And we do the best when we're united. And I'll take my seat, Madam Speaker. If I am to recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness, it will be to close debate on third reading. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do want to thank my colleagues for sharing their personal stories uh, and their experiences, and to thank uh, everyone here for their compassion, not only for each other, but for our loved ones in our communities. And I do want to acknowledge the work that's happening um, in the Office of Addictions and Mental Health under uh, the member from Cape Breton East, uh, our Minister of Addictions and, and Mental Health. And I know his commitment and certainly the Premier's commitment to um, really making a difference in terms of access to universal mental health care, as well as other uh, treatment programs and options and improving access across the province is essential as we move forward. And I do want to say, I always want to give a shout out for Solution 6. So often we sit and we talk about the really important access to care that people need, primary care, and we, we talk about surgical care and all of the, the important things and the services people need. But, but what's really going to change the, the trajectory of health and prosperity and well-being in Nova Scotia is Solution 6. And Solution 6 is addressing the factors that affect our health and well-being in this province. And we do need a cross-government approach. And I know my cabinet colleagues will say when I talk about Solution 6 that I am, in fact, the Minister of the Health Care System, and they are all the Ministers of Health. And those of you that have served as Ministers in, in other portfolios, you know that, that what happens in all of those other ministries is really what is going to lead to the health of, of Nova Scotia. So, we need to continue to do that work together and work you know, across government and across uh, partisan lines in order to really understand what's happening in communities so that we can lean in a way that's responsive to the needs of the people we represent. So with that, uh, Speaker, I, close to, I, I move to close third reading on Bill 322, um, Amendments to Opioid Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 322, Opiate Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act, an act to amend. Will, would all those in favor of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill 322, an act to amend Chapter 4 of the Acts of 2020, the Opioid Damages and Health Care Costs Recovery Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Speaker, would you please call Bill Number 327, Motor Vehicle Act. Bill number 327, the Motor Vehicle Act, an act to amend. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Public Works. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that Bill 327, amendments to the Motor Vehicle Act, be read a third time and do pass. I want to thank the members opposite for their comments during second reading debate. Madam Speaker, when it comes to Nova Scotians' roads and highways, there is nothing more important than safety. I think all members of, the, of this House can agree on that. Madam Speaker, I, like many of my colleagues in the House of Assembly, commute often from our constituencies to Halifax. The construction season has, been, has seen significant work done on our provincial roads. I'm sure we've all seen this firsthand and can appreciate the hard work that is being done by the construction crews across our province. Madam Speaker, in April 2023, we updated the Temporary Workplace Traffic Control Manual to recognize automatic flagger assistance, assistance devices.
These devices provide benefits to the industry, such as an improved safety and not requiring as many workers on site, which is important as the construction industry, like many others, are facing labour challenges. Madam Speaker, I've heard from a number of our local construction companies, and they have welcomed the addition of automated flaggers, but have faced challenges with the requirement to submit a plan and have it approved every time they want to move it. For example, when a road crew was working on a section of road cleaning up debris after a storm, they would need to submit a new plan and have it approved every time they were to move to a different section of the road. We are now removing this requirement, which will cut the red tape and help get the job done faster. As always, safety will remain our first priority, and those using flaggers will continue to follow requirements set out in the manual. With our busy and ambitious construction plans for the province, this amendment will make a big difference. We have made significant investments such as more than doubling the gravel road program and more than tripling the Royal Impact Mitigation Fund. And Madam Speaker, this is only the beginning. Yeah. We've also completed the twinning of Highway 104 to Antigonish and very soon Highway 103 will be twinned to Hubbard's. Madam Speaker, I look forward to what the future holds for the Department of Public Works and the province of Nova Scotia as a whole. With that, Madam Speaker, I will take my seat and look forward to hearing from my colleagues from across the aisle. I recognize the Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Certainly, uh, we in the Liberal Caucus would agree safety is paramount. Uh, this uh, protects people that are commuting through construction zones. It, it helps to protect uh, construction workers and remove red tape associated with having to uh, update uh, or reapprove or approve plans every time they want to move around. Uh, seems pretty straightforward. Good work, team. Uh, next up, the NDP. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you. I think I'll be the quickest I have been in several days and say that um, we look forward to these changes and we do support them. Thank you. If I am to recognize the Honourable Minister of Public Works, it will be to close debate on third reading. I now recognize the Honourable Minister for Public Works. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to close third reading on Bill Number 327, the Motor Vehicle Act. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 327, Motor Vehicle Act, an act to amend. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill 327, an act to amend Chapter 293 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Motor Vehicle Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you. Um, Madam Speaker, would you please call Bill Number 334, Health Services and Insurance Act. Bill number 334, Health Services and Insurance Act, an act to amend. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Addictions and Mental Health. Yeah. Speaker, I move that Bill number 334, an act to amend Chapter 197 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Health Services and Insurance Act, be now read a third time and do pass. I'd like to start by saying thank you to my colleagues opposite for their thoughtful comments during the debate on this bill. Uh, we certainly don't agree on everything uh, in this chamber at, at times, uh, but I think when it comes to providing universal mental health and addictions care, we've found some common ground. I think we can all agree that for many years and for many different reasons, Nova Scotians have faced barriers to accessing the care that they need. And we agree that we can't wait any longer to close that gap to make mental health and addiction services available to everyone as part of a public funded health care system. This could have been done five years ago or 10 years ago, but this right now is the, our best available option. I just want to take a few uh, moments to clarify some points raised during debate on the bill. The first is about the definition of universal mental health and addictions care. 
Our vision for universal access is one where every Nova Scotian gets the mental health and addiction services and supports that they need when they need them. Regardless of where they live, their ability to pay, if they have private insurance, or whatever issue they may face that's unique to them. They shouldn't have to travel five or six hours, they shouldn't have to pay hundreds or even thousands of dollars, and they shouldn't have to wait and wait and wait. And the way we do that is by ensuring we have a range of services available from a range of different providers scaled to meet the unique needs of Nova Scotians. Bill 334 is enabling legislation. It allows government to create insured service programs to support the delivery of some mental health and addictions care. Treating mental illness and addictions is certainly complex work. Anyone who's worked in healthcare, as I did in psychiatry, certainly know there's no one size fits all when it comes to mental health and addictions. What works for one person might not work for another. What works for one person right now, today, might not work for them next week, next month, or next year. That's why when we talk about universal mental health and addictions care, we say the right service from the right provider at the right time. Because the needs of a person managing an illness like schizophrenia may be different from a person experiencing anxiety or depression, which means the services and supports they need may be different as well. In a universal system of care, everyone is supported. For Nova Scotians with severe and persistent mental illness, the right service is probably going to be clinical care. And the right provider might be a team of providers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, occupational therapists, and many more. Some working in an inpatient setting, some in an outpatient setting, a day hospital program, or it could be a community-based organization. These are clinical specialists delivering care in a clinical setting. We're always going to need those services from those providers in those settings. It is a key part of universal mental health and addictions care, but it is certainly not a silver bullet because hospital-based clinical care is not the right fit for everyone. For someone experiencing mild to moderate anxiety or depression, the right service and the right provider might look like peer support or self-directed cognitive behavioral therapy, or maybe it's therapeutic counseling. Speaker, all of these services and many more are available to Nova Scotians right now, free of charge. We need a range of services from a range of providers to meet a range of needs. We need self-directed CBT for people that can do from an app on their phone. We need peer support counseling services. We need counseling therapy. We need wellness programs offered within the community. We need crisis response, and we need around the clock psychiatric care. We need all of those things and many more in a universal mental health and addiction system. The question is, how do we do it? We do it by investing in our public health care system, expanding programs, offering new services, recruiting clinicians, and many others. By trying new things, new apps, new platforms, new pilots, new ideas. By partnering with and funding community-based organizations whose goals are aligned with ours. We do it through initiatives like the Center for Psychological Health at Dalhousie where we have clinical psychology PhD students getting hands-on experience providing care to Nova Scotians that they so desperately need and deserve. And we do it by bringing the expertise we have in our private sector into our public system. One of the ways government works with private sector healthcare providers is through insured service programs. And that is what Bill 334 enables. I know during the debate there was a desire for more details such as what services are going to be available and co covered under MSI? At what rate will they be covered? Who is going to deliver them? Will there be constraints on what pro a provider can offer or a person can access? How does private insurance fit in? And so on. All very good questions. These are not details that would be embedded in amendments to the Health Services and Insurance Act. These are details that will be part of the programs we put in place through authority granted within the Act. And I will certainly share these details with members of this House and with all Nova Scotians as we put new programs in place. Programs we build together with our partners, including, of course, the providers who deliver these services. We work with our health system partners at the IWK, Nova Scotia Health, and many other partners to understand the needs of Nova Scotians. And together with our partners, we designed a program that helps address long-standing needs in our health care system. Certainly with pilots, they are limited in scope and bound by time. 
Certainly collecting evidence is part of that process. And a way of trying something new, something that has never been done before anywhere in Canada. To learn what works and what doesn't, and to carry those learnings forward as we work with our partners to build insured service programs to deliver mental health and addiction care to Nova Scotians. And it's not happening in isolation either. It is happening along with the expansion of a provincial preschool autism program, as an example, along with grant funding community-based organizations who provide critical supports to families all across Nova Scotia. Along with recruitment of psychologists and other healthcare practitioners into our public health care system. It is these actions and many more together that have gotten us from where we were two years ago to where we are today. And it is more actions like these together that will get us to where we're going universal mental health and addictions care. Speaker, if there's a roadmap out there showing the best way to do this step by step, turn by turn, I would certainly use it. But there is no roadmap, there's not even a road. That could be overwhelming at times, but we didn't let that overwhelm us. We came together with whatever tools we could find to clear ourselves the path. That's what we've been doing for the last two years alongside many partners. Partners in the healthcare system, in the private sector, in our communities, in our universities, our college, colleges, and many more. The work is being led by an incredible team at the Office of Addictions and Mental Health. They are passionate, they are thoughtful, and they care deeply about our province and our people. One of the members opposite suggested during debate that our team lacks an understanding of mental health and addictions. Speaker, that is simply untrue. The team knows this space, not just as policymakers and government, but as people that worked in the system. But they know the space from the inside, from the front lines of service delivery. They come from our communities, our community-based organizations, our public health care system as doctors, nurses, psychologists, social workers, and many more. Some are from the private sector. Their work over the last two years speaks for itself. They have consulted with more than 200 stakeholder groups, including health system partners, post-secondary institutions, community organizations, regulators, colleges, professional associations, unions, indigenous communities, and many, many more. The team is overseeing expansions in our public health care system from hospital-based services to e-mental health tools and everything in between along the spectrum. They provide funding and guidance to community-based organizations and built brand new innovative pilot projects from scratch, both of which are connecting Nova Scotians to care right now, today. And they're building all of that together into one integrated system, one that prior prioritizes Nova Scotians so that when someone needs help, they don't have to figure out where to go or where to get it. They make one call and the clinical experts will take it from there. Building a universal mental health and addictions care system is a significant undertaking, certainly not one for the faint of heart. But Speaker, this team has never wavered, our government has never wavered, and we are not going to start now. We're going to invest in our public system and try some new things. We'll use the best available evidence as we decide, design and build, and we'll keep learning and adjusting as we go. We'll stay focused on the bigger picture on universal mental health and addiction care without losing sight of why we're doing this in the first place and who we're doing it for. Our families, our friends, our neighbours, each other, all Nova Scotians, every Nova Scotian. Thank you, Speaker. I recognise the Honourable Member for Clayton Park West joining us virtually. Please go ahead. Madam Speaker, I'm happy to rise to provide my comments about Bill 334, the Health Services Insurance Act. We want to be clear that our party supports universal mental health care. We are happy that the minister is moving in that direction with Bill 334 to provide billing codes so that services for mental health providers will be paid by the provincial government. We know uh, there are long wait times for those currently seeking mental health. The wait time for the um, Bayers Lake Clinic, for example, in my writing, is four months. The wait time at Lower Sackville Clinic is five months. And at Spryfield is three months, and there are many others. Um, there are even longer wait times for those who cannot afford private, private care 
or have insurance to cover these costs. Dr. Erica Baker recently spoke at Law Amendments on behalf of the Council of Private Psychologists. Uh, Dr. Baker stated that psychologists currently practicing in the private sector do not, and she emphasized, do not have the capacity to meet the stated, the stated intent of this bill. She stated that it would appear that the ship is sailing before it is fully built. And, uh, and, and I will table that via email, uh, Madam, um, uh, spe um, Madam Speaker, sorry. We also had Dr. Simon Sherry, who presented virtually at Law Amendment, uh, and, and he said there is no uh, unused capacity. In fact, he said we are at crisis point and this bill will increase the number of clients by 300,000. He actually said this bill is a masquerade for a solution. Uh, and we can also table that. These are the, the two doctors that spoke at, uh, at law amendments. We know all private psychologists have waiting lists and are working long hours at, at a point of burnt out, burnout. We know that uh, the United Kingdom made a similar change to offer universal mental health care, but they had 10 year plan to increase the capacity that was needed to implement it. So I'm just asking, does this government have a plan to increase capacity to go along with this legislation. I would love for the minister to uh, answer that one. And, and uh, I, I'm really hoping that there is a plan to increase the capacity for psychologists and, and, and other um, uh, mental health doctors. We do need universal access to mental health and addiction. Uh, however, I still don't have many answers on how we are going to get there. And the minister was just speaking that they don't have anything to follow and they're trying their best. And, and I appreciate that. Um, the bill states that the government will determine which services will be publicly funded and what level of uh, remuneration will be used. This is, key, this is a key detail that is missing from this bill. Who are these providers? Who decides which level of treatment is best for the client? And who decides which assessment level is necessary? And, and that determines whether it's a psychologist or a therapist or a, a psychiatrist. Or how many hours will be needed for the treatment? Is the minister gonna decide on all these? All these are critical questions and we heard from three experts at Law Amendment who are very concerned about these vital questions. I hope the minister can address this, um, these four questions as well. And to my surprise, on October 24, I read an article in All Nova Scotia where the psychologist stated that Bill 334 claims to give Nova Scotians two hours of publicly funded uh, care. I, I don't think the minister has ever mentioned a two hour. Uh, I don't know uh, where that information came from. So uh, I, and I ex hope that the ministers uh, read that article. I don't think I can table it. I actually took a photograph, uh, sorry, took a photo of the article because it's on, in all Nova Scotia. I can't email it, I can't uh, print it. So I just took a copy of it on my phone. Uh, but I was very, very surprised to, to see that. And the minister knows how um, the issue I had with the, uh, with the one hour um, virtual, um, the minister knows how disappointed I was actually to hear that the government invested 23 million in virtual mental health care that provided only one hour. And the, and the minister, I know, he knows that one hour or two hour 
will never be sufficient to give proper uh, mental health care. So I would be interested to hear um, also about the evaluation. Is there, an, is there going to be an evaluation report on the outcomes of the $23 million invested in that one hour uh, virtual care? Um, who has the information that they collected from this one hour session? Where is it stored? Um, this, these are investments made, but we don't have any evaluation for the money we spent. I'd like to know from the minister if he can assure me that we are not, once again, putting time limits on care. Uh, do we limit the visits to our family doctors? No. So why are we limiting mental health care in, uh, and saying one hour or two hours? It is the, the doctors who decide. It is the psychologists who decide on the assessment method and on the amount of care that the patient needs. We, we do know that this bill will give the government the ability to decide which services will be publicly funded and the level of uh, remuneration. Nova Scotians need to know how these decisions will be made by the government. Mental health providers need to be consulted. I will continue with questions for the minister as I search for answers on how this government will achieve a universal mental health uh, system. And um, the minister also, um, uh, I asked the minister in my in the second reading, uh, is I want to ask the minister if he is prepared to spend as much as it takes to get universal mental health uh, for all Nova Scotians. What is the investment he is willing to make? He would love to know that, and uh, not sure if he can reply to that before uh, uh, the end of the night tonight. Lastly, uh, I again want to say that when I read the minister's mandate letter and it committed to universal mental health for all, I was so thrilled to see that, and I do believe the minister is committed to it. It is most crucial that Nova Scotians have access to mental health care providers. What is urgent is shortening the wait times and have more inpatient services to prevent the escalating number of suicides, of addiction and mental health for patients. And thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to rise and make a few comments on this bill. And so I think just to start um, again by reiterating, of course, I actually think that everybody in this house supports access to universal mental health care. Um, I don't think there's a question around that. But I think there is a question, there are still questions related to this bill. Um, the minister talked about there not being a road to universal mental health care. <clears throat> and actually my notes that I made for myself is that actually the road to mental health policy and services um, across Canada and around the world is actually littered um, with attempts and initiatives that weren't successful. And uh, mental health policy and services have really struggled to take advantage of the evidence, to implement things um, in ways that make sense. And so, you know, the the questions I have around this bill, the comments I have around this bill are really are really from that perspective. There is a large danger of not doing it right. Um, and uh, when we don't do it right, we waste time and money, um, but we also make people wait. So, you know, I think one of the major problems clearly with this bill has been the lack of predictable and ongoing engagement and consultation with key stakeholders, including private practicing psychologists and other mental health professionals. With the limited time folks were given, um, the Council of Practicing Psychologists as well as the Regulating Council um, submitted letters saying that they had no idea what, the, what was being proposed and perhaps more importantly uh, that from their perspective there isn't capacity in the private system um, to fulfill these aims. So, uh, you know, it, there is a real danger of trying to move forward without, without you know, the key team members. 
Um, the, council, the Council of Practicing Psychologists were invited to a last-minute meeting with this government. They were promised they would be engaged in next steps, and yet this government refused to support amendments to the bill to ensure this consultation. Um, you know, we did hear, as the member from Clayton Park West also talked about, at law amendments from providers who have extensive wait lists, but honestly, you know, anyone who wants to, go, I mean, pick up the phone and try and call a dozen psychologists and see when you can get in. And the answer is not very soon. Um, and for folks who need assessments for kids and that sort of stuff, the wait can be months, if not years. So, uh, you know, we've heard it directly from hundreds of professionals. The Council of Practicing Psychologists represents 150 folks. Um, and the regulator obviously represents um, all uh, um, of regulated psychologists in the province. And uh, everyone is saying, of course, we want to provide mental health care to all Nova Scotians who need it, but we can't. And so we need a, we need a map. And then for affiliated mental health care professionals, um, you know, uh, also really left out of the conversation, have no idea if they're included, if not and then how they are included. Um, so implementation is, you know, is really unclear. It's unclear how people in need are going to connect with the clinician they need. So the minister talked about the right service at the right time, um, at the right place or from the right provider, as this government says. But that takes a system. So you know that takes actually a plan. Um, one of the initiatives that is being implemented in this province now is the integrated youth services model. Uh, we are about almost the last Canadian jurisdiction uh, to do that. But the reason why integrated youth service models work is actually that there is an evidence-based, evaluated um, uh, assessment process that has been developed over time in numerous ju jurisdictions like Australia um, and the US and the UK but also across Canada. So we're actually using but th that whole piece, like how the, how the young person connects and gets to the right service at the right time is the key piece of how those work. And we don't have any information in this bill about how that is actually going to work. So, uh, you know, are people calling private psychologists? Are private psychologists supposed to be updating some government body about their availability, the services they offer, um, who they want to treat. Um, there's, you know, it's really unclear. And like I said, there's been lots of attempts um, in this province and across the country to build mental health care systems that have failed. And they failed um, because <clears throat> we haven't paid enough attention to mental health. So, you know, we actually have never had a national mental health strategy in Canada. Um, there was one released by the Mental Health Care, the Mental Health Commission of Canada, um, but that's not actually, you know, released by the government of Canada. Um, I am glad to hear that that the official opposition cares about mental health now, because I can tell you that when they came into government in 2013, um, the Together We Can plan had just been released. It built on lived experience built on the evidence, uh, had an 18-month consultation process with 1,200 Nova Scotians, and essentially, uh, you know, the government of the day, the Liberal government, let this plan die um, and disregard it. The Liberal government decimated uh, the Mental Health and Addictions Division of the Department of Health and Wellness. Um, and, and why are we one of, I mean, a great example, why are we one of the jurisdictions to, to be the last in Canada to implement integrated youth services? Because there was no one, there was literally no one from the government of Nova Scotia for eight years showing up at national mental health meetings. Like, you know, basically, you know, it was folks like me from Dow who were at these national mental health meetings, and we didn't have government there. So. I'm glad to hear that you've discovered it, but herein lies a great example of um, how tricky it is actually to assure universal mental health care um, works. So, you know, we need, uh, you know, we, uh, and, you know, we do need the plan. We need to understand how this is going to happen because what's presented so far doesn't make um, a lot of sense to a lot of folks in the system. Um, and, 
you know, the minister and the the office have been announcing a number of initiatives, which are great. I, I've heard the commitment to data collection. I've heard the commitment to evaluation. Yet none of that's being shared publicly. None of that's being shared and, and shown how it's actually informing the development of this bill. So in the past budget, which, you know, I'll remind folks, was six months ago, um, I think there was uh, two to 300,000 order. Or there's a little bit of too much chatter going on. I would ask that the um, member for Sable Island, uh, I'm sorry, for uh, Halifax Citadel Sable Island continue. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, I, you know, I, I, I can't comment on people's presence, but I can, I can, I think I can comment on people's attention. And if you're not interested, don't worry about it, but you could go in the antechamber. So, um, you know, and, uh, so some of the things that I think are important to note is that, like I was saying, there's some great initiatives out there that are collecting data, there's some great evaluations, they're not being presented. Um, and we have a lot of gaps in our understanding of mental health in Nova Scotia. So actually, we actually don't have uh, a good sense of what the mental health is of Nova Scotians. Um, we really only work from a few data points like wait times, um, and I do have a couple that I just want to sort of talk through. I will say I have reached out to the office to talk about the data because there's some weird stuff happening with the IWK data, I'm just going to say this, um, but uh, where the wait times are going up and down from 75 days to 8 days to 11 days to 93 days to 11 days to 84 days. I think there's probably a bit of an error here, but just to say that you know, since this government has come in, that we haven't actually seen access to mental health services improve. Um, I'll also look at the data available for mental health addictions, child and adolescent services for the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. So, <clears throat> in the period between April to June 2021, um, the average wait time for sort of your first appointment uh, for for 50% of the people waiting was 96 days, and for 90% of the people waiting was 125 days. That's a really long time, right? It's worse now. So the last reported period for April to June 2023, um, the wait time for 50% of folks is 122 days, and the wait time for 90% of children and youth to have their first appointment. This is not to receive treatment. This is not to receive assessment. This is to get in the door. Is 144 days. So it's actually increased uh, in the past couple of uh, years. And I will say there's been some heights. There's been like 211 days, October to December um, 2022. So on the child and youth side, we're not seeing increased access to services. And there's lots of reasons why, and one of that is that there aren't a, enough practitioners available in this province to provide service. And so by putting forward this bill without a plan, you're making promises that I frankly don't think we can keep right now in Nova Scotia unless we actually have a model, something like integrated youth services which makes, makes use of the available people we have within a jurisdiction. Um, I'm just gonna talk about mental health in addition, adult services wait times for the Halifax Bears Road Clinic. So again, in from April to June 2021, in that uh, reporting period, 50% of people waited 50 days for their first appointment, and 90% of people waited uh, 75 days. Um, and it also has not gotten any better. In fact, it's gotten worse. So April to June 2023, 50% of folks waited 104 days. And 90% of people waited 127 days. And again, that's just to get your foot in the door. That is not treatment. Because I will tell you, on the other end, there's often a lot of wait times then too, right? Like, like what about this CBD group? Or, you know, we can put you on the list for counseling. And it'll take a long time to get there, and you certainly won't be seeing a psychologist straight off. So, um, and maybe wait times seem boring. They are literally the only one of the only measures we have, one of the only publicly measured. So I cannot tell you actually the rate of uh, mental illness amongst Nova Scotian child, children and youth. Uh, I can't tell you the, the rate of mental illness amongst Nova Scotian adults. We sort of, you know, use national data and we have a range and so we have a sense of where it's at. But we actually don't know. 
and we collect little to no data about how our programs work. So say someone gets a diagnosis, they receive the treatment, we actually don't do serve very much to know if their outcomes actually improved. And one more wait times, mental health addictions adult services in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, April to June 2021, 50% of folks were waiting 62 days and 90% of folks were waiting 85 days. Um, that went up to, uh, in October to December 2022, um, 153 days. And in the most recent reporting period of April to June 2023, 50% of people waited 77 days and 90% of people waited 134 days. And I know, I know that so many of us um, have either struggled with mental health issues or, you know, our families, our children, our parents, our siblings. Um, and so we know what those days mean. I mean, those days mean so many things, um, you know, in terms of ill health, uh, family conflict, uh, inability to go to work, inability to go to school. Um, and, you know, we know what those feel like. So we all want to change that. That's absolutely clear. We all want better access to mental health care. Um, and we want this to work. But in the absence of any information, it's, it's hard to know that this alone is going to make a difference. Um, you know, at the beginning of this session, I introduced um, a bill for a suicide prevention strategy, which, uh, you know, has been called for by a number of uh, community organizations and folks working in the field. Um, we are actually uh, seeing our highest rates proportionally of suicide in the province. Um, and it's, it's only been increasing. This is a serious public health issue. Um, and we really, you know, again, it's not the best data. Like it doesn't, we don't, you know, we can't tell what works. We can't tell what people, what services people have received, um, but it's not a good sign. And that's the sort of, this is what's on the line really when we're talking about mental health services. Um, you know, there's other, challenges that if you don't treat mental health. So, I mean, first of all, it costs a lot of money to the economy. Um, you know, uh, I mean, basically, you know, the cumulative cost of mental health issues in Canada over the next three years is, to, is expected to exceed 2.5 trillion. Um, and that was an estimate from 2017 from the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Um, and I would argue that things have changed a lot, like the sort of the updated um, impact is probably greater. Um, you know, because we don't have uh, mental health services that are working that people can't get to, so unmet need is resulting in growing service demands in other areas. So emergency room visits for mental health issues are increasing radically for children and youth across Canada, absolutely, but definitely here in Nova Scotia. Um, and again, we've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, the ER crisis uh, as being, you know, part of the system. Um, but this is a great example. And if anyone has uh, gone with their, with somebody or gone themselves to the ER in a mental health crisis, it's not the right place. Anybody who's in crisis knows that it's not a place to get help, but it is a place maybe to stay alive for the night. So uh, it's not, you know, uh, again, you know, you know, what's what's the plan? And I would again return to the fact that we are implementing a Nova Scotia Integrated Youth Services. There is a structure and a program that makes sense, that has the evidence base. That's the type of thing that we should be seeing when we're thinking about how to build uh, capacity to offer universal mental health care. Um, and, you know, and I think there is lots to add into the discussion in terms of how lived experience and living experience will be integrated. So, you know, the best evidence shows that for mental health services, having the engagement of folks um, with lived and lived experience is a key indicator of success. Integrated Youth Services doing that, and they're doing that here in Nova Scotia. So the IWK that is uh, running this program and implementing is currently recruiting for its youth council and currently including for its family and caregiver council. So again, we have this like little pocket of, of our mental health system that um, is building on the evidence that has been learned around the world in the last couple of decades. Um, and right now, we really need to see that expand to the entire mental health system. 
Um, I think it's clear, we heard at law amendments that there's very little capacity in the system right now, so we really need, we need a different approach. Um, and, you know, we'd love to hear what happened with the small pilot that was funded um, in the last budget and how that informed the development of this bill. Um, you know, folks who spoke at, at uh, you know, law amendments uh, made a couple of other comments I think are really important to keep in mind. One of which is no amount of therapy helps when you're homeless and hungry. Um, so, you know, again, paying attention to the social and structural determinants of health is key. Um, folks who, and, and that is actually, again, the integrated youth services model builds on that, actually recognizes that. So integrated youth services model, well, they have a base in mental health services, also, um, allow quick and easy referrals through agreements with other service providers. So if, someone, if a young person arrives and actually they might have a mental health concern, but actually they also don't know where they're going to sleep that night, um, the, you know, thinking about the whole youth um, and their whole experience um, is taken into account. And this is the type of thinking, this is the plan that we need for universal mental health care in this province. So I, you know, I, don't, I was going to say maybe there's no one more in this house that wants this to work. Uh, you know, I uh, was the child of a parent who struggled with severe mental illness her entire life in this province and never received the right care, and we did somersaults to try and access what we could. And, you know, and certainly my experience as a parent is what's motivated me to seek elected office. It's what's motivated me to, to do my studies. Um, I am completely committed to this idea, but I'm not convinced that we're going to get there with this bill. And with that, I'll take my seat. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I certainly feel um, that I want to stand as a registered nurse and uh, someone that has worked in mental health uh, for a number of years in a variety of places to uh, talk about the importance of this enabling legislation and the options that it is going to provide uh, not only health care providers but Nova Scotians in the system. Um, so it is enabling legislation. It is not a full plan, nor is it intended to be, um, and it will have a significant impact on the well-being uh, and treatment. And uh, what I really want to say is by, by changing these billing codes, this will be a trauma-informed approach. This will allow people across our communities to actually have choice in terms of where and how they seek care. There's a variety of options across the severity of illness, whether you have mental health distress, whether you live with a mental health problem or you're experiencing a mental health disorder, you now have a broader range of clinicians and opportunities in order to address the needs that you, that you um, are experiencing. So I just want to say to the staff who I know are totally dedicated to this work, who are working incredibly hard, who live and breathe this every day, whether you're in the department or whether you're on the front lines, or whether you're the minister, um, I just want all of you to know that it, it is going to be a monumental and historical change that we are actually witnessing here today. I want to signal to Nova Scotians that this government takes uh, your mental health as seriously as your physical health. We have our own minister. We are now looking at how we can actually bill, a, bill MSI, increase the number of insurable services. That has never happened in the history of this province, and I actually believe it's country leading. And I want to thank the minister for that. I think it's courageous. I think it's progressive, and I think it's compassionate. And I think uh, it's very, very, very bold. And the last thing I want to say to all of you that are watching, the 25 uh, in the department, I want you all to know that it's not the critic who counts. It, the credit goes to the person who is actually in the arena, who will fail, but will fail doing the absolute best that they can. Yeah. And I believe yeah. that. Yeah. 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 If I am to recognize the Honourable Minister for Addic Addictions and Mental Health, it will be to close uh, third reading. Um, I recognize the Honourable Minister for Addictions and Mental Health. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you everyone for their thoughtful comments, uh, I would say, this evening. Uh, I will try to just address, I was taking some notes here, just to try to address some of the questions that were kind of raised uh, during debate. Uh, certainly uh, in my, my previous life, uh, I, I would often work with people on a daily basis, you know, in acute kind of psychiatric distress. Uh, and I often thought to myself, I wish they had the chance to get help sooner, right? So certainly hospital-based acute care is one of the options that you would have seen our government investing in and increasing services, whether it's, you know, acute mental health day hospitals, recovery support centers in the communities, you know, for substance use disorder. I mean, that's certainly one suite of services that we're really expanding and working on. Uh, but I think when I think of mental health care myself, I certainly think of communities and the power that communities have to support, you know, the individuals that live there. Uh, there's a lot of great community-based uh, organizations across the province that do incredible work uh, for those, you know, with mild to moderate issues. Uh, so, so one of the members kind of asked about who decides, uh, I think, on treatment uh, time frames and stuff like that. I think that's, that's clinical guidelines. That's, that's a practitioner. Uh, that would decide those sorts of issues. Uh, virtual care is offered in a variety of ways across the province, you know, from rural emergency departments to psychiatrists. Uh, access wellness, I think, was one of the points brought up, which, which is based, you know, for mild to moderate issues. Uh, certainly everything we're doing, you know, does have evaluation and outcomes embedded in it. Uh, whether you're looking at the mental health acute day hospitals and the impact that has had uh, on our inpatient bed capacity, uh, and most importantly, patient experience. Uh, patients have really uh, had positive feedback about a number of our, our new services uh, offered across the province. Uh, I would certainly agree with the member uh, from Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island on the importance of integrated youth services. Uh, quite frankly, it would have been something I would like to see a long time ago uh, in, in Nova Scotia. Uh, so we, we do have a province-wide rollout uh, happening over the next couple of years. Uh, which will be for, for youth and families right across the province. So I think that's a, a really important thing. Uh, I would kind of I would agree with the the lack of a national strategy certainly uh, with with mental health. Uh, I think this is you know the province of Nova Scotia really trying to take a leadership role uh, for other provinces and territories and, and certainly for the federal government. Uh, I think mental health services uh, should be publicly funded, <laughs> to be to be quite frank. Uh, so we're the first province uh, in the country to do that. Uh, so it's certainly, it's not easy when you're the first uh, first jurisdiction doing something this complex. Uh, but I certainly don't think uh, you can be afraid of the risk and afraid of failing, uh, because it's too important for Nova Scotians, to be quite frank. Um, so I just want to just acknowledge uh, the Premier uh, for seeing the value of appointing a Minister for Addictions and Mental Health for the first time in the history of the province. <laughs> Uh, certainly thank uh, my caucus colleagues for being so supportive. Uh, certainly for the, the voice of mental health. I think we certainly have, have, have come a long way, but there's certainly a long way to go. Uh, as, as we've heard tonight, some of the stories of addiction that is, have impacted uh, members on both sides of the house. Uh, I don't think any, any of us don't have a loved one uh, that hasn't experienced an addiction or mental health issue. So I think that in itself really speaks volumes. Uh, in terms of what this legislation will do, it is enabling legislation. Uh, certainly if you live uh, in a rural part of the province, or if you live in an area where you know you have a private pra practitioner that lives you know, down the street and you, you can't afford to see them, maybe you should see them now and the, co and the government's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So that's just a very straightforward way that this is going to help the Nova Scotian living within their community. Uh, we'll certainly be collecting outcomes and, and evidence to how this is you know, improving health care uh, for Nova Scotians. And I just want to acknowledge the staff uh, in the department. Uh, this caused a lot of people a lot of stress, uh, a lot of pressure. They worked extremely hard. Uh, there was extensive consultation with stakeholders from one end of the province to the next. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that you've done. Uh, and I'm certainly very proud to be able to do this tonight. Uh, so with those few words, I uh, move to close third reading and bill number 334, the Health Services and Insurance Act. There you go, Thank you. The motion is for third reading of bill number 334, Health Services and Insurance Act, an act to amend. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried.
Bill 334, an act to amend Chapter 197 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Health Services and Insurance Act. Order that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Order that the bill be engrossed. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, that concludes government business for the day. I move that we do now rise, uh, and the House will meet again tomorrow, November the 9th, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. Uh, government business will include third reading of Bill 320, 329, 332, 337, and third reading of public and private bills number 396. The motion is uh, that the House rise to meet again on Thursday, November 9th from 1 p.m. until 11.59 p.m. Uh, would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded nay. The motion is carried. Have a good night and sleep well.